time in the city My hair plugs ain't pretty Hot times in the city I'm feeling kinda bad That's right It's time right now for the David Fetterman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show So get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say. He's coming your way. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, Professor uh, <laughs> Mike Steinel. That was funny. We're just loading up the snark here. Welcome to the mop up for October 14th, really, 2021. I'm David Feldman, coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in New York City where the temperature is 78 degrees and cloudy. Hey, office hours, join me for office hours Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. The first hour of office hours is I, I'm available. If you're listening right now, and you want to talk to me on Zoom, join me for office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. I'm available. You can talk to me on Zoom. I'm available every Friday night from 8 till 9 Eastern. And then later on, I hang out. So, But I don't like to interrupt the other people who are hosting. The first hour is an opportunity to complain. You can offer up a suggestion or you can just say hi join us if you want to lurk and not be seen and you just want to watch me field questions from listeners come to office hours you don't have to turn your zoom camera or zoom microphone on you can just watch me squirm and you can meet other people in the chat room that's uh friday night at 8 p.m go to my website right now davidfeldmanshow.com and hit attend office hours and it'll take you right in you can sign up now or just join us at around 7.55. Just go to my website and hit attend office hours. It'll take you right into the Zoom room. No password required. Fasten your airbags. We're in for an amazing show today, a truly amazing show. 
DC Comics announced this week that the Man of Steel is gay. Turns out super, Superman's kryptonite is Vanderpump Rules. If Vanderpump Rules is on, doesn't matter how much danger Lois or Jimmy are in, he's got to finish watching Vanderpump Rules. William Shatner, the original Captain Kirk, boarded Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin NS-18 and took off from Texas on Wednesday into the great beyond. By the way, that wasn't a Twilight Zone tribute when William Shatner looked out the window and saw a gremlin. That was just Jeff Bezos waving goodbye. Sometimes people mistake Jeff Bezos for a gremlin, and he's not a gremlin, he's an homunculus. There's a, <laughs> there's a distinct difference. Shatner boarded the capsule. Bezos said, I see you brought your own helmet. And Shatner said, that's my hair. Ground control wanted to delay the flight, but quickly remembered it being Texas. Bezos would try to collect $10,000 by turning them all in for aborting a mission. And I wish I had aborted that line. Uh, Bezos, no, 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 Bezos, and no, uh, this is not good. Well, that's why uh, I have uh, my audience <laughs> and Dave Chappelle has his. That's why Dave Chappelle has millions and millions of people hanging on his every word. And I have, oh boy. Well, some of my uh, comic, let me just thank you for the coffee, Leslie. Again, I asked for a coffee enema, but now, Dave Chappelle, some of my friends say, why are you talking about Dave Chappelle? To which I reply, why is Dave Chappelle talking about transgender people? My friends say, don't you have more important things to discuss other than Dave Chappelle's last Netflix special? To which I reply, doesn't Dave Chappelle have more important things to discuss on his last Netflix special besides transgender people? They say to me, if you don't approve of Dave Chappelle, ignore him. To which I say, if Dave Chappelle doesn't approve of the transgender community, ignore them. So I don't understand Dave Chappelle. Why would anyone care about transgender people? Why would you dedicate so much time in your specials to gen transgender people? You, who cares about transgender people? The only thing you should care about is making sure they're okay. Let them, let them live their life. It has no bearing on your existence. So the question isn't whether or not Chappelle has the right to say what he said about transgender people. Of course he does. But the transgender community and failed comedians like myself, we also have the right to speak out and, and, and correct Dave Chappelle for what he's saying. And he should channel his energy into something way more productive instead of something so destructive. I don't know much, as you know. People who listen to this show know I don't know much. But I am absolutely certain that if Dave Chappelle were to say about Jews what he says about transgender people, well, use your imagination. Uh, I guess I look at Dave Chappelle the same way I, David Feldman, look at Israel. I expect so much from Dave Chappelle. And then, like Israel, he lets me down. He purports to be one thing, and then he occasionally does the opposite. And it's incredibly disappointing when you expect so much from Israel or Dave Chappelle, and they break your heart. Chappelle is very important to me. I watch his specials. I hang on his every word. He has made me laugh harder, as hard as any of the greats. Uh, he's a great performer. But, uh, and this is a big but, he's spending way too much time in comedy clubs. He's spending way too much time surrounded by drunks, podheads. It's making him aggressive and stupid. I never became 
a successful comic. I had my moments, uh, but I never really flourished because I wasn't smart enough. I couldn't figure it out. And that's why I hate to see comics like Chappelle get stupid, like Bill Maher got stupid. They both got rich and stupid, and that's probably a causal relationship. In the special, Dave Chappelle, and, I, and you should watch it because it's compelling, the same way Tucker Carlson is compelling and entertaining. You know, cringe-worthy entertainment. In the special, Chappelle touches the third rail of anti-Semitism. He did a seemingly innocuous space Jews joke that othered Jews, right? Wasn't too bad. It was a little othering there with a callback. Nobody cares. But Jews, black people, Muslims, gay they know when they're being othered and they can, nobody's so brittle that they can't shrug it off, right? My problem with that Space Jews joke, it was a hit and run joke. He didn't linger. And then someone in the audience screamed free Palestine. And he kept that in the special, right? He kept free Palestine in the special because he wanted to make a statement. He kind of showed where he's landing on that issue. And a lot of Jews, Dave Chappelle, especially younger Jews here in the United States, would echo the sentiment of free Palestine. This is a conversation worth having, especially on a Netflix special. But uh, that free Palestine that somebody screamed from the audience, that too was a hit and run moment. And it belied, I'm afraid to say, a real cowardice on Dave Chappelle's part in this last special. I don't expect cowardice from Dave Chappelle, but he didn't have the courage to sit long enough there in that moment. Space Jews, free Palestine. He didn't have the courage to discuss Jews, Palestine, and the othering of the Jews, the othering of Palestinians. And it was disappointed. I thought, oh, good, he's going to discuss this. He's going to touch that third rail because he's courageous. And, you know, a lot of American Jews, some of my kids, some of my neighbors, some of the people I go to temple with, a lot of American Jews might agree with what Dave Chappelle has to say about Israel and about Jews. Now, maybe in some other special, Dave Chappelle will find the courage to do more than just a quick hit and run like space Jews and leave in the heckler screaming free Palestine. T to me, it was cowardice. It, it just felt like a, an epithet. It felt gratuitous because there was so much to sink your teeth into, Dave, and you walked away from something that's really important, really important. Jews, Palestinians, American Jews, American Palestinians, Israel, the Middle East. There's a meal. That's a, a meal to be had on Netflix, Dave Chappelle. Maybe your next special, you'll find the courage to tell us what you really think about Palestine. Maybe you will devote as big a chunk to the plight of the Palestinians, as you will, to the plight of people who have to share a bathroom for three seconds with a transgender person. I don't know. I mean, you're more successful than I am, Dave. You know better than I, but in terms of artistry, that would be a, a much more interesting special. Why not talk about Jews, Dave? That's a rich meal. Jews in Hollywood. You've dealt with Jews in Hollywood, Dave Chappelle. Talk about Jews and the black community. Great comedy comes out of conflict. You and I both know, Dave, that there's a lot of tension between Jews and black people. This is ripe for a comedy special. Uh, 
Talk about the plight of Ethiopian Jews in Israel. That's an interesting subject because we know, we both know, Dave, that there's a lot of racism among the Jewish people. And there are Ethiopian Jews in Israel. Sink your teeth into that one. Talk about Louis Farrakhan and how he's unapologetically anti-Semitic. That's the great thing I love about the Reverend Louis Farrakhan is he doesn't deal with Israel. He goes right to the Jews. This isn't about Zionism. This is Louis Farrakhan, God bless him. He goes right for the Jews. He leaves Israel out of that. And I salute him for that. Do that, talk about Louis Farrakhan. Have the courage of Louis Farrakhan. You know, he, Louis Farrakhan talks about racism that's rampant, that has been rampant in the Jewish community. We both know that Jews have a problematic relationship with African Americans. It dates all the way back to the NAACP and the B'nai B'rith and the B'nai B'rith didn't, you know, it was an arm of the B'nai B'rith and the Jews didn't like the way the blacks, it, there's a, there's, it's funny. It, no, I'm being serious, it's funny. Uh, do some material about Jews in the record business, Dave Chappelle. Jewish landlords. I live in New York City. Black people have opinions about Jewish landlords. And Jewish people have a, an opinion about black people and tenants and gentrification. Even better, talk about how Jews claim they were once slaves. How's that for cultural appropriation? Talk about that in your next special. Stop talking about the transgender community, Dave Chappelle. You're so much braver than that. Take on the Jews. For example, Dave, you know, I'm always looking for a job. There's no shred of evidence. Let me help you. There's no shred of evidence to suggest that Jews were ever slaves in Egypt. We know that black people were slaves in, in, uh, in America. That's a fact. That's a fact. Black people were slaves in America, Dave Chappelle. There is not a single shred. There's maybe one little etching into some stone to suggest that maybe a tribe of Jews lived in ancient Egypt, but there's no evidence that they were slaves. And yet we have this big holiday that celebrates our release from bondage. And, and there's the book of Exodus. No proof other than the book of Exodus. None whatsoever. There is no proof that Jews were ever slaves, Dave Chappelle. Let's work on a special. And why don't you say that on Netflix? Why don't you say that Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers is bogus? Let's do it. Let's write it together because there's no evidence. In fact, Sigmund Freud wrote a book suggesting that not only weren't the Jews never slaves, they weren't even Jews. They were just a conquering army of about 500,000 Egyptians who left to invade Canaan or whatever they called it back there, Palestine. Let's do a special. Let's call me. Let's write a special where you take on the Jews because you're better than making fun of the transgender community. You are brave. You touch the third rail. Okay, let's do it. You're doing dangerous comedy. And personally, it's important to know what you think. So I was disappointed. There was a war on Gaza this year. You didn't make any mention of it. I heard Free Palestine. You sink your teeth into these big meals and you just walked away from Free Palestine? You didn't want to tackle Iron Dome and Gaza? Why not? You're dangerous. Instead, Dave, you chose uh, transgender people again, again, when you could have been talking about Jews. Why didn't you talk about Jews and blacks? You, you kept the free Palestine in the show, but there was no follow through. Why not? 
why don't you do a special in which you take on Israel and APEC? Why don't you pick on somebody your own size? That's what I, I, and I'll help you do it. I'll help you do it, okay? I'll sit at your feet and learn how to be brave, Dave, how to do brave comedy. Because you are like Israel to me. And like Israel, you've let me down. But you're a coward. You would never take on Israel. You would never do that, Dave. You would never tell us what you really think about the Jews and Israel, would you, Dave? Would you? Hmm? Oh, it's going to get dangerous here. Yeah? How dangerous? You want to talk about the Jews the same way you talk about the transgender people? So, uh, anyway, I would give anything for Dave Chappelle to do a special in which he dissects the American Jewish community and their problematic relationship with African Americans. That would be living up to the Chappelle name, that, you know, touching the third rail, boldly going where no comic dares to go. Do a special about that. I know you have thoughts about Jews and blacks and their relationship. I know you have thoughts about the Palestinians and Israel, but then somehow transgender people sharing a bathroom with us is more important. Again, again, another special about transgender people. Here's the thing, a lot of American Jews, especially my kids and younger American Jews, would enjoy this. In America, uh, you talked about transgender people in your special, Dave Chappelle. Uh, here's what you didn't talk about. In America, trans people, transgender people are subjected to a staggering level of violence. A staggering level of violence. According to the National Resources Center on Domestic Violence, each year, one out of every 10 transgender people each year will be physically assaulted. One out of 10 transgender people each year will be physically assaulted. That's on the streets as they walk because they are simply a transgender person. Each year, one out of two transgender Americans will experience verbal taunts like watching a Dave Chappelle special? No, something a lot more dangerous. Each year, one out of two transgender Americans will experience verbal taunts and threats. One out of two. One out of two. The statistics on violence inflicted upon transgender Americans are staggeringly, shockingly underreported because it's dangerous for transgender Americans to go to the police for fear of getting raped by the police or beaten up by the police. We live, I'll give you some stats on that in a second. Uh, these are the things, I guess, that, you know, it was cut for time, right, Dave? I guess this stuff got cut for time. It was only a 70 second, you know, 70, 70 second minute, 70 minute, 72 minute special. I don't think you'd think a couple of specials where you're talking about the transgender community, you would mention that we live in a country that for some reason doesn't keep accurate statistics on the number of civilians killed each year by the police, right? And that's why we really don't know how many transgender people were killed this year by the police. We don't, we don't even have a, an accurate tally of the number of civilians, just civilians, in America killed by the police. You think this country gives a rat's ass about the number of transgender Americans shot, beaten, raped, and killed by American police, prison guards, and inmates? It's a staggering number. One study suggests close to 10% of transgender Americans say they were raped by a police officer. Close to 10% of transgender Americans say they were raped by a police officer. Americans, uh, 
fifteen uh, percent say they were physically assaulted by a police officer, and nearly half of all transgender Americans say they are harassed by the police. Another study, again, this is stuff that probably got left out of Dave Chappelle's special, because certainly he would care about this. Uh, I don't know why it ended up on the editing floor. Another study shows that 78% of transgender student, students experience abuse. 78% of transgender American kids are in school say they've been abused. 31% of transgender students in America claim they are victims of, of some sort of abuse from their teachers. Now, does anyone doubt that? How could you? And would you choose to be a transgender person? There are much safer ways to draw attention to yourself. That's one of the blood libels against the transgender community. Oh, they're just trying to draw attention to themselves. Uh, there are much safer ways to draw attention to to, to yourself, okay? Uh, you are uh, you are born binary, you're born non-binary. Uh, to, to paraphrase Dave Chappelle, biology is a fact. How you are born is indeed a fact. Gender is not. Race is not. One of the things we've talked about on the show, Professor Adnan Hussein, taught me this, that race is not a fact. Race is an invention. Race was invented by white people to justify slavery. So race is not a fact. Uh, one out of two transgender Americans will experience violence sometime in their life. That is a fact. It's also a fact that transgender Americans never feel safe because they are not safe. They are bullied, harassed by comedians, and more importantly, they are rejected by their family, their teachers, their doctors, their religious leaders, and even worse, by themselves. They are rejected by themselves. And I'm gonna talk about that vis-a-vis -vis Dave's special and his transgender friend who committed suicide. I'll get to that in a second, Dave, if you're watching. Uh, transgender people, Dave, are prone to suicide. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, transgender teenage boys have the highest suicide rates in the country among that you know, among people's identity. Transgender teenage boys have the highest suicide rates in the country. Uh, hmm. And your friend, Dave, we'll talk about your friend who committed suicide and who you blamed for her suicide. 42% of non-binary teens say they have attempted suicide sometime in their life. Hmm. Wonder how many of those kids uh, have Netflix and, and watch Dave Chappelle, who is considered the greatest comic of our generation. Very interesting. Here is the truth. Forget surveys. Forget these stats, they're, they're numbers. Here's a fact. If you are a transgender American, you live in a constant state of terror that you will be physically assaulted, which means when you get verbally assaulted, your lizard brain goes into hyperactivity because it means more. When a transgender person is verbally assaulted, 
they their pituitary glands spit out more adrenaline because when you assault verbally a transgender person, it is way more threatening than it is for somebody who is not transgender because verbal assaults are often followed by physical assaults. So a verbal assault on a transgender person creates massive anxiety. Wondering how many transgender people who were struggling with whether or not they were binary or non-binary turned on Dave's last special and what their pituitary glands started, how much adrenaline, how much fight or flight began to shoot out of their lizard brain as Dave Chappelle talked about the transgender community. Transgender Americans are subject to job discrimination more than anybody else. And they're subjected to landlords who refuse to rent to them. Of all the members of the LGBT community, transgender people are the most likely to be homeless and to be jobless. Transgender Americans are among the most vulnerable in our community. I believe the word Dave Chappelle would use is brittle. They would be the most brittle, among the most brittle in our community. Brittle. He seems to like that word, Dave Chappelle. Uh, he likes the word, but not the people it describes. And I get that. Chappelle is strong. He walked away from $50 million. He already had a couple of million dollars when he walked away from the $50 million. And uh, nobody was holding a gun to his head uh, to make him produce the type of comedy at Comedy Central that was so, uh, uh, let's say, insulting to African Americans. So, you know, uh, he walked away from $50 million. It's a lot easier to walk away from $50 million when you have 10 or $15 million. But Dave isn't brittle. He's rich, he's famous, he's strong. And most importantly, not most importantly, but this is important, he's an African-American, which means he achieved all of this with the deck completely stacked against him. Chappelle is a miracle, miracle of comedy. The odds were completely against him. I know, I was, you know, I, I saw, I see the way to this day, black African-Americans are treated in comedy. Some say it's getting better, I'm not so sure. So uh, he's important, the odds were against him, he persevered and he became an incredibly compelling performer, and he still is compelling, the same way Tucker Carlson is compelling. Dave Chappelle is compelling. He never loses my interest. He has become a great performer with a third-rate comedy mind. Dave Chappelle, Dave Chappelle is a amazing performer with a third-rate comedy mind. He has a third-rate comedy mind mind. And by that, I mean his words, his thoughts would never withstand the scrutiny of a world class writing room. He's a comedy club performer who made it to the theaters. So he's comedy club funny and comedy club funny means he's a strong performer who can make weak cheese appear to be smarter than it actually is. And that's a trick. That's a trick. And I enjoy watching him perform that trick, but it is a trick. I enjoy street jokes. I like jokes. I, I like the math on street jokes. I like the false logic that belies the stupidity of the person telling 
the street joke. I like jokes. I, I, I like anti-Semitic jokes. I love Holocaust jokes. I can't get enough of Holocaust jokes. I, I, uh, I like sexist, misogynistic, homophobic jokes, racist jokes, transgender jokes. They make me laugh hard because they possess the added luster of being verboten. But I don't tell them publicly. There are things we do in private and there are things we do in public. I laugh hardest at the forbidden fruit. Unfortunately, the forbidden fruit in comedy is also the low hanging fruit, the easy targets to pick. It is low hanging fruit and it is forbidden. It's forbidden to mock black people, Jews, uh, gay people, transgender people, because it's immoral and it's un-American. We try to get our kids in kindergarten not to do that. That's why it's so funny. But anybody could do it. That's why in a saner climate, the, the gatekeepers, the audience members would say, you know, making fun of transgender people, it's funny, but it doesn't belong on a Netflix special. It doesn't belong in a comedy club. This is stuff you say privately to your friends. It's like, it's, it's a bonding exercise. You tell horrible jokes to one another because it, it's saying, look, I, you know, this is horrible. Let's share something horrible, like gossip. You shouldn't gossip. That's what makes gossip so much fun. You do it privately with people you can trust. Going after transgender people is cheap. Cheap. Now, the term cheap joke, cheap material, I didn't understand what I heard that. You know, people would say to me, oh, that joke you do, it's a cheap joke. And I just never understood what cheap meant until I became a comedy writer. And I worked for Jon Stewart, who hates unions. Uh, that's not the point I'm making, though. I, uh, although he didn't want his writers to have health care. Uh, he didn't care if they had health care. Uh, but the true definition of a cheap joke is a joke that a low price comedy writer can sell for a low price, right? Comedians used to buy material, and some should. I think Dave Chappelle should start looking to buy material. Uh, I, think he, I think that well has run dry. If you're picking on transgender people, Dave, maybe stay home with your kids, get off the road, and buy some material. Anyway, a cheap joke is what... A, if you're out looking for a comedy writer and you don't want to pay Paul Mooney, who's very expensive, you pay somebody less. And if you and you get cheap jokes, you don't get Paul Mooney's jokes. You get jokes that are cheaper, jokes that you've heard before, jokes that you really don't want to tell, but you don't feel like spending the money. So uh, anyway, there. Uh, there have been way more eloquent criticisms of Chappelle. Uh, I guess I, I'm disappointed with him because like Israel, like Israel, he's let me down. I expected so much from Chappelle. Uh, but my other objection to Chappelle's latest special, which I watched, yeah, but you watched it. Yeah, yeah, of course I watched it. Of course, I watched Tucker Carlson. I watched Trump's speeches. I'm entertained by Donald Trump's rallies. So I was entertained by Dave Chappelle, but not for the reasons he wanted me to be entertained. Uh, so my, one of my other objections to Chappelle's last special is his insistence that he's an artist. Ooh. Uh, Dave, you're not an artist. It's just that your artifice is so spectacular, you're even fooling yourself. That's artifice. That's trickery. You're making 
weak cheese look good, that's because you're a great performer. But you have a third-rate comedy mind. What you're doing is not art. What you're doing is a trick, a bad trick. And here's the thing about specials, TV specials. The, the people in your audience who attended the taping that night fell for your trick because they're not up close and personal with you the way a television audience is. The, the television lens has way too wide an exposure. That is a wide open exposure, that lens on television. So it exposes Dave Chappelle's verbal prestidigitation. We see on television the tricks you're performing. The live audience can't pick it up because there's that energy of a live performance. But when we see it on television, you're under a microscope and it exposes your third rate comedy mind. Great performer, third rate comedy mind. We see the punchlines coming, Dave. Don't take those long pauses like you're holding on to something that's going to drop a bomb. No, we, we know what you're holding on to. We notice your, your studied fake laugh. And most importantly, when you're watching it on television, not when you're seeing it live, but when you're watching this on television, Dave, we see the paper thin artifice of danger. When at no point in the special are you in any peril whatsoever. And that I find really offensive. The false illusion of danger. I find that offensive. There is nothing dangerous about what you're saying in your special. Now, I watch all his specials. I think uh, he's probably the greatest comedy mind of our time, and that's not saying much about these times. You know, he's a reflection of who we are as a people, and it's not a pretty reflection. It's not. I watch his specials, he's compelling. Let me state up front I'm jealous of his success, and more importantly, I'm jealous of his talent. He is living life on his own terms. I am not. Dave, Chabelle, Dave Chappelle is the guy who reads writing samples. I am the guy who submits writing samples to be read in the hope someone with a third-rate comedy mind like Dave Chappelle would hire me. So the jealousy, no question, no question. He still has a third rate comedy mind and that special is more than just problematic. I'm not saying he should be canceled. I'm saying if he has the right to make it dangerous for a transgender person to walk down the street, we all have the right to criticize him. I think we have a First Amendment right to criticize somebody for exercising their First Amendment right, although the First Amendment has nothing to do with this. It's not the government, it's commerce, it's Netflix trying to make more money. And I enjoyed Netflix. I'm not canceling your special. Uh, you know, I can't get through most of your comedy specials. I get through Dave Chappelle's. I, I, like in the blink of an eye, it's over. And I go, really? That was 72 minutes? Uh, so, uh, you know, full disclosure, uh, I don't enjoy watching too many comedians. And I'll, I'll make excuses like, well, you know, I don't want to hear things that other comedians say for fear that I'll end up writing something similar and people will accuse me of, you know, stealing it or being unoriginal. And I also say, I'm open about this, I don't like to watch other people's comedy specials because I don't want to be jealous, right? Okay. Uh, I hope I'm being honest. And the other truth is, the real truth is I find most comedy specials 
boring. There's a lot of waste of time in most comedy specials. There's too much applause, a lot of cheering, a lot of excitement. You know, life is short, uh, you know, get to the funny. I find nothing funny about a comedian bathing in an orgiastic wave of affection. You know, let, you know, cut that out of the special. For me, and I'm right, comedy is conflict. Comedy is danger. The only way a comedian uh, standing in front of a group of people can be funny is if he's in some sort of trouble, if there's some sort of conflict. And that trouble can be anything. Uh, it can be something as simple as being dumber than the audience or smarter than the audience. But there's got to be some disparity between the comedian and the audience. A great comedian, a, a great comedy special, a great play, a great movie that, that's comedic, in order for it to be great, the audience constantly has to be asking, where are they going with this? And we all knew where Dave was going. There were no surprise turns here. This was not the Grand Corniche where you were afraid that uh, Grace Kelly was going to drive the car off the road. Again, Dave Chappelle is a compelling performer with a third-rate comedy mind. What he does, and it's fantastic, he makes it sound funnier than it actually is. He makes it sound funny, and sounds are funny. Sounds are funny. Chappelle's special is a fart. It sounds funny, but it stinks. Now, Dave Chappelle calls it art, and it's not art. It's not art. By any definition, it is not art. But he insists that he's an artist. Art challenges society. Art, by its very nature, is the confluence of perfecting one's craft and then taking it somewhere where that craft has never been before. And he has done that in the past. But in order to pull that off, you have to lose a couple of people along the way. And Chappelle's special is not art because he is not losing people along the way. He's losing people at home who are watching the special, but the people he's playing to in the audience, that's not art. He's not challenging his audience, the people who are giving him a standing ovation and laughing and hanging at his every, on his every word. He doesn't challenge his audience. His fans are not being challenged. And that's the definition of cowardice. He used to do that. Uh, he also uses his own blackness to take liberties with other protected classes of people. I have a problem with that. He uses the plight of African Americans as a cudgel against the LGBTQ community as though it's a competition to see who's had it tougher. It's a bastardization of Afro-pessimism. Uh, I'm interested in Afro-pessimism. I think the, the black experience is, and I'm mispronouncing this term, sui generis. There's nothing like the black experience. And I've been reading about Afro-pessimism, and Dave is a perfect example, not a perfect example, actually, a, a very flawed example of it. If you are an African-American, you are discriminated against unlike any other protected class. Uh, the police, for example. Uh, the black experience is like, unlike any other. But that doesn't give Dave Chappelle license to trivialize the suffering of others. Transgender Americans are born that way. 
just as much as Dave Chappelle was born black. I understand his resentment. I, I, unlike a transgender person, Dave Chappelle doesn't have to put his face on before he goes out. So he thinks that transgender people have the, uh, the fluidity to be transgender when they choose to be. But that's not the truth. They are born that way, the same way Dave Chappelle was born black. And that doesn't mean his suffering is any more profound than their suffering. Now, he's entitled to feel that, and I would feel that way if I were he. It's okay to think that. If I were black, I would resent Jews or a member of the LGBT community because a Jew can disguise who they really are when it's necessary. You can change your last name. You can uh, try to fit in. It's not the same thing as being black. So I get it. I get it. But blacks, Asians, people of color are who they are all the time. John Stewart used to be John Leibowitz. There are a lot of people who don't know that John Stewart is John Leibowitz, but he is John Leibowitz all the time. He knows that he is John Leibowitz, not John Stewart. Again, it's tougher for a, a black person and a gay person like Lindsey Graham can pass. I, I understand the resentment. Uh, but what's the point of putting that resentment into a special? What does that accomplish? Who, what are you moving forward here? Throughout Dave Chappelle's special, he cites Dr. King. Well, and that's a third rail, doing an impersonation of Dr. King and having him say things that are dicey. Uh, well, what would Dr. King say about Dave Chappelle's special? What do you think, Dave? What, what do you think Dr. King would say about your special that trivializes the plight of transgender people? You would know that answer more than I would. What do you think? What do you think he would say about you uh, saying that African-Americans have had it tougher than transgender people? I don't know. I do know that uh, one of the reasons Dr. King was assassinated was because he was trying to unite uh, all protected classes. He was spewing a, a version of socialism and uh, reaching across to understand white bigotry and explain that we're all in the same canoe. It's the people on top who thrive off our attacking one another. I know that J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, found Martin Luther King to be dangerous for the same reason Malcolm X was dangerous, because they were uniting all the people who are suffering. They, they weren't keeping score. You know, Malcolm X and, and Dr. King, before they were assassinated, they weren't saying, okay, uh, David Feldman could pass for a white person, so he's going to get, but he's, but he's a Jew, so he's neurotic, but that's self-inflicted as opposed to a black person who's black all the time. That's, Dr. King knew that that would be a fool's errand. So it's fun to do that, have that conversation, who's had it worse. It's a fun and funny conversation, but not if you mean it, not if you're making a point about transgender people. So what was the point of trivializing, mocking transgender people publicly 
other than scoring cheap laughs that anybody can tell. That's not art. That's, you know, I, I, I have to do another Netflix special. What's the easiest way to get my material made? During a pandemic, when the only people showing up to clubs when you were working this material out were uh, conservative, you know? People who didn't believe COVID was that dangerous, who didn't believe in masks. This was a special put together in Texas, playing to Joe Rogan's audiences, right? This is, you were playing wherever there was an audience. Well, wherever there has been an audience in the past year and a half, they tend to be careless and conservative. And conservative now means careless. They couldn't care less about themselves. So they go to a comedy club without a mask and they certainly couldn't care less about the plight of transgender people. So your act reeked of, it had that stale nightclub air on it. It wasn't transcendent. It was in the comedy gutter. I smelled the stale beer and, and the, the, the three-day-old popcorn. That's what your special smelled like. You didn't challenge those audiences. So it was cowardice. You were playing to a conservative crowd and it shows. And that's not art. At best, it's artifice. You create the illusion of being dangerous, but there wasn't anybody in that audience, Dave Chappelle, who disagreed with you. The only danger comes from outside your semi-permeable bubble. If you choose to read a review, then it's dangerous. But you don't need to read reviews. You have your fan base. And they're not going to challenge you. And if they're not going to challenge you, that's not art. Not one person heckled you or hissed you or booed you. Nobody in that crowd had the temerity to challenge Dave Chappelle's statements. And uh, it is not art for a comedian to stand on the stage surveying all he possesses. That special, as compelling as it is, was like a Tucker Carlson monologue. You, you bark these author authoritative declarations that nobody challenges, and you fool your fools into thinking what you're saying possesses logic. There's, you're not a logician. Your act, that special was pure sophistry pure sophistry. The words and the performance, it, it sounds razor sharp, but it doesn't hold up to even a fifth grader's scrutiny. Great performer, Dave Chappelle, third rate comedy mind. If you made a blind submission to a world-class comedy writing room, you wouldn't even make it through the first round. I promise you that, Dave Chappelle. I promise you. If you had a, you know, if you had walked away from that fifty million dollars and you didn't have five million or ten million already in the bank and you were broke and nobody would handle you and your agent said, "Well, there's a really great show that's hiring. Put together a writing submission." it would reveal your third-rate comedy mind and you would not get hired. That's why you have to perform to make weak cheese sound better than it, than it actually is. Your logic crumbles under scrutiny. Your ideas are lifeless and most importantly, mind-numbing. You make your fans stupid and even worse, dangerous. Dangerous. The same way Jerry Falwell is dangerous. When preachers, Greg Locke, when these preachers 
who have devoted followings, when they attack Muslims, gay people, they give solace to the people who crucify Matthew Shepard. When you say to your devoted fans, and you know, I used to be one, when you say to your devoted, mind-numbingly stupid fans that biology is a fact, and some of them hear something that, that's dangerous. Again, your special is compelling. I watched the whole thing. I'm going to watch it again. I have a lot to learn watching you. Uh, again, but it's not funny. And it's even the stuff that approaches funny is only funny because you're saying it funny. You make funny sounds. Your special is a fart. It sounds funny, but it stinks. You, uh, you have command of the audience. But uh, even that's beginning to look suspect. You know, there, there, there are those fake laughs, those pauses where you, you, know, you hit the microphone on your knee. It's very studious, very studied. And uh, it's self-referential. Oh, I'm in trouble now. You're not in trouble. You're not in trouble. You're not rolling the stop sign Dave, because it's your road. Nobody's pulling you over for rolling the stop sign because it's your road. There are no stop signs. It's not dangerous. It's safe. It's perfectly safe. You're not saying anything that's ever going to get you in trouble. You're saying things that are going to get transgender people in, tr in trouble. You're... Uh, You're a great performer, but you're not doing anything that's dangerous. You're not saying anything that will ever get you in trouble, certainly not in front of an adoring crowd who cares more about what you think of them instead of the other way around, and that's not art. You can't lay claim to walking the edge when there's no edge. You're walking a tightrope on hard wood floors. That's not dangerous. And the fact that you didn't challenge the audience makes you sound pretty brittle to me. The fact that you just spoon fed your audience what they wanted to hear, even though you have the power to take them anywhere you want and you didn't, sounds pretty brittle to me. You know, you can say things about the LGBTQ community. Uh, you know, I, Lisa stopped doing it, but I loved Lisa. I took my kids to see Lisa. And, and Lisa was an artist because she invited the audience to challenge her. Uh, if, Dave, you, you said those things in your spe special, and then you paid some sort of consequence on stage comedically then it would be brave that's why lisa that's why i loved watching lisa because she paid consequences for what she said there was give and take uh, that's much funnier that's more akin to art than what you're doing uh so you can make fun of the transgender community so long as you pay a price for it on stage in front of your audience. It's okay to be a bigot if the bigot is being laughed at, is being revealed as stupid. That, that, that's art. It's a tiresome form of art. We've seen it too often, but you can make fun of protected classes so long as it's dangerous for you and you pay a price in front of your audience. You didn't pay a price. You got, you got paid a hefty price. Uh, that's not art. Watch Anthony Jeselnik. He's an artist. He, he, he says 
horrible things and he allows himself to get booed so he in my estimation he can say exactly what you're saying because he'll sit in the mess he made but you won't you won't because you're brittle you won't allow the audience to talk back to you you're brittle uh you're not controversial you're doing easy material that i could have seen in the in the 70s making fun of transgender people i mean how many times did comedians dress up i mean milton burl dressed up in women's clothing i mean this is tired weak cheese you're taking easy shots at transgender people and nobody's talking back to you and that that's interesting because in this special dave chappelle talks about a show he did in san francisco this is a very self-serving cover-up in the special he's covering his tracks uh for probably participating in the suicide of a inexperienced transgender comedian so he spends a lot of time covering his tracks talking about the trust fund he set up for the, the transgender comedian's kid uh makes it a point of covering his tracks and uh so the blame for her suicide is not on dave's shoulders i think it is but i'm gonna talk about this right now watch his special it's compelling the same way a trump rally is compelling the same way a lecture by jordan peterson is compelling the same way the first 20 minutes of tucker carlson's neo-nazi shindig on fox is compelling so watch the special he he talks about doing a show in san francisco and how he decided to have a transgender woman transgender comedian open for him and this is this really doesn't hold up to scrutiny it, it's it's if you watch it it's it's really an indictment of dave chappelle i mean it's pretty bad uh so he has this transgender comic open who had really she was an open micer she wasn't ready to open for dave chappelle he was using her it takes they say it takes four years to to have an idea of what makes you funny it's gotten because of television and computers you know it could be two years some people are just born funny this transgender person he says had only done it a couple of times and he makes the point of saying she stunk he makes it a point of saying she was not funny and yet he had her open for him in front of thousands of people in san francisco and that's immoral it is immoral to use a, a person a transgender comedian to for self-aggrandizement to say look look how inclusive i am uh but then to end up humiliating this transgender comedian because she wasn't ready to play in front of his audience he said that in the special and you have to protect people from themselves people people will say yes if you say to somebody who's not ready you want to do you want to host saturday night live most comedians who've only done it five times will say absolutely and then they will have a public humiliation that they some of whom will never survive Jerry Seinfeld did that to Orny Adams in that special called Comedian. Watch that. It was very cruel what he did to Orny Adams, who was just starting out. And he just, Jerry wanted to show 
both sides of the comedic coin, what it's like to be Jerry Seinfeld traveling around the world in a private jet, and then Orny Adams, who has been doing it for a couple of years, and Orny pulled a Shelley Berman, that's an obscure reference, but the cameras were on, and Orny made a fool out of himself, and it was very cruel what Jerry did to Orny Adams. And it's very cruel to take a transgender comedian who's only done it at best 20 times, I don't even think it was 20, and put her in front of Dave Chappelle's crowd. And he says, she bombed. She bombed. He says she sucked as a comedian. And, uh, but then he talks about how she sat down uh, and watched him and heckled him. She performed and then sat down and heckled him. So he was heckled by the transgender comedian, which suggests that that comedian had problems. If you open for Dave Chappelle and then you sit in the front row after you've just bombed and you start heckling Dave Chappelle and talking back to him, uh, something you're suffering, you lack some kind of self-awareness and you need to be protected from yourself. You need guidance, not exposure, not exposure. You need guidance and help. Uh, now, when he was being heckled by that comedian, that had the potential to be art because he had to defend himself, but he doesn't show us that. He, he tells us what happened. We have to take his word for it. Uh, so maybe it was art if you were there. I doubt it. Uh, again, he makes it a point of repeating. It's a callback that she sucked as a comedian. And uh, I suspect when she heckled him, there were huge laughs and he had a good time because those laughs were at her expense. And he didn't have to pay a price for the way he talks about transgender people. But Dave has been elevated to a bubble of privilege, and he can't imagine that he was actually hurting her, humiliating her. But that's what he did. He took a transgender comedian, someone who had performed seven times, put them in front of his audience so she could be laughed at, not with. He did to her what Howard Stern made his career out of putting on display people who aren't ready to be put on display. Putting people in front of a microphone or a camera who should be protected from what they want because they're going to end up getting laughed at, not with. Uh, this was an open micer. And uh, Chappelle used her. He put her on stage and said, see, I'm not transphobic. We're enjoying a transgender comedian die for 30 minutes. Aren't I benevolent? You know, if you're a comedian, you're deeply troubled. If you're someone who wants to be a comedian, but rarely performs, then you're really deeply troubled. And then if you're wearing a dress, if you're transgender, then you're deeply, 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 deeply troubled. Wanting to be a comic, wanting to be a trans, being a trans, born transgender, and it's troubling. You need to be protected especially from some decisions you make when you haven't quite figured everything out. Again, she committed suicide. We all make bad, we all make bad decisions, especially comics who crave acceptance. She was craving acceptance. She was a comic craving acceptance. She was a transgender person craving acceptance. I can't think of anything more vulnerable than a transgender comedian. 
why would you exploit that person and put them on stage and have them bomb for 30 minutes other than your own self-aggrandizement? We all want to be accepted. Comedians, transgender people want to be accepted and rejection stings. And that rejection can make a transgender comic be a danger to herself. She needs to be protected, Dave, not humiliated. Now, I know Dave's opening act, this woman, this transgender person, killed herself. He talks about this. He got, tw- he got about 10 minutes out of her killing herself. Uh, turns out, Dave, somebody you purport to care very much about was brittle. She was brittle. She killed herself. And I see a contradiction here because you have no affection for comics who are brittle, delicate, frail, weak. In a previous special, you mocked the, uh, the female comic who said she stopped doing comedy after Louis C.K. jerked off in front of her. And you said she must be a truly brittle person if that stopped her from being a comedian. You don't respect the brittle. You don't. Your transgender comedian, quote unquote, friend was very brittle. And you put her in an awkward situation. You put her up on stage to be laughed at. You knew she wasn't ready. You gave her just enough fame so you would not look transphobic. And you gave her just enough fame so she would feel the need to defend you on Twitter. Now, you also say in your special that Twitter isn't real. First you say Twitter isn't real, and then when you lay blame for your transgender comedian friend committing suicide, you blame the left-wing Twitter mob that went after her for defending you. You claim that she committed suicide because the Twitter mob, which isn't real, went after her with so much ferocity, she killed herself. Sounds pretty real to me, Dave. Or maybe Twitter isn't real. Maybe you're right. Maybe Twitter didn't kill her. Maybe you did. Maybe you helped create a situation where she became a little too famous too soon because of you. And she was associated with you and then got rejected by her own community. And she killed herself. Maybe you killed her, Dave. And maybe people who see your special are going to go out and beat up a transgender person because you say gender's a fact. Twitter, I don't think Twitter is the reason she committed suicide, Dave Chappelle. I don't. I think you exploited a, a brittle person and you had no problem exploiting a brittle person because you don't respect anybody who's brittle because you are strong and wealthy and successful and rose above the odds the deck was stacked against you and you rose above it you were not brittle so you have no respect for the breakable You don't respect someone who splays their fragility wide open in front of an audience like she did and says, think of me as you wish. I'm I'm at your mercy. That's art, by the way. Bombing, splaying yourself wide open in front of an audience and throwing yourself on the mercy, crowds, a, a psychic crowd surf, that's art. Watch Richard Pryor. 
a transgender comic who was an open micer dying in front of Dave Chappelle's audience. That's closer to art than anything Chappelle was trying to pass off on, net, on Netflix. Uh, identity politics uh, is dangerous in politics, not so much a third rail in comedy. It's important to discuss in comedy, but it's not the third rail of comedy. It's not dangerous for me to talk about being Jewish on stage. That's not dangerous. It's not dangerous to talk about being black or transgender. That's what comedy has become. It's important to talk about this, not as dangerous as it used to be. Uh, I think Chappelle might be guilty of doing the thing that uh, he finds so repulsive in others. I think his comedy couldn't rise above identity. And uh, again, I think identity in comedy and in politics is incredibly important uh, because it's stubborn. Identity is stubborn. There are Americans who hate Dave Chappelle just because he's black. And there are Americans who hate transgender people just because they're transgender. For example, Dave Chappelle would fall in the latter category. I think he hates or has a serious problem with transgender people. I think you have to really hate transgender people to dedicate so much of your time, night after night, honing material that trivializes their plight. You have to have a serious problem, if not a hatred, for transgender people to hone a slick 20-minute chunk on gender being a fact. Now, who cares about whether or not somebody is transgender? Well, Dave cares. In the special, he says he cares because he has children. What does that mean? If your son tells you he's a woman, you're going to tell him to act like a man, to snap out of it? Are you going to tell if you have a son who identifies as a woman? Are you going to slap him? Are you going to say gender is a fact and wait for an applause break? Are you going to withhold the one thing your son needs more than anything in the world? Your love and acceptance? Sounds like another suicide on your hands. Now, hopefully, Dave, I, I, I'm hoping his son... Uh, doesn't, I, I, I would hate to think of what the consequences would be if Dave had a son who identified as transgender. I would assume Dave Chappelle, if he had a son who was transgendered, Dave would, in a few years, take a page out of the Republican playbook and apologize. He'll say something along the lines, you know, like Ken Melman did. Ken Melman was the head of... Uh, a closeted gay who was chairman of the Republican Party in 2004, and 2004 was the most homophobic presidential race in the history of American politics, orchestrated by Ken Melman, gay and Jewish, and Karl Rove, whose father committed suicide because he was gay. Pretty sure it was either Karl Rove's father who committed suicide because he was gay or his stepfather committed suicide because he was gay. I don't have time right now to, to look it up. Uh, but then, you know, Ken Malman, when the election was over and he went into the private sector to be a lobbyist, he apologized for 2004 as though an apology uh, will repair any of the damage. It's a page out of the right wing playbook. 
you know, I'm sorry for the hurt I caused. I now realize blah, 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 blah. And now I need the money, the check from the lobbying firm. Uh, they apologize for homophobia or transphobia when it affects them personally. And uh, so I don't know what, uh, what Dave Chappelle has in store for us next. I know I'm going to watch it. I know that. And I know I'm jealous of him. And I know he looks down on me for not being as rich as he is. And I know his fans are going to say, you're just jealous of him because he's more successful because that's the ultimate yardstick in America. Who is richer? Who is more famous? Who is more successful? Not who is crueler. Who causes more damage? Who has more blood on his hands? No, I'm not as rich, successful, or as loved as Dave Chappelle is. I'm not as persecuted. I've had an easier life than Dave Chappelle. Doors were opened for me that would never be open for Dave Chappelle. So he is stronger. I am more brittle. He's richer, more successful, more loved than I could ever dream of. But I don't have as much blood on my hands. I never exploited somebody. I never took advantage of somebody who was in trouble for my own self-aggrandizement. And he looks down on me because I don't have his money. And he looks down on his audience because they don't have his money. He didn't support Bernie Sanders. He supported Andrew Yang. No fan of the 99%. I watched Andrew Yang run for mayor here in New York City. Also no fan, Andrew Yang, of the LGBTQ community. He had a big problem, Andrew Yang, with the LGBTQ community. At best, he was ignorant. He, he showed how ignorant he was about the gay lifestyle and the Stonewall riots and what goes on in gay bars. Uh, so, again, I am uh, not... I'm, I'm telling people to watch Dave Chappelle's special. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not for canceling him. I'm just for people using their right to speak out against him. And uh, I am taking my step. I have called my manager. I'm, this is what I'm doing. I've called my manager and I, I told him that in the future, I will no longer be furious with my manager for failing to get me a Netflix special. That's the stand I'm taking. For years, I was angry at Alex for not getting me a Netflix special because of Dave Chappelle, because of his transphobic remarks, because of Netflix firing those transgender employees. I called my manager and I said, under no circumstances will I ever be furious with you for failing to get me a Netflix special. This is the David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. I have a meager following on Twitter, a meager following on Facebook. But unlike Dave Chappelle, I'm not responsible for anybody's suicide. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting.
It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. You're listening to the David Feldman Show, David Feldman Show. Are you listening? Am I, is my mic on? Yes, it's on. You're listening to the David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. I have a YouTube channel, believe it or not, and it's growing ever so slowly. I have a feeling I probably just uh, lost half my uh, subscribing base. Uh, but uh, please uh, follow, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and come to our show. We do a live taping every Monday and Thursday in the Zoom room. Please come and join us, meet new people. And this Friday night at 8 p.m., office hours, I, if you want to talk to me about the show, come to office hours. I hold court from 8 till 9. I'll take your calls and your questions. And then we open it up to the entire community. And we have professors and teachers and musicians and comedians. Oh, my. Well, time for my friend. I never seem to have enough time for him. Deerfield, Massachusetts, very own writing comedy genius, comedy writing genius and farmer. Please say hello, John Ross. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, Dave, I listened to a little bit of your rant about uh, Dave Chappelle. Yes. And, and now I, I feel a little bit guilty. Yeah. Because um, the last time uh, you and I performed together, mm -hmm. uh, you did open for me and you did bomb. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if I did that to try to continue it. <laughs> no, but here's the thing. I was the headliner. Yes. And I made you go last because you're a stronger performer than I am. Or I wanted you, to, I wanted the blood to be on your hands and not mine. I wanted you to be the one who left the audience with a bad taste in their mouths. Uh, so, so what, what's on your mind? I, I want to talk about stand up comedy for a second, if you, but what's on your mind, sir? Well, I, I mean, I did not watch uh, the Dave Chappelle special, nor oh, do I think I will. I know you're you're trying to make me watch it, but I just don't feel any compunction or I don't feel compelled to watch it because it'll just be a bummer. It's just, a, you know, it's sort of like uh, watching, uh, I don't know, at the end, you know, they traded Willie Mays to the Mets in those last couple of years and he was struggling. It's like, you want to remember the guy in his prime and, uh, you know, you don't want to see a guy get a, you know, uh, Fly week fly out. So anyway, I, well, I, let know, me just address that Pope John Paul before see. before Bratzinger, right? Pope Paul yeah. died like in two thousand and five, right? And he was a corpse before he died. And they asked him, "Why are you doing this?" And he said, "I am dying. It is my job as Pope. I'm being serious to." No die in front of you to show you that this is part of the human condition it's my job to die in front of you to decay in front of you to remind that's, you that's that's 
sort of like your act. <laughs> yeah, I should I should wear a miter instead of a baseball yes. cap. Yeah, yeah, lose the clown suit <laughs> and get the the pope hat and the staff. <laughs> Gonna work. By the way, this there are three people responsible for my wearing a clown suit. Yeah. Billy J, Steve Kravitz, but it was John Ross who came up with the idea. Well, <laughs> I, mean, well I don't know if uh, I don't know what to say to that. But uh, three okay, years so in my life in a clown oh, suit. So the Pope's job was to die, keep this train going. What, what was your point? The point is that you don't want to see Willie Mays playing for the Mets. You want to remember him making that basket catch, you know, with his back turned to the catcher. When in fact, part of baseball, if you paid attention and played the game, part of baseball is the decline. Seeing these, these giants, if you'll pardon the pun, become mere mortals. That's part of the joy of the game. Sing Roy Camp and that, no, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go. Know, to I, I don't know. I don't know how true that is, but but either way, I, I there's something about the only reason I would watch the Dave Chappelle special would be so that I could opine on it rather than be entertained by it. Like it's my job. I have to watch. The, I don't owe him my time. I don't owe him anything. I'm not compelled to watch that. So what about what do you owe the transgender community? You know, he should have, if he wanted to book a transgender comic, there's plenty who are actually quite uh, skilled. Julia Scotty, for instance, um, would have gone on in front of him and, and crushed. But he didn't. He apparently didn't want that, you know. But what, what do you owe? The, in other words, by ignoring. Right now, right, right now, about 150 bucks. <laughs> oh, I mean, so you, you yeah, I want to talk about that. Uh, but okay. you should pay that bill. You, what do you owe? the uh the community um i don't know who's it who's the danger i don't owe them to watch that show uh and my, my opinion about it doesn't even matter it's their opinion of it if they want to watch it and and opine all i read the the poet who had the article in gq uh mm -hmm. zaid um i read their uh article i'll read articles about it but I really don't feel compelled to have to watch his special. So that's just me. Right. And I don't, I don't think the transgender community expects me to watch that show. I don't think they want me to. Let's put numbers on the board for Dave, right? Yeah, but, well, anyway, let, let's, then let's change the subject because I devoted right. an entire hour to- Yeah, let's, here's, here's something that's on my mind. I, I'm noticing- uh, I know what's his name, uh, Jim Jordan, and, and a few others. There, you know, there's a lot of vaccine skepticism, and now it's bleeding into uh, all vaccines. Like they want to have no vaccine mandates at all. And I want to say to the uh, conservatives out there that uh, I think they should be looking askance at antibiotics too. I don't know. <laughs> uh, they should really be trusting. How does that work with the? You know, you're putting that. It's, uh, you know, I would distrust antibiotics if I were them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. OK, what else are we going to talk about? I have nothing. I don't know. What, I'm, uh, you always come loaded for a bear. I we usually can... do this. But I called you at the a, last minute. It was a last minute thing where you right. called me. Um, we got what's going on with the peepers. How are the how are the leaves? Uh, they remain kind of lameish, um, but yeah, it, but it's still gorgeous. It was a beautiful day today, so took we have there's there's drama in my little in my little town on my little road. Go on. Well, the apparently. Please tell me. Please tell me you hate your neighbors. No, I don't hate my neighbors, but uh, they 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 declared. The, the road, it's paved up to a point and then it turns into a dirt road um, past my home. And, and there's more homes have been built down that way. And apparently uh, those homes got a letter in the mail that said, 
yeah, this isn't a town road anymore and we're not going to plow it. We're not going to maintain it. And everybody's up in arms. And so I was listening to the town meeting last night and uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Did you speak out against masks and make it about yourself? I, you know, I wanted to go to the meeting because the people, apparently somebody at the meeting paid uh, some expert to to go back in the history and research it. And they, they're, they're a real expert. And they came up with this report that said, yes, this is a town road. It was established here. It was, and they presented it to the town council and the town council didn't rule that way. And their answer was our, the town attorney, we have to listen to the town attorney. They told us, yeah, this is not a town road. And and my point, which I would have made is like, hey, we know from the Supreme Court, like two different justices don't rule the same way. You know, the way Bill Barr mm-hmm. comes down on something is different the way Eric Holder came down on something. I'm like, who's this town attorney? I didn't vote for that person. Right. right. Is it a lifetime appointment? And or- who are his clients? Well, it's a she is what I'm told. But I'm now curious because apparently it, it influences the decisions that the town council makes and they would, they just kept backing up and saying, look, our attorney said, that's what we have to do. So I'm like, well, okay, sorry. Anyway, that's, uh, I, I, you know, in terms of schadenfreude, I, I have a friend who succeeded in television writing and he bought a nice house and he has good values and he hates his neighbor. And, and it, and it just pleases me to no end because he can't move. He's, he's in it. He's got the kids in the schools and the wife with the garden, and he hates his neighbor, and they're literally fighting over the border. Like there's a foot, well, not even a foot, and it's like court and lawyers, and it's the principal. If he, if he takes a foot, what's to stop him from taking an arm? And he's in court, and, he, and he's, I, I think, you have this beautiful house, like you're living where I would want to live and have peace and, and, and you're, you don't have peace and quiet. Well, the first place I owned in Los Angeles was actually Santa Monica, the little, the, a condo. Um, the reason I moved was because to get away from uh, my downstairs neighbor, uh, the reason I sold. And it was, here's what happened. So it was an apartment building that went condo. And when it did, because when each one of them. In- I love this. So there were, you know, so there was. This, this the is park- like, huh? There was the parking lot, right? Yeah, I remember. So you remember this. So some of the units had two spots and other units only had one spot. And the way it was drawn up, my two spots were tandem meaning one car went in and the other car went in behind them. So if there was somebody else, you know, if my wife was there and she needed to get out, I had to move one car so she could pull out, blah, 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 blah. And so anyway, at at one point I looked at the parking lot and I said, wait a minute, there's no reason for these to be, like if you just reconfigured, if these went at a diagonal along the front of the building, then everybody, you know, could have their own spot that wasn't tandem. The people who had one spot would still have one spot. They wouldn't get a second spot, but the other people wouldn't <laughs> have. And my downstairs that, neighbor- who, You still remember the intricacies of oh, this. Oh, <laughs> well, and so my downstairs neighbor who only had one spot said, no, no. And I went, well, wait a minute, what, why not? We just have to, you know, redraw some lines. And then, and he said, well, because then your place is more valuable than- uh-huh. and, and I don't gain any value. Do you want to pay me to change it so that you wow. have to to a spot? And I went, dude, it's no skin off of your, you still have your one spot and I just don't have to pull in and pull out. And he was like, well, no, we're not changing it. And, and he lived below you. He lived below me. And then they started smoking and blowing the smoke up uh. into the windows. And, and I said, you know what? I, I, I just, I'm not going to argue with this guy. I'm just putting my place up for sale and moving. And I sold yeah. it and moved. It, it, it is the most under discussed problem in America is neighbors, 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 neighbors. It is, yeah. it is the difference between misery and happiness. Well, you know, the people who we bought are this place from and the people who are next door to us, they, uh, they didn't get along. 
And the guy on the other, the guy next to me owns a piece of property on my other side and he's got a sugar shack over there. So he's got a little right of way through my land. Uh, and apparently the guy who used to live here, who didn't like that guy, he made it so that, all right, it goes 10 feet. It's 10 feet wide. Exactly. And it goes 10 feet here. Then it turns and it goes 10 feet. That, and then it like, so you couldn't possibly get any machinery or you couldn't get over there. And he, and I, I just, you know, when I, I plowed a straight thing, I go here, you can just go through there and get to your place. We get along. Okay. It's much better. It's much better for everybody. I let him use part of my land in return. He plows uh, my driveway. So it's, it's a good deal. Anyway. I will. I, I, my kids don't watch my show, but if they, this is not a secret. Uh, my, I had a neighbor who hated our dogs and my kids. And I would agree with the neighbor. I used to say to the neighbor, can you, I swear to you, I said, could you call the police on them? <laughs> I swear to you, they would leave the dogs out till all hours of the night bark. I'd come home from work. <laughs> Are you, and, I, and, and my, I'm getting angry. I would I'd come home, it would be like 11 o'clock and the dog, I could hear the dog barking. Wait, whose dog is this? My dog. Our dog, you remember my house? Remember what it was like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'd, uh, I'd be walking home from work and I'm two blocks away and I'm going, that's Anya. That, and, and, you know, I love my kids, but you know, I'm walking home and I go, those mother, it's 11 at night and they're, they're still up and that dog, is, and uh, so I walk home. The one night I walked home and the I could hear the dog barking and I'm thinking I'm gonna, and I, 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 I knocked on my neighbor's door and I said, I just got home. He goes, it's un he goes, it's unbelievable. Your kids are so inconsistent. And I said, could you call the police on my family? You could have called the police. I don't, well, what am I going to say? I can't control my family. You I have could, no authority. You could pretend to be your next door neighbor. That no, would have been true. Really enough. But I'm reminded of the the Frank Santarelli bit where he goes, and I'm at my uh, I'm in my kitchen making poison games burgers. Uh, <laughs> so. We should have him on the show. I know. Well, you used to. Yeah, I know. You, I know. Speaking of who who should be on the show. I laughed at somebody on Twitter. I don't know why they uh, decided. I, got oh, I, I saw this. This is great. Tim. Somebody. I don't. I don't know why I got. Uh, how do I? How do I even find this? Um, this is great. Yeah. This made me laugh really hard. Um, By the way, follow John on Twitter at Fun with Friction. How do I find that? Well, they somebody. Said, somebody tweeted. I here it is. I stopped listening to your podcast regularly when I realized uh, Helene Olin and Dr. Jen were no longer going to be guests. What happened? They're two of the smartest people you've had on the show. No respect to John Ross. No disrespect to John Ross. And I'm like, hey, how do you throw me under the bus? <laughs> right. So like, what did you write? And I and I wrote my response to. Oops. Uh, I always hit the wrong thing. Um, I, I wrote, believe me when I say everyone would prefer it if Helene Olin and Dr. Jen were on the show instead of me, with the possible exception of Helene Olin and Dr. Jen. <laughs> so let's circle back to what he said, because he answers his own question. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yo, what yo, does he say? Well, what ha why aren't they on the show? And Good question. Now he answers it. It's, is it because they realized where no, they no, were? No, no, what he wrote. Say what he wrote. He asks, why aren't they on the show? Then his yeah. next sentence answers the question. He said, what happened? Then the third sentence. Is um, they're two of the smartest people you've had on the show. <clears throat> yes. They, so that answers why they're not on the show. Helene Olin, you know, is a columnist for the Washington Post. After a couple of appearances, she began to realize who I am, well, what the it, show is. It was like waking up, you know, in a dream, you know, you're in your underwear. And you're like, oh, holy <laughs> cow, well, what am I doing here? I'm what am I doing? He doesn't stop asking me to come on the show. 
He won't but, stop asking me. How do I say no? Yeah. So uh, I will reach out to Helene. I think she's, she, you know, like most people, she's had it with me. And the same applies to Dr. Jen. But you're right. I, I should keep begging them. <laughs> Come on, and I, I promise I am, I am, I am shameless uh, about begging people to come on the show. So, and and to be honest, the second any other podcast asks me to come on as a guest, you can say goodbye to me too. I, I, I wouldn't blame you uh, at all. Now, this is a great show. It is. Yes, this, it is. Uh, this is an important show. It's an important, important show. Yes, yes, that's. Uh, you do, you do you remember the first you, you may not know this uh i have two stories when i was living in park la brea with my very young family yes you used to come over with buddy yes and i have a very fond memory of my kids uh-huh because they they at the time were very sweet and innocent uh-huh. and you used to come over with buddy tell was- everybody who buddy was African gray parrot. Beautiful parrot. And you would come over holding seeds. And do you remember what was underneath Buddy on your shoulder? I had a little, uh, the poop towel. So you would, was, or sometimes you would just come over and there'd be bird shit on maybe. your shirt. And sometimes I wore like an over shirt that was okay to get poop on. Yeah. And you'd maybe. come over just with a shirt, a shoulder that was just splattered with white bird shit and my son thought that was amazing <laughs> he because he was at that age where like birds like and you were okay with it and you would and anyway and uh you would come over and they would look forward to seeing buddy what did buddy say uh buddy had a, a whole array of different uh things that he would say i mean i had that that one joke about how uh, he could say, uh, give me kiss. How you doing? And they really liked you, but they decided to go in a different direction. <laughs> so I got to move him away from the answering machine. Right, right. So this is when I realized my kids were, uh, human beings. Cause I, there's a, you know, you know, you have kids and they're innocent and then you realize they have a, a sense of humor and it's not always pretty. Mm-hmm. They were like three and four. And what happened to Buddy? Um, it's a sad story what happened to Buddy, but Buddy uh, basically got taken by a hawk. What more? You want me to you want me to cry on your show? What, no. what do you, yeah, that's what happened. So well, that wasn't uh what you told me originally you told me he if, flew, you told me he flew away well what happened was um i didn't know about the hawk well, let me well just tell you, before let me just tell this well, is well, what is a moment i remember vividly <laughs> i went okay the kids are definitely at another level here so you were coming over and what, one of them said is he bringing buddy and i said oh he, he's very de- <laughs> he's very uh, I, he's very depressed. Buddy flew away. And my son looked at my daughter and they started laughing. <laughs> Jesus. I never told you that. They just started laughing that Buddy rejected you. And I said, he just found another place to live. And they thought it was the funniest thing that, <laughs> that Buddy left you. And you were, and I said, and he's very sad about it. And they just started laughing that you were sad about Buddy. Well, that just showed me that kids are the apple doesn't fall far from the tree is what it tells you. Yeah. Buddy wasn't your buddy, was he? No, buddy. We you uh, so a hawk got him, huh? Well, uh, what you do so that they uh, can't fly away or so that they can't get lift. You give their uh, flight feathers a trim. They grow back, but you give them a trim and uh I was walking somewhere with him and he was on my shoulder and we were passing by a construction site. And like, just as we were passing by, we were in the Santa Monica Hills. I don't know if you know where the stairs are that you run up and down for exercise Mm -hmm. over there. And there's this road and the guardrail. uh, And one of the construction guys threw something off the roof into the dumpster, you know, like two floors down. And it made this 
gigantic clang and buddy just got scared and flew off my shoulder but he couldn't like fly up and so he was just flying straight and i was like almost could reach him i was right behind him and i got to the guardrail and he flew into a tree and i saw a hawk almost immediately uh come for him no yeah now do you remember my first dog your first dog mahara the rhodesian ridgeback I don't. You've told. St- Did you have no, that? No, you, no, 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 no. I'm holding you responsible. I hold uh, you responsible for the clown suit. Uh huh. Something that potentially uh, we Ooh. have got our hand on a dog that was part pit bull, part Rhodesian Ridgeback, and it was gorgeous. And it was the first dog I ever had. Is this and- in San Francisco? No, no. This was a Park La Brea in L.A. Okay. And I would go to feed her and she would she would attack my hand and ah. draw blood ah. and she was in love with my then my second wife I think at the time and if I walked towards my wife as a puppy she would go a, a little louder than my second wife's growl and I thought there's something wrong with this dog uh-huh. And you'd say to me, no, 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 you never had dogs. I go, you don't understand the dog's fine. The dog's fine. I'm saying there's something, this dog is dangerous. And then one day she uh, bit my son's face. Just went, Whoosh. she hated me well, this and my is, son. This is where I tell you that I did know about them laughing at Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> And that was my plan all along. Yeah, nobody would let like I, me and my son. Would go, I'm telling you, there's something. My my little boy, go, there's something wrong with this dog. And you well, and some I'm, the women were going. Well, we we don't have a problem with him. I go, I don't think this dog likes men. And uh, well, I'm uh, I'm a bit of a dog whisperer. I feel like I can train any dog out of almost any. But yeah, they, I'm once sure there are yeah. There are dogs, but there are some dogs who should not be around kids. I agree with you. Probably not. Yeah. How's your dog? Are you ever going to bring the picture that you, the, the crib that you made for your dog? You said you were going to get the picture. I, I lost it on an old phone. And so I don't have that picture anymore. But uh, here, let me show you a picture of a uh, picture of a. Uh, oh, come on. I'm not going to show you a picture of my dog. Um, Wow, are we almost done? Can you bring in? I, I, I know you're going to call me. This is what you're going to do. You're going to call me. Don't have me on the show again because we didn't have any. Blah, 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 blah. It, it was fine. Okay, it was fine. You come, know what? Do, here, I'm going to come. Yes. I'm going to. I'm going to bring Doctor Philip Hershenfeld in. Can I? Can, can I suggest the part of Ethan? Can I suggest that as kind of the log line for your show? The mop up. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, joining us is Dr. Philip Hershenfeld. He's a Freudian psychoanalyst. And playing the part of Ethan tonight will be John Ross. Really? Is Ethan not here? We're gonna, we're, we may have problems, so you're, but you have to be Ethan. I, uh, that, those are big shoes to fill, literally. And uh, Can you tell uh, Ethan's parrot story? <laughs> <laughs> what was? I'm well, sure it has a better ending than mine. So... When Ethan was a teenager, early teenager, we got a, not an African gray, but we got a Amazon yellow nape. Loud, right? Yeah, loud, but they're about the second best talker after the African gray. Ah, ah. And what do kids talk, teach the bird to say immediately upon (laughs) getting the bird? Fuck you. Well, so you, we, so we had ahead. so we had the um, wings trimmed as you were mm-hmm. describing, and Ethan was sitting in a large room with the bird, and the bird we had forgotten to trim the wings so he could fly a little bit. Right. So the bird flings himself off of his perch, flies crazily across the room, bangs into a window, 
falls to the floor. Ethan says, nice flight. And the bird says, fuck you. (laughs) Which begs the question, do they know what they're saying? I am now told they do. They do know what they're saying. Um, Well, it's necessary at this juncture to reference the great Jonathan Katz joke. We all know the Jonathan Katz joke about his parrot. Uh, He he thinks his wife was cheating on him because the parrot said, quick, fuck me before my husband, Jonathan Katz comes home. (laughs) (laughs) There's Ethan. There's There's Ethan. There he is. There you can tag me out. All right, hang on for one second. I don't want to get a call from you. Like, it, it went great. And I don't want to get a call from you going, it wasn't good. I'm you, not, I would never. You're going to call me and, and complain. It was, it was fine. It was fine. Before you disappear, listen yes. to another parrot story. Love it. So we had two dogs at the same time we had this parrot. And the dogs hung out in the kitchen where there was a linoleum floor and it was right near the back door. So I would come into the kitchen every once in a while. I would say, you want to go out? And the dogs would get all excited. And I put the leash on, take them. Well, the parrot after a while learned to imitate my voice perfectly. Yes. And everybody would, do- parrot would be there, dogs would be laying there and the parrot would say, want to go out? And the dogs <laughs> would start running on the linoleum <laughs> <laughs> and they'd get to the door and then they'd look around. <laughs> and I think the parrot was, was really got a kick out of <laughs> tricking these moronic beasts. Well, uh, Buddy was musical and would whistle all different, you know, uh, he knew a bunch of different songs, but he would jumble them up. He'd kind of ma- do a mashup of, mm-hmm. you know, I had taught him um, the, the Jeopardy song and some Beethoven, and he would put them all together and he would whistle these songs. And it turned out there was a guy who lived on the other side of, it was a big, um, I believe it was podocarpus kind of plants. So it was like a green wall. So you couldn't see over it. And he would whistle back and forth with Buddy. And one day he came around and he saw and he went, oh my God. He thought it was like a person with disabilities, <laughs> like a, 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 you know, a somebody with maybe Down syndrome and who was whistling these crazy things. And he was whistling back and forth for I don't know how long with a, a bird, but he thought it was a person. So. Now, let me ask this of Ethan. Yes, sir. It's, Can a, you question hear me? For your, it's a question for your father, but I want to yes. see if you how you answer this. Can you, if, can you hear me, first of all? Yes, I have a I weird can. device. In. Thank you. If we were to place a, a parrot in, not necessarily your father's office, but next to the couch and the parrot, a baby parrot, what are the words eventually, you know, you would hear a phrase over and over again emanating from your father or a psychiatrist's office. Eventually, the parrot would mimic it. What is the phrase that the parrot would most likely spew? I feel like this is a riddle and I'm failing. I, th- I feel I like we should. I'm not good at riddles. I just involve the word crackers, but it's a play on crackers <laughs> versus crackers. I like that. I feel like we should all be oh, writing he's down. He's hungry. You're not crackers. He said the bird is just hungry. <laughs> right. There you go. Severely yeah. crackers. That's that's all the time we have. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, John. Uh, somebody... Hey, have fun, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I will, I'll be listening. Thank you. Thank you. On Ross, fun with friction on Twitter. Ethan Hershenfeld special is Thug Thug Jew. Go see him perform wherever he is performing and watch his YouTube special, uh, Thug Thug Jew. Where are you tonight? Uh, come see me performing in a few minutes here at the Ravello Banquet Hall in East Hanover, New Jersey. We're performing for a bunch of teachers and parents. It's a school. It's a back to school, back to life, back to sharing viral particulates um, Mm -hmm. celebration, I think. 
No, was, no one's I, masked, but I'm assuming they have vaccines. Right. Are you getting the booster? Or you got a booster, right? I got a booster, yeah. yeah. Did you get a Bala booster? That's good. I like that. Bala I don't know what's at the end. So <clears throat> I gave you guys an assignment. I'm sure you didn't. Uh, I I started, Ethan, I, like everybody. I, I didn't. I didn't get the homework. Is there anything I could do maybe to make up for not having done the homework, teacher? Uh, this isn't uh, Dalton, and I'm not Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> this is not uh, a math class with Jeffrey Epstein at Dalton, who was hired by Bill Barr's father. So, uh, Dr. Hershenfeld, I'm being serious. I did the homework, which is not, it's not my MO usually, but I did it this time. Okay, so I was reading the Bible oh. Saturday night. All oh, right. I'm reading Deuteronomy 1 and 2. It is... Hold it. You told me to read Leviticus 1 and 2. Yeah, the Leviticus was the assignment. Yeah, I, I okay, remember not Leviticus. doing it. I remember specifically not reading Leviticus. Well, it was... I'm sitting in bed reading it, and I start laughing... It is as though Ethan wrote it. it now, in all honesty, Dr. Hershenfeld. Well, I don't know what's in it in Deuteronomy. I know what's in Leviticus. It's about bringing burnt offerings. Yes, that's oh, what I'm talking about. And cutting up the bull into all these pieces. It was as though it, 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 it's if you've committed a sin, bring a, a bull with no defects and place him on the altar, no salt, no salt. Mm -hmm. uh, cut the suet from the leg, put the leg to the left, save the fat for God. Do not eat the fat. It's, it's th these diet specific orders that they, I, I, it was like, it was, it was. It sounds to me like that's the, that's the original impossible burger with all those <laughs> instructions. <laughs> There were, were there were things like if you can't afford a duck, bring fine flour in oil, no yeast, <laughs> no yeast. I think so, it's so, like I'm hearing Ethan's voice. That sounds, that like, sounds a like a donut. donut. That's a that's a donut. <laughs> so, doctor, what was your reaction? Did you read what was what? Why do you think I asked you to to read it? Cracking up. I'm sorry. I thought you were cracking up. <laughs> you didn't see any humor in it. It's serious business bringing offerings to the Lord. What, are you kidding? I honestly think, and you can, that it is the mafia, that, that, that you are kicking up to the high priests, that you have these, I know you've studied this stuff, both of you. The way it came across to me, is the high priests didn't work for a living so you would come to them if you committed if I, I i slept with my mother's brother's sister ah that's gonna cost you bring us a bull no defects and we're gonna burn the bull on the altar for god but 20 percent and we and they get 20 percent okay I mean, so seriously, that is right. Don't they get 20% of the offering? They got to make a living. <laughs> it's a protection racket. Okay. I'm not being serious. Yeah. The, 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 they're saying, we'll absolve you of your sins, but it's going to cost you. You're going to have to give us some food and some grain. And protecting you from God, smiting you. Yeah. You want to be smote by God? Smitten, smitten. <laughs> the Harvard guy, you always have to pick a bone. I, 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 if you, was it, so I sent you Leviticus, not Deuteronomy, it was Leviticus. Leviticus, Leviticus. Yeah. This is Leviticus. Yes. It is two of the funniest chapters of comedy I've ever read. It, it, it's just a scam. It, it's it's the beginnings of religion where nobody wants to work. Everybody, they were like, how many? There were twelve tw tribes of Israel. There were, yes. And were the Levites one of those tribes, or were they separate? No, they were one of the 
drive, yes. And so they didn't want to dirty their hands with warfare. They protected the furnishings of the tabernacle. You got it. And, and so they, like, you know, feed me. We're, we're the tribe that so you have. They, they protected the furnishers. They were the, the, the ancestors of Moishe's movers. <laughs> they were, yeah, or the plastic that you put over the furniture. They were, yeah. It's one of the funniest things. The religion. I got to read it. I'd rather see the Netflix series. Are they doing anything? <laughs> I, want, I said to Robert Smigel, we were, I, we were going over, I was laughing. Sorry. I said, somebody should do a real, real story, real stories from the Bible. Not, you know, just there, there's stuff in there that is uh, where one where they collect foreskins where like David before he's the king has to prove that he slaughtered 5,000 warriors, bring me their foreskins, and they, he has to present the fort. Is it Sam? Who came before David? Samuel? Yeah. He has that to present... The prophet. He had to present 5,000 foreskins to Samuel to prove... Oh, that I have to was. say, tonight's episode is the very first time in all of my decades that I've regretted not paying attention in elementary school. <laughs> I don't know any of this stuff. Dr. Hershenfeld, is there a reason the Bible is in Latin and Hebrew? When, when, when you read these stories and they're so insane, is, is, is that why they, you're not supposed to know what's in there? Well, first of all, it's originally in Hebrew. Latin was a later edition. But when it was written in Hebrew, everybody knew Hebrew. So everybody knew what, what these stories were all about. And, you know, you got to delve into the story to find the meaning. Well, what, what is the meaning of kicking up to the high priests? What's the meaning of that? Other than they don't want to go out and do their own hunting. Listen, I want to say this. I was at a memorial service yesterday and there was a priest who spoke and I, I then met him at the, at the lunch after the memorial service, and I complimented him. And, you know, he, he, did, an, he did a great job. It's, it's, it's not an easy job being, being the, the clergy. You have, mm -hmm. to hold, you have to hold all of these emotions and all of these giant experiences for an entire community. So I think it's worth, it's worth at least 20%, or lunch. In this case, the guy got lunch. They, maybe they paid him also, what do I know? The lunch looked great, but not for a vegetarian, because it was like it was like it was like being at a college party. There was like hummus and crackers, and then there was a table with a giant roast on it that everyone was feasting on. And if you don't eat the roast, you were basically at, at like a at a college mixer, uh, uh, dietetically. I was, I was telling Smigel we were going over this, and he said. Uh, it, it was almost as though the, the high priests would hear, like Ethan would come to the high priests and say, I, uh, I masturbated to, to my aunt last night. And the, the high priest would say, goat, lamb, who's in the mood? What are you in the mood for? <laughs> well, we, we had lamb last night. Goat, 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 chicken. Well, okay, everybody wants chicken. Go sacrifice, bring us three chickens. By the way, by the way, fun with friction? Yes. Yes, is I know. That, isn't that what it's referring to? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, good. You have a, you have a dirty mind. <laughs> I do. Correct. Yes. So uh, I once, uh, I'm going to tell a disgusting story. I, I, Hmm. Okay. I'm not going to tell the story. Okay. Uh, think it over. Mark, think it over. Mark, very well. Ethan, you he, 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 he barks, he, he barks oh. like, like a pro. Yes. Wow. Yes. I want a dog. I want a dog. How smart are birds? We used oh, to think. A, 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 do you have the bell ready? Uh, <laughs> yes. I have a squeaky chair. Will that? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Oh, hang on. All right, go ahead. 
How smart are birds? A six. <laughs> that's that's the only sound. <laughs> yeah, there are six. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you about something I said earlier about Israel, and I can't remember what it was. My mind is drawn. That's the question. You want me to come up with what you were saying? What, about what's that? my question that I wanted to ask you about Israel? Here's oh, my oh, problem. I know what it is. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. What? What? what you, you? I have the question. <clears throat> this was this was my uh, oh, late eighties main critique, which was that a small piece of land fought over passionately for millennia, and then there was litter. I, I couldn't take that idea. Like, how can you litter? This is the <laughs> land that you're, how can you leave that little can? This is that, this is not any <laughs> land. This is that land that people are killing themselves over. Mm -hmm. Pick up that goddamn can. Mm -hmm. Like littering in the Holy Land to me was, that was like death penalty stuff. Uh, sacrifice a goat. Anyway, what were you going to say? I said earlier that there is really no archaeological evidence that the Jews were held in bondage in Egypt. Is that correct? Um, sort of. I, I happen to be reading a book right now. Called During the show. <laughs> I, he has to find something entertaining. Called 1177 BC, the year civilization collapsed. And civilizations all around the mostly Eastern Mediterranean, the Egyptian, the Hittite, the, uh, the Trojan War, um, the Minoan, that year they all went dead and it was followed by about a 400 year dark ages i know what happened uh, what uh, happened? uh the ac broke yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing it was so hot there everyone was sweating they didn't have any motivation it was it that's was one of the theories that there was a great climate change at the time there was a huge drought so you're the saying the measure of time is B.C. and then A.C. That's it. That's, that's how we measure. I, I didn't know that. So they said it was climate change? That was one of the... the when was the Epic of Gilgamesh written? Was it written? But at, at any rate, this guy is actually discussing as one of the big topics that was going on there, the exodus from Egypt. And you're right. There is no evidence, but what kind of evidence could there have been tent holes in the desert floor no like so maybe some condos yeah or 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 uh, you know the pyramids there if jews built the pyramids there would be little you know brass plaques moira and edgar hirschman laid the stone for but there, huh? is, there is a famous stella set up by, I forget which, maybe some Ramses or other, which is the first extra biblical mention of the Hebrews. And he does talk about them. And but it is conceivable that Exodus is not true. And didn't Freud write about this? You're going to have to bring three goats for even. <laughs> <laughs> didn't didn't uh, the other thing I said, and I think we've touched about touched on this earlier, that Freud suggested that the the twelve tribes of Israel that left Egypt weren't Jews; they were just a conquering army that went to. Levant. And um, Freud was an atheist. I'm sorry? Freud was an atheist. Well, he had his own theories about this. He thought Moses was an Egyptian. And um, he wrote a whole little book about that, which is worth reading. It's very interesting. Moses and Monotheism, it was called. Right. 
because Moses was a prince, and what Freud didn't know is that every Jewish boy is a prince. That if he had born such a self-hating Jew, but uh, if you what what little I was reading of Leviticus, it did sound like a conquering army. It sound, when they when they hive off the twelve truck, it was about five hundred thousand men. It 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 reads like they were on the march to you know leave egypt and look for a land to settle yeah but that's the biblical story there are other theories um including that they were just people happening to happening to live in egypt i was in egypt once in 98 and uh we went all the way down to the bottom of the red sea not all the way but uh we stayed at a place that was it was a little resort called Shark Bay, which that, that's the worst name of a resort in, yeah. in history. Yeah, that's right. just terrible marketing. I think that's why the Jews left Egypt. Just terrible marketing. <laughs> Is this near Sharm El Sheikh? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Where Mubarak retired to. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Sharm El Sheikh. That's like a, there's a nice re, uh, retirement community for aging oligarchs. Sharm El Sheikh. Wow. Very nice. So that's where you went. Yeah, I went there That's after fancy. I jumped. This wasn't fancy. This was more like hippie, just hanging out in a, in a hut near the water. Um, it was nice. I don't like to scuba dive, though. I just snorkel because I feel like I don't want to get, like, I feel, I feel like gravity works really well. It keeps you right near the ground, like two feet up. Maybe you can get, you could dig a hole, you can go a few feet. I don't, want, I don't think you should go like 30. I don't want to fly particularly. I don't want to go under the sea. Like, when you have to then have artificial oxygen, or people compressing gases to keep you alive. I'm not interested. Right. Um, yeah. Neither. I don't want to go to space. I don't want, do you want to go to space? Not at all. I want other no. people to go to space so I can have Absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. But I, what I haven't heard on the news, there hasn't been enough discussion about the fact that Shatner yesterday, a, a Jew in space, that rarely happens. I mean, Mel Brooks posited that at the end of uh, History of the World, Jews in Space. And then Chappelle made a joke about space Jews in his new special. But right. Shatner, actual uh, Jew in space, that's big news. In space, nobody can hear you complain. That's right. That's, yeah. that's, How many bedrooms is this? <laughs> we could divide this up. Jews in space. I forgot about that from... Uh, yeah, history of the world. Yeah, in the that epilogue. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. He missed. If I don't think he read the Bible when he did the history of the world, because he would have tackled more than just Moses dropping the Ten Commandments. Yeah. So who's on the bill with you tonight? Becky Viduccio, Tommy O'Regan, and uh, Tommy O'Regan. Very funny. Mm -hmm. Becky Viduccio. Oh, Tommy O'Regan uh, is going to be recording his album with the same label that I recorded mine on, 800 Pound Gorilla. So I introduced them and they're doing his album, which is very cool. Right. And Becky Viduccio, who's a terrific comedian and, and she also is a great teacher of, of comedy writing. And then a woman, there's one other comedian on the bill and I, I don't know her and I'm forgetting her name. I'm ashamed. So, yeah. And they're setting up the show. This is exciting. Yeah, and we're, yeah, we're in a I'm in a like a the bridal suite or like a, a an extra banquet room. Yeah, I what feel like I'm what? missing the buffet right now. That's how much I I love you guys. <laughs> what are you reading? It's probably roast beef. <laughs> what are you reading? Yeah, I know. Um, I'm reading my notebook of jokes to figure out what the hell I'm doing tonight. It's now, do you a, have a set a order of, or do you all just put in your mind and just? You know, she specifically for this one wanted some of like the uh, the hits from the album, so I'm sort of resurrecting some of that. But I'm going to open with some some very important new observations I've made about wildlife. Um, in fact, uh, yeah, my plan, my working plan, is that my new album, my next album, will uh, be focused a lot on the animal kingdom. So. Um, yeah, that's what's happening. Oh, I was hoping. Oh, and also, oh, you want to hear? Oh, I think I might have told you about the sharks. How I? Why don't I, we I do this? Why don't, Doctor Hershenfeld? Why don't we write a joke right now? 
and have Ethan tell it, and then you can report back next week on how badly it went over. I love this idea. In fact, Tommy just gave me two tags for the jokes I'm going to open with, which sound great. So I'm going to try them out in front of him, and, and it, they were his. Well, why don't we write a joke about the venue? So you could say, where, where okay. are you? The Ravello Banquet Hall. Ravello, the, the, the manager Italian word. It is, it's, it's a town in, in the Amalfi Coast, a beautiful town. But the, the manager, Paul, told me that a lot of people who come, they think it's like the owners are named Ravello. Right. So that's just a little tidbit. Maybe that, that's fodder for the joke you're going to write. Well, if, if I were desperate, I would say Ravello is an Italian word meaning Ravello. But I would do that. I've already done that kind of like, that's kind of hacky. Yeah, uh, I would what, say what maybe there? Ravello, maybe Ravello is an Italian word that means and then insult the food. Say something like like a what stale. city are you in? What city are you in? It's called B. I think it's called B Meadow or something. It's near or in East Hanover. Yeah, uh, I don't know anything I, about New Jersey geography. I got, Other than I get lost whenever. I, 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 I totally new joke. There was a rabbi. A oh, can you can you lean forward, please? There was a rabbi, a minister, and a priest. Yeah, yeah, those kind of jokes. We've discussed that. I, I can't. That whole structure, uh, I find it deeply soporific, that whole okay. setup. But, um, um, oh, I mean, you know, whenever I come to New Jersey, whenever, whenever I get, say again? Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say whenever I come to New Jersey, I get lost. And I thought that that would be solved by ways, you know. But even now, when I come to New Jersey, I get lost. You go over that Pulaski Skyway, I'm yeah. lost. I'm just always lost in Jersey. In fact, I got lost on my way to the buffet. How about no. I, I like it. How about Waves? Do you know that Waves is a is an Israeli company? Waves, yeah, yeah. That they were invented, but so maybe they they'd say uh, you're coming up on a Burger King. You don't want to eat there. Dirty toilets. Oh, I no, I like this idea actually because I have a a wandering in the desert joke that I'm going to do. I might add a Waze thing, um, or not. If there's a will, there's a Waze. Yeah. Ways. All right. All right. Well, there it is. We'll wrap it up. Dr. Hershenfeld, somebody sent in some questions yeah. with problems, and we'll get to them. I can't find it right now. So, Excellent. Ethan, I, break a leg. Thank you. Break, break more Peace. than a leg. Who, who's headline? I, I, I don't know. I might be going up last. It might be happening. I'm not sure. Uh, now, are you nervous? Do you get nervous? No. No. It's great. Uh, yeah. But um, I was telling Mark Breslin, I, I was watching a comic in San Francisco, uh, Nato Green, and I it just this, the, there was a certain the acoustics of the room. It was just so beautiful to watch. I mean, you could hear the laughs and it, it wasn't it was the right kind of invite. Oh, I miss that. I miss, you know, playing a good clean room yeah it should be fun it was such a thrill two weeks ago to get up and get laughs and be in a room so i'm looking forward to it fantastic yeah. dr philip Hershenfeld. god thank bless you so much. God, bless. god bless god bless thank you ethan you're listening to the david feldman show david feldman show.com please subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts and give us a good review i have a feeling they're going to come after us or me for uh, today's episode uh so share it with your friends when we come back we will be joined by one of my oldest friends i was watching him last night on tv emil amuck will be back with emil guillermo it's time right now for the david Feldman show he's talking politics a comedy too to tell a dirty joke if you want him to he's just a lefty from way back he's a union man with an Emmy for writing someday he's mad it's time right now for the David Feldman show he's talking politics 
a comedy too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show To get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say. Day. There was a knock at the door, it was the FBI I said, what you here for? We heard about your song, we think it's seditious I said, can we talk later, I'm doing the dishes I said, what's the problem, what's the fuss? They said, we're the FBI, don't you mess with us We can lock you up, we can put you away We can make it so you never see the light of day I said, tell me, make me do it the Feldman made me do it The Feldman made me do it And that's all there is to it Got a text this morning from a former student It said we heard you on the show You were not prudent You said the effort professor, is that true? We really expected much better from you I said the Feldman made me do it Feldman made me do it Feldman made me do it And that's all there is to it Feldman made me do it Amazon called it was customer service They said we need to cut it out You're beginning to hurt us You made fun of our boss You better stop now If you don't he'll ship you off to Minden now I said Feldman made me do it Feldman made me do it Feldman made me do it And that's all there is to it Feldman made me do it Feldman made me do it I got a letter from the lawyer from No Evil Foods It said we don't like your song or your attitude it's time now, Professor, to cease and desist. The folks I represent are really pissed. I said, Feldman made me do it. Feldman made me do it. Feldman made me do it. And that's all there is to it. Feldman made me do it. That's right. Choice. 
Welcome back. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. DavidFeldmanShow.com. Friend me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. Don't forget office hours this Friday night at 8 p.m. If you want to talk to me, and I have a feeling I'm getting some emails about uh, the first 90 minutes of the show. If you have a bone to pick with me, come to office hours this Friday night at 8 p.m. Go to DavidFeldmanShow.com. Hit attend office hours and it'll take you right there. It'll take you right to the, the link. No passwords required. We start Friday night at 8 p.m. Every Friday night at 8 p.m. It goes till about two in the morning. I, I'm there after nine o'clock. I started at eight. I'm there for the first hour where you have access to uh, tell me how much you enjoy the show <laughs> and then uh, or suggestions on uh, how to improve upon it and uh, complaints. Then after about nine o'clock, we turn it over to Lane and other people with interesting stories to tell. Joining us in California is my old friend. He's the host of the PETA podcast, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. He is also a columnist for ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Say hello to Emil Guillermo. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I am not succeeding today or in this life as a Gold, better. Goldman made you do it, I guess. Yeah. That was Professor Mike Steinel. I love I love that. I'm I'm gonna use that next time I'm up before the judge. I'm gonna use that. I was watching you. Now I don't know how many different platforms you syndicate your Emil and Muck. I watched you, I believe it was on Twitter. Yeah. Your Emil and Muck, you do uh, uh you you talk for like 90 <laughs> minutes it's great I, I i always admire people who yeah. can do like a free-form jazz riff on various topics but you you have subject matters you you were talking about a lot of things so oh, the news most it's it's most kind of a, a news meditation and your father and uh you were talking about uh i'm, I'm sorry I, i'm sleepless so you talked about the Asian American who was killed in the, what was his name? Vincent Chin, 1982. It's, it's sort of the hate crime that put Asian Americans on the map. Right. And uh, I was talking, I mean, this is what I call my micro talk show because I, I was a talk show host in San Francisco, Sacramento and Washington, D.C. And I had to talk about white stuff. I, I couldn't talk about Asian stuff unless it was like big, like like six Asian women killed in Atlanta. They would have let me talk about, you know, Asian Americans then. But so, I, you know, here I am. I'm sort of uh, I, I do these one man shows, but those are scripted. I, you know, I do some humorous things, but I'm really a broadcaster. And the thing mm -hmm. about this medium, uh, you know, the Internet, we get to I get to do what I call my micro talk show about Asian Americans, you know, where I talk about Asian Americans like, like we matter. And I talk about my, you know, I talk about the news from an Asian American lens. So the show that you heard, and I put it on uh, at Emil Amuk, which is my Twitter um, handle. And it, it, you can get it live. You can go on the page and, and just uh, play the replay. But Vincent Chin was the Asian American hate crime that put Asian Americans on the map. 1982 in Detroit. And uh, this week, or this is Life with Lisa Ling. That's the show on CNN, right? That right. premiered October 9th. And it did a whole thing on Vincent Chin. And I thought, great piece on Vincent Chin, because if people don't know, and, you know, you have a familiarity with it, but most people are in the dark. If Vincent Chin happened 39 years ago, right? So they're thinking, you know, what's the big deal? Honestly, I wouldn't know about him if you didn't talk about him on the show yeah and the thing the thing about vincent chin and this is what gets me all the time because it was 1982 that it happened and they had they had to rally the lawyers at the aclu and the national lawyers guild to 
the, a community group had to convince them that Asian Americans counted and were covered in under the civil rights laws because there was this feeling that America racially was still this binary black white thing. And, you know, to fight for the civil rights of Vincent Chin, uh, you know, it was like unheard of. And so that was one of the things that I brought out. Uh, I also like the show because the show puts into context what, uh, what being an Asian American in the heart of Motor City, right, in, in Detroit in the 80s, when the Japanese auto manufacturers were really taking over the market, the marketplace. Mm-hmm. What was it like to be an auto worker? And really one of the first times that this story has been told, it really focused on Detroit and what it was like for ordinary people. They were destitute, they were desperate, they were, you know, they were, you know, on welfare. They, they were, it, it was a, a terrible thing that made people scapegoat any kind of Asian face. And, right. and so that, that was sort of the, um, the idea behind, you know, this was a civil rights violation of Vincent Chin. Vincent Chin, who was out on his, he was, he was, at, a, he was at a strip club at, at a bachelor party. He was going to celebrate his wedding, uh, you know, the, the day before his wedding. He got into an argument with a, a, an auto worker, a guy named Ro- Ronald Evans, they took it outside. It's interesting to, uh, I, that the, the role of the decline of Detroit because of Japanese autos at the time right. played a role in this. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, Japanese. And then, then of course, you know, people usually, Asian Americans usually downplay it because Vincent Chin is Chinese, right? And he wasn't Japanese. I remember but, a got shot because he was wearing a turban after 9-11. Exactly. And we, Filipinos we after not after, we have, you know, we have, after, yeah. well, you know, all Asians get mistaken for all the other Asians. Filipinos get, you know, killed and harassed and murdered because of the, you know, China virus slur or China with the Kung flu slur. So, uh, you know, Ronald Liebens and, and Vincent Chin fight, fought outside. Uh, they went back in into the bar and then they left. Evans and Chase chases or, or tracks down uh, Vincent Chin in a McDonald's, grabs a, a Jackie Robinson baseball bat, and essentially tees off on, on Vincent Chin's head, killing him. And why, why did you have to bring Jackie Robinson into it? Well, it's just, you know, I know you mentioned it's just in the telling of the story, that was always kind of a thing about how he grabbed a bat and it was just a detail that i i remember in the telling of that story but you're right i mean i could have just told him he just took a baseball bat and clubbed vincent chin to death vincent chin actually spent a couple of days in the hospital in a coma and i've i've always looked at the days from you know the fancy pants to his being struck to his being in you know in the hospital as a kind of days of remembrance for Asian Americans to like figure out well, what's going on. Anyway, the, the, the key thing is Ronald Evans never spent a day in jail. He was uh, essentially a given probation by uh, the local courts for not even, I think it was manslaughter, but he, he got off without spending a day in court. And that's what got the community mad and they went to the feds to try to get some kind of civil rights action. And they had to convince the feds that Asian Americans counted in the civil rights equation. That, that's why Vincent Chin's important. Now, right. it, that would be good if that was it, right? But I took offense. And look, I like Lisa Ling. I think she did a good show, except for the fact that when people talk about Asian Americans being excluded, they often forget the Filipino parts. And that mm-hmm. is, they'll go back and say, okay, the discrimination of Asians starts with the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Then we have, in 1941, the, the you know, World War II and when, you know, Executive Order, Order 9066, when we interned and incarcerated the Japanese Americans. And those two facts are like these tent poles of Asian American history. And people forget that, you know, between 1882 and 1941, a lot happened. 
a lot happened, like to Indian Americans, you know, Hindu Amer- so for, so-called Hindu Americans from from uh, South Asia, and also the Filipinos, which included the Spanish American War, which is often conflated with the uh, the Philippine American War, where right. the Philippines stood up to the American colonizers and said, and they said, no, you're not going to take our country. It's U.S. imperialism. And many hundreds of thousands of it was were more Americans after yeah. the Spanish American War. Yeah, exactly. How many? Uh, well, uh, the estimates are a million civilians, uh, several hundred thousand uh, in terms of. Um, wow. Hang on for one second. You know, you're glossing over something that I. Go ahead. Uh, so the Spanish American War, we right. ended up colonizing the Philippines back in the United States. This is like 1901. Teddy Roosevelt becomes president and we think the Spanish American War is over. And Phil, the Philippines are now our colony, but the war continued. It just didn't get reported. Well, it was the Philippine American War. It morphed into the Philippine American War yeah, because the Filipinos. The we're Filipinos, about this. yeah, the Filipinos stood up and said, "We we are going to start our own country and declare independence." It was in 1898, and it was uh, the first president was Emilio Aguinaldo, and so this is a point of pride, and it's a point of all anti-imperialists everywhere. The Philippines stood up to the Americans and fought them. The Spanish American War, correct? Right. It happened after the Spanish American War. The Spanish American War technically ends in 1898 and then begins again in the, as a Philippine American war from 1898 to 1902, but it extended to about 1912. And that's when all the, the civilians. America, were what, what did, what was the role that America played in slaughtering secretly slaughtering these Filipinos? Well, it was, it wasn't uh, really secret it just was underreported it was the, by by virtue of being in war against uh, you know the filipino insurrectionists whatever you want to call them it was it in the history books it's called the filipino american war though not often not uh you know not often taught won't yeah. be taught in texas it won't well you know this isn't a you know a matter of critical race theory this is just history this is just um, but you omitted, Heroic. I know. According to Texas, you can't teach it unless it's. According to Texas, it's got to be ref- portrayed as reformist and heroic. Yeah. So, well, well, was, well, they did reform. <laughs> it was. It was kind of heroic in a sense that the Americans went in and they were going to be the imperializers. Right. And here's what they did in nineteen. They they had to, of course, sell. Uh, imperialism to the Americans and this is what Mark Twain was against this is there was a whole you know outcry in America how could a democracy be for imperialism um, you know this was the McKinley administration around that time and and you recall I've, I've often talked about how they brought Filipinos over from uh, the Philippines about 1200 1500 of them to the 1904 World's Fair in st. Louis to showcase and this gong is representative of the kind of sh- savagery of the Filipinos and their gongs and their they were headhunters for goodness sakes we must imperialize them to save them and so this is appropriate uh, stuff to talk about during October which is Filipino American yeah, History Month Filipino History Month well, yeah well it it's really Filipino American History Month and it is Filipino American history because it is you know they were involved in uh, the United States's foray into imperialism and then yeah. they brought the colonized the Filipino colonized to America in the 20s and 30s and that's when my dad came here to America and you know there's there's so much rich history that happened between 1882 and 1941 involving the Filipinos, including the very exclusion of Filipinos when Filipinos took jobs, took white women, got killed, got lynched. And uh, so they actually had a repatriation act to send the Filipinos back to the Philippines. They didn't want them here. Like what we're doing with the Haitians. 
That's exactly, your- exactly. And, you know, I'm just saying that, yeah, self-deportation uh, was around a long time or has been around a long time. Start with the Filipinos in the 1930s. And uh, then you had the whole uh, Tidings McDuffie Act in 1934. So a rich history between 1882 and 1941. And that's what Lisa Ling and This Is Life and it, with Lisa Ling on CNN. Hey, give, me that's some, what, give me some numbers here. Yeah. What percentage of Americans are Asian? Uh, there are, what, uh, 23 million Asian Americans. So I think we got like 6 7%, something like that. 6 just- to 7% of America is Asian. Yeah. yeah. How underrepresented are Asians in Hollywood, in news, in, in, oh, in the glamour I, professions? I think that, look, this is a, this is a big deal. For, for you remember me when I was at Cron in San Francisco in 1981. Tell people what Cron is. Uh, Cron was uh, the NBC affiliate at the time in San Francisco. Really a, a great award winning station, um, but it was NBC. It so because I was smoking pot at the time, but right. Well, you were there. That's when we met back in 82, 81, around there. Uh, the, the thing is, when I was there, David. Uh, you didn't see any a world-class news gathering operation. Well, yeah, I, I, I like to, I like to think that, yeah, we won a a lot of awards as as a station. It, it really set the standard, but, um, you know, that's kind of gone downhill somewhat, especially at that station. There's a different NBC affiliate. The point is when we were there, we would have seen the writing on the wall. If anybody there could write. But it was moving from, it was going into, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah, it was, yeah, television news became more of a, you know, crime, um, you know, crime reporting thing. Uh, look, you know, the, the, the thing about why I mention it is because in the 80s, it was a big deal to be a Filipino American, an Asian American reporter in one of the most Asian American cities in the country. Uh, just the other day, I saw someone make a big deal about the first Hmong American anchor. And he's a young kid who's doing the morning news in Des Moines, Iowa. And they were making a big deal of it. And I, and I applauded him. It's, it's a big deal for Asian, new Asian Americans to get into the media. Uh, because here, here, here I am, uh, you know, after Cron and I ended up at NPR. I make a big deal about being the first Asian American male or first Asian American anchor of all things considered, because, you know, subsequent to me, uh, I don't know how many there have been, maybe one. I don't know. I, I know I would have heard maybe one substitute, but I was a permanent senior host from 1989 to 1991. I made a big deal about it because it hadn't happened ever. And so representation in those glamor fields, you point out, um, it's still pretty tough. Although look, we're seeing some headway. Uh, crazy rich Asians, the the Marvel, the new, the you know, the Shang, uh, you know, the the Marvel Kung Fu movie out now. Uh, BTS is big. I mean, Asianness is around us, but there's still a long way to go for Asian American representation. Right, right. And hate crimes. What what's happening with the level of hate crimes? Well, the hate crimes are still. Uh, I mean. Vincent Chin didn't stop anything. We right. go back. The fact that we go back and have to mention it is it helps to remind us that it continues to happen. There was a, a big high profile murder case or murder in uh, New York this week. A woman fell down, hit her head. It was a perp, a homeless perp who was just trying to get away. Didn't even see uh, the, uh, the person, uh, which is kind of the way it is for, for Asian Americans. You know, we, no one sees us. We don't count. Yeah, he just ran over her. She hit her head. She died. Mm-hmm. But I think that it's um, it's indicative of the state of where Asian Americans are. And you know, Filipinos are are, are Asian Americans. People don't think that normally, but yeah, I, they they are just. I, I and I don't want to necessarily link her her death with a, a hate crime. But look, it's all it's all murder. It's not you know. There's no there's no such thing as a love crime. It's a, it's a hate crime. It's I noticed you are not- talking on your show 
uh, a lot about identity and race. Is yep. this something that you're talking about more than you've ever talked about in your life? Well, no, I, I just think it's, um, you know, that, that's a good point. I don't know if it's, I've talked about it more, but I think when you met me in 1981, 82, just imagine that was a time when Vincent Chin, Vincent Chin happened when I was there at Cron. We, you know, we were there to, together at the same time. And I did not really get it. I was just a young 23, 24-year-old kid, you know, like just happy to be at a big-time station. I, didn't, I don't think I really got it. But over time, right, 80s, the 90s, 2000s, 2010, 2020, uh, I think I have seen the urgency of speaking out, of recognizing or the importance of identity. And then when I talked to my, my old friend, Helen Zia, who was interviewed for that Lisa Ling seg segment, you know, she talked to me in 2017 and revealed that about this conflict between civil rights lawyers who didn't realize that Asian Americans mattered, that Asian Americans were part of the civil rights equation. So uh, I think that's very astute of you to say that I talk about it more now, but I talk about it more now because I don't have much time left. I've got to be more urgent of talking about it now because if people who, you know, don't talk about, I mean, the people who should talk about it are the people who have lived through those eras, you know, the eighties and nineties. And, and, you know, mind you, my father was one of the colonized Filipinos. He came from the twenties you know, in the 30s to, to America and face those, you know, the discrimination that Filipinos face then. So, you know, if if I don't talk about it, I, don't, I have a, a unique perspective that I, I think I, I have, it, it's like stories I have to talk about now. Stories I, I have to, to say now. And everything has a kind of Filipino American or an Asian American identity thing to it. Like even today's Giants Dodgers baseball game, you know, when the Giants and Dodgers are playing, when I was a little kid and the Giants came to town for the, you know, they won in 62 and they played the Yankees in the World Series. Mm -hmm. And my father, I remember transistor radios. People had the they, they he his he had a transistor radio to his ear to hear the Giants games, and it was just something that that I recognized early back then how important baseball was to Americanize all these newcomers into the country, to all these immigrants, and you know it it made it comforted my father this game baseball, and and the Giants were winners and it was his team, and I just really you know so you know baseball immigration uh and now the giants are playing the I, I just get all you know kind of all warm and fuzzy thinking about uh how important baseball has been to my life and to you know and and, and like my like my like i said my father i mean we were not that close but we were close when it came to baseball we could talk baseball and I just know that he would be excited now if he were here. Be the very last day of his life, we went to the, a baseball game, and the Giants won in the ninth inning. And then he said he declared that the Giants would go all the way. Uh, they didn't. Uh, my father didn't that night, and he died. Um, and uh, it's a subject of one of my, my uh, one-man right. plays. But that's the importance of baseball. And that's why I, I'm really excited about today's Giants-Dodgers game because the winner, I think, will go to the World Series. What's going on in baseball? I'm a, I'm so ashamed that I lack the character to enjoy baseball. But what's going on? Well, you know, they're they're playing the National League Division Series, and they've gone to a, a fifth and final game, winner take all. And then the winner of that goes to the National League Championship Series, to play the Braves, the Atlanta Braves, and the winner of that will go to the World Series to play the American League Championship winner, which could be the Astros or could be the Houston Astros or could be the Boston Red Sox. And so the Giants are playing the Dodgers. 
they go back to the New York days, you know, Brooklyn Dodgers, New York Giants out of the polo fields. Back in, in the old days in New York, you know, Willie Mays, a stickball bat and a pink Spalding, and they were throwing it, and you got to hit over some sewers, you know. I mean, that that was the real, that was, you know, there's something about, it's America, it's the game, and the stakes are so high right now if you're a Giants-Dodgers fan because they're playing in this um, very important game. So um, that's what's happening in uh, in baseball. And I uh, will probably, you know, when, I, I hope when people listen to this, uh, when, the, when the podcast drops, the, uh, the Giants are the victors. But, hey, it's, it's a game. It's, uh, there's a lot of luck involved, a lot of skill. Uh, but I'm crossing my fingers for the Giants. Right. Well, uh, you didn't. You didn't miss. You don't. You don't. I mean, the sports is important, though. Sports is important because it gives us a distraction that brings us together. And I wish it weren't a, such a super spreader event right now. But I'll be watching from my living room. Great. Well, I. How do people watch your show? Uh, they can watch it on a on amok dot com. I put up uh, the shows on. Uh, on uh, you know the the replays if they want to watch it live they can go to twitter at emil amok e-m-i-l-a-m-o-k or they can just go to uh youtube emil guillermo my fledging fledgling youtube channel um emil guillermo. great fantastic i'll talk to you next week yeah david thank you very much thank you emil guillermo you're listening to the david feldman show david feldman show.com and uh, subscribe to us wherever you get podcasts. This is an incredibly informative show, mostly because we have guests like the Reverend Barry W. Lynn, who for nearly a quarter of a century ran Americans United for separation of church and state. He is a lawyer and a minister. Hello, sir. We missed you last week. I know. And I'll tell you, Lewis Black? I told you I was going to a comedy event, all right? And I have yeah. to be brutally honest here. So we drive there so that we can get into the comedy club in Arlington, Virginia, which we go to a couple times a year, and get dinner, right? But the whole place is locked up. Try the door, try to go in the back, try to see if anybody's around. Nobody's there. Because the show, although... The venue didn't bother to tell anyone this uh, had been canceled. So it got can and who was who was Liz, the Liz Winstead. The show got canceled. Yeah, but it's not the artist's fault for not informing people. I mean, I don't slavishly follow her web. Canceled. Say something horrible. No, she she said I talked to her after. I mean days later and apparently there was some event that had been moved she told the venue the venue said okay well you don't have to be here but they didn't bother to tell those of us who had purchased tickets so we went across the street i had a cheese sandwich and watched other people wander and do the same thing joanne and i did try the doors look inside like maybe we could see some people notice that there's a a bundle of cheap newspapers sitting out there outside. That's it's terrible. It is terrible because we didn't get you. I know. Well, so instead of doing my show, you spent quality time with your <laughs> wife. Right. Eating a cheese sandwich. How healthy is it to eat a cheese sandwich? I don't by that point, I didn't care. Okay. Whether it was healthy or not. I just wanted to eat something okay, and, and figure out how to get in touch with Liz. What about Lewis Black? Did you go see him? Yes, I did. The, the new show, if you're lucky enough to be in a, a place where he's going to be performing his new show, is really quite spectacular. And um, that's up in Frederick, Maryland. And he was, um, you know, he's got a, a mom who's 100 and two years old right right and father he lost his father he did he did there's a wonderful at the national comedy center there's a wonderful uh uh kind of 
small plaque and monument to his uh, to his dad. Is this in Jamestown, New York? Jamesville, New York. Yep. Jamesville or James? I think it's Jamesville, actually. Lucille. It's where Lucille Ball was um, grew up. Right. I think Who? it's Jamesville. Okay. And you've been there. I have. It's really a. There are two museums that I think they're wildly different, but they really do a perfect job of taking a relatively discreet issue or subject and do it well. And the National Comedy Center really, really does it well. And the other is the uh, Hiroshi Museum, which we saw about five years ago in Japan. I mean, these are the, the, the thing about the Hiroshima Museum is that the whole last third of it is devoted well, where's to activism. the Hiroshima Museum? That would be Hiroshima. Oh, okay. In Japan. Anyway, but they, but they get you engaged. In other words, you go and you see all this stuff. They actually have some of the um, some of the walls where the shadow people. You know, this is a, um, the intensity of the blast was so great that there were uh, images of human beings literally kind of baked into the walls, and they have some of those there, and it's just marvelously done. But the last part of the museum, they want you to become an activist. You sign petitions, you write things, you learn more about how to deal with uh, nuclear weapons and how to get rid of them. So it's, it's quite a commendable thing. And, uh, right, yeah. right. Yep. Did you see Lewis? Yes, I did. Did you make sure not to give him my regards? I, I remember not to give him your Thank regards. You. I did give Liz just uh, yesterday in a note to her, because we're working on a little project, and I, uh, I said, David Feldman says hello. So I did what you said with her. Good, but yeah. don't, um, maybe with if Lewis, I- I'm not gonna say anything. With, maybe if I have a feud, <laughs> Lewis will come back on. So yeah. it's yeah. been a week. Yep. What have you, well, let me, before we, so what, going out in public, have you had your booster shot yet? No, because we're not eligible until, you know, we've had Moderna, we want to get it. And uh, presumably within a, a week, they will approve it. There's a kind of temporary approval of it just today. And then we'll get it. And it, it, it's important to get it. And, you mind uh, if I ask you about your wife for a second? Because oh, go ahead. To our new listeners, we have some new listeners. Yep. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn is married to a brilliant doctor who came to office hours. I would say when the virus was just arriving True. here in America, being processed at Ellis Island given a new last name. We gave it COVID-19, kind of anglicized that name. And uh, and your wife told the truth about what we were in. Like, it was one of the, it was at a time when everybody was giving us uh, meat and potato answers that were satisfying. Oh, okay. We're looking at a, maybe a, a bad spring and your wife said this is what's what it's going to be like for the next couple of years and she turned out to be very pressing i had another friend my friend who i grew up with as a doctor and he texted me i, I kept it and he said right when it hit he said this will be that will, you will look back at your life as before and after COVID. This is yeah. not, this is, they really knew what we were, the medical, Fauci knew, what, everybody knew what we were sure. in, in store for. So it lived up to expectations. Yeah, it certainly did. What I think, what I think she would not have predicted, um, is how much vaccine opposition there would be. I mean, the, two days ago I was so mad, uh, just about some story about people, the the people who 
whose child dies, and then they go, well, I didn't think it was that significant. Now my kid is dead, and I want to tell people get vaccinated. I mean, although there's a certain nobility in that, um, it's just, it's so horrible. I mean, you know, it's, it's just, if it takes that, if it takes the death of someone in your immediate family to get you to go, maybe I should think about this, then there's something wrong with the way you were brought up to think. And, mm. you know, today, Joe Rogan had uh, um, Sanjay Gupta from CNN on for three hours attempting to, he was trying to explain why he's not really anti-vax, although he clearly is. And uh, Sanjay was on for three hours and afterwards Who said- anti-vax? Rogan. Oh, Rogan was arguing with Sanjay. Yeah, but in, in the, 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 the kind of Rogan-esque manner where he doesn't- Why doesn't Sanjay know his place? He's just a doctor. I know, yeah. Joe Rogan no, no. is a mixed martial art commentator. Why would Sanjay yeah, Gupta yeah. argue with Joe Rogan about COVID? I have COVID? no idea. You know, it's just, it's the so same thing. I used Joe to Rogan say he. he I, that, I, well, I didn't watch it. I right. only watched Sanjay Gupta being interviewed afterwards, where he said he really thought there might be a chance to change his mind, but clearly nothing changed. And it's the persistence of this stupid stuff that is very hard for me to understand. I well, mean, it's one thing. He's selling supplements, Joe Rogan. Yeah. And so he, he wants to boost your immunity, not yeah. a vaccine. I'm being serious. I mean, they, yeah. Alex yeah. Jones sells supplements. This is what, what it's, it's about. But go ahead. I didn't know that he's done, that Rogan is still, I, I, I took a, you know, I, I, I was, reading about what he was saying i just couldn't i, I it, it's it, after a while it just gets so jejune. now i want to punch um, hang on how do i punch myself for saying jejun i have no idea let me just don't punch me because i have no idea what that means jejun i have no, i don't know what that means either do i either does anybody <laughs> yeah well that's why you know, yeah, it's like prosaic. Yeah, you know, I know what that means. Yeah, but but it's this. Nothing has changed. Everybody. The the latest thing, and this Rogan does too. He says he criticizes CNN apparently today for for saying that he was promoting the horse the dewormer, and uh, he said, "Well, I, I just took it along with other things." And now people, including Tucker Carlson who obviously is vaccinated, no matter whether he says it or not. And he says, I'm not anti-vax. It's like, I'm not anti-vax. It's like people go, I I'm not a racist. I just use the N word to make a point. You know, it's like any kind of phony excuse. Yes. And that's what they do. And this is now the principal way in which people talk. In I'm Virginia- Some what? of my best friends are racists. How could I be a racist? Yeah. My best so friend. We're, so there, yeah, I used to live in Virginia, and uh, now, of course, it's a relatively blue place. But uh, currently, there's a big fuss in Virginia over the governor's race, which occurs in about two and a half weeks between Terry McAuliffe, of course, worked with the Clinton administration and was the governor of Virginia for a while, and a, and a, a character named Youngkin, Glenn Youngkin. And, Hedge, right? What? Wasn't he like a Blackstone hedge fund manager? Yes, he was. And he probably mopped up at least a million dollars with a couple of his transactions. But here's right. what happened. There was a debate about a week ago, on, and it focused primarily on uh, educational policy. And McAuliffe, who I think should have known better, just did some sound bites about how he wasn't going to let parents control the curriculum in Virginia schools. So now Youngkin's out with a very effective ad, and it's, it's closing. The race is getting very close now, where he says, um, Terry McAuliffe doesn't want you as parents to have any input into the education of your children. 
And it is effect. Lying is very effective. When people say, oh, well, look, that's a terrible lie. It doesn't matter if you repeat a lie long enough and often enough, people start to believe it's obviously true. And I think that's what's happening in Virginia. I, I still- Why should parents have any input on their child's education? Who cares? Home, if, if you want to have input, homeschool your kid. Otherwise, keep your mouth shut. Yeah, right? it's, um, yes. And, and he did, I think this was in the context of some discussion about critical race theory, which I'm sure Yanka knows nothing about, but he certainly didn't want it in Virginia schools. But Yunkin does a couple of other things. He, he missed, he didn't fill out the questionnaire for the National Rifle Association endorsement. So naturally I saw that. So I called the uh, Yunkin campaign and I said, I said, I'm very interested in the Second Amendment. I wondered why the National Rifle Association has not endorsed our guy. And they, they had no real answer about it. They just said, well, you know, there's a, there was a, it was an issue of timing. And the other thing he doesn't want to talk about is abortion. He's against abortion. He would be happy to see the, um, he, he doesn't care what happens to Roe versus Wade. He doesn't want to change any laws in Virginia to make it feasible to uh, Roe is overturned to do something in Virginia that would appear to be a decent thing for uh, women's rights. But he doesn't talk about it except on a right wing talk radio, which is, of which there is a huge amount, of course, in the state of Virginia. By the way, I owe an apology to people in the Zoom room. It says October 13th. It's October 14th. I. Yeah, I was wondering when you were going to apologize. I thought, could you just apologize also to me directly and then write apologize. a note to Emil and say, because it was up then too. Yeah, it, it's How been. How did that happen? Well, I, happen? You, remember, you know what? I have a calendar. No, I wanted to give everybody an extra day. <laughs> I figured you'd all been good. Why not make it October 13th instead of 14th? Well, let's be a, a day younger. I apologize. Critical race theory, they manufacture nonsense, so we debate anything but what's really important, yep. you know, like the infrastructure bill or yeah. climate change. Let's, let's argue about something that in the end, the teachers are going to teach what they're going to teach. Nobody's going to get fired. A couple of teachers are going to get fired, maybe for saying Robert E. Lee was a brutal slave owner. Yeah. I doubt it. I doubt that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they are taking over the schools, but yeah. they, they are taking over the schools. They are talking of a civil war. How do you do that? How do, how do we fight a civil war in this country that's not geographic well it's, it actually it is mainly geographic i mean if you were to do what a, a substantial number of democrats want which is to separate the country into two countries and and there, there's been a lot of serious writing about this like what do you do about people who want to move but don't have the money to move and how do you subsidize their property transfers so it's not a crazy idea but you know, you look to the uh, upper Midwest, to the Dakotas, to Montana, and there are plenty of good liberal people up there. But uh, it's it's a hopeless to try to go back 20 years and start electing Democrats in North Dakota. It's just not going to happen. And the South, the whole South, with the possible exception of Texas and Georgia, but, and Georgia. But you know, even Georgia. One of the things that happened in the last couple of days, of course, is that uh, Donald Trump issued a statement that the most important thing that Republicans could be doing now is to guarantee that people understand that his election was stolen. And right. then he said, he said in another sentence of the same statement, uh, if they don't get this right, they being Republican, Republicans should not vote in 2022 or 20. They shouldn't vote. That's what so happened kind of, in Georgia. 
the, that's how he kind of lost Georgia for well, that's how we ended up with Warnick and Ossoff. I think so. He did say that, but it was not quite as stark as this. And I, I have not seen what I'd consider reliable evidence that it made that much of a difference in Georgia. I just think those two candidates were so flawed and so crooked that people said, let's give let's give these Democrats who appear to be decent people a chance. But I maybe maybe there is data. But I, I know anecdotally, there are plenty of people who say, oh, yeah, well, Trump said it's not going to be fair, so I didn't vote. But I haven't seen data. I haven't seen surveys that back up that. I was thinking about that, too, this afternoon. Yeah. I don't know. If he encourages people not to vote, would somebody like me or you, we fly under the radar, would it... Would it be wrong to just say, yes, we're fixing this election and we're going to change it? No, don't bother to vote because we have satellites in space from the Rothschilds <laughs> that, and, and, and thermostats. That, the other thing is thermostats are manipulating the vote. Whether you vote or not, we're going to manipulate it so your vote doesn't count. Why not convince the Republicans? of that is that wrong no it's it's a brilliant it's a brilliant strategy I'm not sure that it would work but it but in other words yeah. stay home on election day yeah your vote doesn't matter Republican. that's correct because we have it under control we, we have it under progressives control. we have it under control we're going to take over that's it's I mean, I love your strategy about maybe what Democrats ought to be doing is uh, actually going out, working with community groups, saying we're here, not just in a month before the election, but we're here to help you. We want to help you eat. We want to well, help you get Henry housing. Huckamaki. Henry Huckamaki, uh suggested that. Yeah, well, it's a good idea. But this is also a good idea. I think the first one might work better, but... Uh, if there were, you know, I don't really care much about the Republicans who say that they're different now, Kitzinger, Lynn Cheney, uh, John Walsh, is that his name? The guy who ran temporarily against, uh, briefly against Trump, and who's now oh, yeah. a darling of CNN. I mean, yeah. every, he's on every other day. And um I don't care. He's still a Republican. He hasn't completely repudiated it. I want Lynn Cheney to say, you know, I've thought about it. I'm pro-choice when it comes to abortion. Mm -hmm. I would like to see her say, you know, a 20 percent cut in the defense budget would really make sense. Instead, of course, everybody. Uh, we don't have a war in Afghanistan, which, which is, I think, the only war we were fighting, but we still in, in the budget resolutions, there's something like a $30 million increase in the defense budget while we don't have any wars going on. When I really knew a lot about defense policy, you had to talk about what was called a two and a half war strategy, that you'd have to fight a war in Europe because there was still, you still had the Soviet Union, and another major war somewhere else, and then a half war, a small, kind of regional war somewhere, perhaps in Africa. Mm -hmm. that, you know, that was an absurd argument. Jimmy Carter even bought into that and did a lot of things in the military arena that he shouldn't have done. But if you look at this stuff uh, rationally and you say, what are we possibly doing? Why are we spending this money? And I think that the, the, the so-called progressives in the Senate, not just... I mean, Elizabeth Warren and others said, well, you know, we shouldn't increase the defense budget much, but she was talking incrementally. There is absolutely, positively, no reason to believe we couldn't cut without any danger to the United States or its actual allies, 20% of the budget. And if we did that, we'd have more money to deal with the Green New Deal, to deal with Medicare for all, to deal with all of the things that are in the so-called build back better plan that's now costing three and a half trillion dollars over 10 years. Right. 
where are we with Build Back Better today? Do you like well, loading? There is this compromise of making it five years instead of 10 years. The idea being that once you, the idea of front loading, you bring the, the price down, you sp instead of spending 3.5 trillion over 10 years, maybe you spend 2 trillion in five years. Yep. Same number of programs, but there's a sunset on them, assuming we don't have Democrats in the majority right. of five years who will renew these programs. Well, the only way to get that majority in five years is to front load and sure. show, the voters some, show voters some results that they can, that are tangible. And go, hey, you know, I'm doing, I, I, I'm even, you know, I may be a conservative, but I gotta say, these programs work, let's vote for more Democrats, and then in five years you renew it. Yeah, like I think that's the like, ban which expired because we didn't have enough Democrats. Yeah. Yeah, but I do. I think this is the only answer. I mean, I think the answer to what do you do is to demonstrate that these programs is you, you create them in the beginning and then you assume not just whether there's a sunset provision or not. Maybe that would be forced. Maybe that's a cinema and those other creeps want. But it's it's the same thing. People did not fully embrace Social Security when it was proposed. Now everybody likes social security. Well, the affordable. Well, <laughs> um, not the Repu if, but if you get a couple of drinks in a yeah. Republican after he makes a pass at you because they're all gay, then uh, he'll tell you <laughs> social security. Yeah, but then the, uh, aside from the Republican leadership and the Republican politicians. Um, people embrace it. I mean, remember during the time when the Tea Party was starting, there were people with signs up when they were talking about expansion, Medicare, Affordable Care Act, hands off my Social Security. They didn't even know Social Security was a federally subsidized program. Mm -hmm. That's how stupid they were. Yes. And, and, but I, and this, so I think whether you're talking about Social Security, these programs, think of these programs. First of all, they ought to spend- In their defense about that, hold your thought oh, for me. Okay. In their defense, some of them knew that Social Security was federal. They, they, were, they were just worried that, that Obamacare would take money away from Social Security. I'm seeing this now with Medicare Advantage, where people are saying, hands off my Medicare Advantage. <laughs> Even though we we know that Medicare Advantage is bad, right? Yeah, it's a, well, it's largely useless, and that people should. I don't know enough about this. No, but, I mean, I think I mean if you can afford to get it, um, it's probably useful. I mean, I have it. Um, okay, I Ralph Nader, and I don't. I my impression. I'm not speaking. Is that I will. This is worth talking about, that Medicare Advantage is not good, that it's a ripoff. Well, That's maybe a rip. Well, yeah, but let's not get lost in Medicare Advantage. Yeah, Medicare you're... used to have a, not, a, a whole other program that was only in some of the Kaiser Permanente plan. I'm in Kaiser Permanente. It was in some, including here in the mid-Atlantic states for a brief period of time, and it did allow greater use of non-Kaiser sources. So when I got really sick and nearly died in Western Pennsylvania, there was no Kaiser, but I had this form of Medicare that was so good that it allowed them, it took three days to get this understood by the people in this little hospital. But you can, you could go somewhere. You, I went to the Cleveland Clinic, which is like a three hour, that's a great drive. Plan. It is a great one. And uh, I mean, if you got, it's probably it's gotta be great. <laughs> the only reason to go to that's not true. I, 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 I love Cleveland. Well, you, you, you could go to the Rock and Roll Museum, which yeah. is almost as good as spending three weeks uh, on your back in the Cleveland Clinic. But the, the um, 
So there was within that program something but my aforementioned wife who knows a heck of a lot about Medicare. I mean, she, it took her three days to talk with people both at the Cleveland Clinic and at this rural hospital in Western Pennsylvania, what the hell the program even was so that they knew what to do and why it was okay for them to, without reimbursement, drive me to Pittsburgh or Cleveland. But the, my, the point I was trying to make though, if you add dental and glasses and hearing aids to Medicare, which Bernie says, absolutely will not support anything that doesn't do that. If you do that, people are going to be amazed at how hearing aids can cost a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a piece. If you need them in two ears, that's three thousand dollars. That's an enormous amount of money. And glasses, dental stuff, elderly people, people of my generation, uh, I routinely would find that they had terrible dental care because they couldn't afford it. When I, when I was in graduate school, and we were living in a little apartment in South Boston while I taught school there. And the dentist I went to, he'd, he'd examine me and then he'd go, they got a couple of cavities, but if you brush your teeth better, they won't get any bigger and then you won't have to pay me to fix it. That was literally what he said. And for a guy who's you know, trying to uh, participate in medical experiments to raise money to buy a camera, that was, a, that was just the kind of message I wanted. I don't wanna spend money with you. I don't want you to do anything. I want you to tell me, brush your teeth better and you'll be all right. And that was of course, terrible advice, but lots of people get it. You know, right. our uh, Paul Krasner, the satirist and yeah. editor of The Realist Magazine, I, I first met him with anti-war stuff, and I used to talk to him every couple of months. And and he one day he said, I, my teeth are falling out. This is about a year before he died. He just died last year. And he said, I just, I there's no money. I don't have any money to take care of them. If you yeah. fixed dental, if you fixed eyesight, if you fixed hearing within Medicare, people would go, that's a great idea. Why didn't we think of that first? And the but, same thing with child care. Child care. Go ahead. The ADA, four out of five dentists do not recommend Medicare expansion into dental because? Because it, the prices will be set in such a way that they will not be able to gouge you the next time you go to the dentist. It's very simple. And they're you and drilling, I both know the drilling, answer. They're drilling for something. <laughs> for them. Oil. I have to go to the dentist tomorrow. It I costs three hundred thousand dollars, either a year or for four years, to get through dental school. I hope it's four years. I hope it's how long is dental school? Three years? Two? I think I was thinking it's two years. But what do we, we what do we go to dental school? Anyway, if you graduate from dental school or medical school, you are so broke, you're in debt. You're bankrupt. Yeah, absolutely. Our doctors start their careers bankrupt. <laughs> and, and so yeah. in order to no longer be financially bankrupt, they must become morally bankrupt. And all the reasons they went to medical school go out the window because we, you know, we have, in New York City, we have doctors who don't have health care, don't have health insurance. Really? Self-care has a whole new meaning when you're a doctor taking care of yourself. At what point, Reverend, does the religious community have to start scolding being scolds. Why aren't, why, you know, Reverend Barber, you, no. uh, you know, they have no problem scolding us for masturbating or being gay, but 
denying health care coverage for mammon that that nobody's scolding no us. no there ought to be an enormous amount of that i mean the denomination of which i am a part the united church of christ i mean they have had these progressive views about health care and foreign policy for decades and decades but and some presbyterians do and some methodists do but they're all having internecine warfare so that there are always within these even progressive Protestantism, there are cabals of people who are interested in derailing good social policies and really scare some of these local pastors who would like to be more progressive and like to talk more articulately about what needs to be done and what should be stopped. They're afraid they're gonna have people in the pews who won't give them the yearly contribution, or that they'll try to get them fired. All of these things do happen. And of course, it's, you know, there are not a lot of uh, wealthy local pastors. Yeah, I had a like rabbi, that. a piece of shit rabbi. Uh, I, I sent my kids to a bar mitzvah mill. That, you know, it's just like, you yeah. know, just enough so they can get through the bar mitzvah. And, uh, and the rabbi was a piece of shit, and he was always wondering why he couldn't draw a bigger crowd. I said to him once, I said, you piece of shit, rabbi. That's one of the great things about being Jewish. <laughs> you can say that. You can call a rabbi a piece of shit. Uh, it's probably one of the only good things about being Jewish. <laughs> now, now. Uh, well, that's why you're forming your own church. I understand. Nobody's calling me a piece of shit in my church. <laughs> I run my, I run a tight church here. So I said to him, you know, uh, your sermons. He goes, well, what did you think of the joke I opened with? I go, I don't care about your jokes. You're talking nonsense. Was, I said, there's a war, an illegal war going on. Why aren't you speaking out against this? Get, you know, gay marriage is on the ballot. Why aren't you speaking? He says, I can't do that. that that's not the, 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 uh, uh, the per, you know, I have d people of different political stripes. Yeah, yeah. I said, why don't you sort them out? I need, <laughs> I need you know, and I go, what? you have to take a stand. You're, you're boring. I could get all this shit from Dr. Phil. They don't want to take a stand. They do not want to. They did in the 60s. Some. Some did because yep. of Dr. King. It was yep. pretty hard not to. But now it's, uh, you know, I don't want to piss off. The, the, we have a building fund. Yep. They Why do. do you have a building fund? What do you need to build? This place is empty. What do you need to build? It's empty. Bigger house. Um, Bigger. <laughs> Believe me, they're not going to come because this is it, it, you build a nicer temple. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so Joanne and I were at a. Uh, there's a marvelous place. The next time you come to Washington, uh, I'll you take to you go to Mark Savasco out yeah. to to Zebert's. And I want to tell you where we're taking you. There's a marvelous I'm place. What? But the marvelous place called Glen Stone. Glen Stone. It's a 70 acres of artwork and nature. It's it's absolutely beautiful. I only just we discovered it a month ago. We've been back the second time. It's, Where's the food? Words, it's north of Potomac, Maryland. So it's about where do you eat? Well, we can find a place. It'll be better oh. than Duke Zebert's. It, it, trust me, it'll that be better. I've even opened Duke Siebert's. I've eaten there. I think I've I eaten there. Larry King was always getting free meals there. He would promote yeah. Duke. I know, but um, well, he, he had he had more free meals there than he had wives. That's that's um, saying a lot. It is saying a lot. But anyway, the, so did the marvelous things, including there's a 28 minute sound art exhibit where you go in to the woods, deep into the woods, you sit on a stump 
and listen to 28 minutes of sounds that are broadcast from about 15 speakers around you in giant circles. Some of them are nature sounds, some of them are war sounds, some of them are uh, mechanical war sound? sounds. But war, you said war sounds? Yeah, you know, like a fighter dropping bombs, things like that. And you sit there and you, it's mesmerizing. And it's, it's, it's an exhibit called Forest. Forest. And they have other wonderful, they have African American. Uh, a quilter and artist from the Harlem Renaissance who died a few years ago. They have an exhibit of hers. I mean, these, these, it's just an extraordinarily beautiful place. Well, what, is, what is the doctor's opinion about going out and being around people? What is... Well, we, we do. We do, but we, uh, we don't do it very often. I mean, if you're going to go out to dinner, we want a place outside. It doesn't make it sit completely safe right but and we've been to a couple of inside movies but most of the time if i go to the movies i go to the american film institute which is you know a mile or two from our house and um i'm often the only person there i mean literally the only person there. you wear a mask in the theater they want you to and if if i'm not the only person there i i do wear it but usually i'm just I mean, I just went to the American Film Institute two days ago to see a movie called Lamb, L-A-M-B, which is a, a hauntingly beautiful film. The crappy movies that then will be empty and you don't have to wear a mask. <laughs> Hollywood should make crap. They're already making crappy movies, yeah. but the crappier, the, you know, it's safer. <laughs> That's was, that was my theory when I retired and I just could go to movies in the in the afternoons and I could buy those passes for AMC, which I now hate and Regal cinemas for 20 bucks. Uh, you see as many movies as you could possibly sit through. And I always made, I made out like a bandit. And I, I talked to the manager of one of the theater, yeah. one of the Regal theaters. And Who are you making he out? Said, what? Who are you making out with? He said to slow the show down and lose <laughs> listeners. <laughs> But um, he said, well, at least you come in here and you buy popcorn. I said, I'd like to be honest. I have to be honest. I don't ever buy popcorn. Oh, he said, I'll come back anyway. What do you do, bring a broom and just... <laughs> Pick up the stuff from the, previous, yeah. <laughs> from the previous screening where there was no one, so there's nothing on the floor. Right. But I moved <laughs> back to New York. I don't know, 2013, 2014. And I went to my first movie in New York and I bought popcorn in New York yeah. at an AMC in New York, in Manhattan. Yeah. I get, I give, you know, put my credit card, I see how much it costs. <laughs> I literally went, wow, how do you get away? I was in awe. I go, you can, you can do this? You yeah. can really charge? That's incredible. Like I wasn't, you know, it was just, I was awe-inspired. So what, what do you think we're looking at in terms of the infrastructure bill? Will, will we have anything by Christmas? Well, I think if we don't have something by Christmas, we won't have anything. Uh, I think that this idea of the five-year uh, start the programs, hope that people become like them so much. I mean, who doesn't want daycare? Who doesn't know that you're going to need to take care of your aging relatives at some point, and there's no program to do that? A lot of people believe that Medicare now pays for uh, all your time in a nursing home, and it, it doesn't. It doesn't pay for any of that. So there, if there's a way in this bill, nobody even knows what's, of course, in the bill. Every if you ask somebody what's in this bill, they go. The, Child credit, uh, daycare, elder care, climate, that's all they tell you. And of course, the media is so terrible that they don't spend any time. Uh, um, I think one of the members of the, of the squad was on CNN yesterday going like, why don't you just spend an hour just looking at all of the components that we know are in there? There was a, a, a CBS polling did a a poll and found out that although most people really like 
the Build Back Better plan, only 10% of the people who like it have any idea what's in it. And the people who don't like it, it's even lower. But right. the fault is not with people not being smart enough. It's that there's no opportunity to have any discussion. So last night on CNN, I was, uh, was watching Don Lemon. And Don Lemon is talking with the same people he talks to every night about... What? It's comforting. I couldn't hear you. It's You're like my show. It's very comforting to have the same people. Yeah. On. I'm comforted. You're very. It's very comforting. <laughs> it is, but yeah. um, and then and then they, you know, they're still looking for uh, the missing blonde woman who was strangled and whose uh, boyfriend is on the lam. And they talk about this, but nobody has any new information. They just repeat the old information, and they say, which is comforting. That's comforting. It is, it's comforting, but it's no not, new inf- It's not breaking educational. News. No breaking news. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. I'd love to see that someday. I'd love to see that. I, I was on one of the last crossfires after uh, John Stewart went on and just you know destroyed. Uh, uh, I think Bagala and, and Tucker Carlson were the, the mm-hmm. hosts that day. And, and I was on a couple of days later and I, I had this, this stuffed animal. And I said to the producer who I had known for a long time, I said, I want to take this on the set, but I don't want to be insulting. And I don't want to be ridiculous. And she said, who cares? We're already being taken off the air because she knew, as most people suspected, that that show was never going to survive Jon Stewart's attack on the hosts. And so oh, you can do these things. Uh, we have breaking news. What is it? We have breaking news. Breaking news coming. Okay. Hang on. Uh, breaking news. And that is Crossfire should have stayed on the air. Jon Stewart was wrong about Crossfire. We talked about this with Ben Burgess last week that during the war, the only argument you could hear against the war was on Crossfire. And Jon Stewart once again gets it wrong. No. Well, maybe he does, but. I'll t- you know, I know Paul Begala pretty well. I just am, frankly, I'm bored listening to him. And right. he's not a real progressive. I mean, he's he has to talk about how important it is to have guns. And, and what I liked was uh, when Sean Hannity had a co-host, Alan Combs, because Alan was a real progressive. And, yes. uh, and he was one of the people. Hmm? But he was weak. Uh, well, he might have been weak, but he... he uh, he was, when Clinton wanted to go to war, um, went to war, he, he criticized Clinton for doing that. That was about the same time that uh, MSNBC was thinking of doing a similar to Crossfire show, and they wanted Ollie North to, to be the right winger. And then they tried a, a couple of us out, and uh, one of the vice presidents of M- MSNBC of NBC called me and said, hey, Barry, we, you know, we really like the way you interact with Ollie, but we do have one thing, and I, so I think I know the answer to this, but it's really important, so think about it. Will you support the Clinton administration every night you're on the air? And I what? said, of course not. And he said, well, he said, that's what I thought, but then we're not going to hire you. Wow. Because the, the crossfire was almost as bad in that it assumed that there were Democrats and Republicans. There were nobody else, nobody else. And although you're right that there was a lot of anti-war commentary, much more than there was on MSNBC, um, but I still think Stewart was making the right point. I mean, he, he didn't want to, I think he said on that show, I don't want to be your trained monkey. I'm not going to just be funny because you. I'm here because you guys are not then don't do the show. I mean, he killed the only show that was other other than the show I was working on that was attacking the war in Iraq. But we have late breaking news. This okay. is just coming in. Hang on. Okay. Hang on. I can hardly wait. This is just coming into our newsroom. CNN 
can now report that there is absolutely no news about Build Back Better. Nothing, nothing has changed. It's um, yeah. this this breaking news thing. I mean, it's it's so appalling. It's it's beyond appalling. It, what? It, I mean, it's it is so damn. It's it's like the crawls that come on on CNN when uh, when uh, Sarah Palin was running for, to be vice president, and she kept talking about the death panels. That completely erroneous argument was in the crawl for almost two full days. Palin says death panels to come with expanded health care. Right. That is irresponsible. Just, just the fact that uh, within the last day, CNN had an interview with uh, Justice Breyer of the United States Supreme Court. He said ridiculous things. Nobody challenged him. Um, he just got away with acting like there's something sacred about the Supreme Court and even kind of said, and I'm so important a part of it. The guy's in his early 80s. Yes. He is not essential. It is essential that he quit now that because in a scenario which is quite likely of some Democrat dying in the Senate in a state where their governor is a Republican, and the Republican will then replace that person with a Republican senator. Then Schumer is no longer the majority leader, and all hope of doing anything is gone. And, and Breyer, uh, he's, he's been the fine justice it's now time for him to leave. I was very reticent when Ruth Bader Ginsburg, because she was such a powerful figure, um, when people said she should have quit, I was ambiguous about that, but she should have, and, and Breyer should go. There's absolutely no reason for him to hang around. He will be a, a reliable vote against open carry of handguns in New York City. He will be a reliable person defending Roe versus Wade. He will be a couple of big church state cases. He will, will be the, on the right side, the correct side. But so will a lot of other people who are 40 and not 80. Could you imagine after the midterms, if McConnell is the majority leader, his approving anybody, we would have eight Supreme Court justices he would not approve anybody, correct? Um, yeah, if he's the majority leader, he's not going to appoint anybody to the Supreme Court because nobody that Biden would appoint or would want to see there would be acceptable to McConnell. Right. Yeah, so, but, you know, and... And, or, this and, and if it were the other way around, if Trump were president right now, I would expect the same from Schumer if he were the majority leader, right? We don't need no. we don't need nine Supreme Court justices. Well, we don't. I mean, I used to say that. I used to give speeches when there was that period and when the question was, really, I forget who was the nominee, uh, and said it, there was an old TV show, Eight is Enough. I said mm -hmm. that applies to the Supreme Court also. And right. um, yeah, but, but it, it, it would be catastrophic for the scenario that I just outlined where he would be the majority. And then you'd have to worry about what is cinema and mansion gonna do? Are they gonna say, well, this guy's a conservative, but he's not that bad or she's not that bad and give him an, a vote? I mean, I don't know, but 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 he should definitely he he should just go. I mean, look at the stuff he says. He he's talking about this institution of the Supreme Court, which I I never revered it, but I liked it. Now I don't even like it. I mean, I just I don't think it it's so ideologically driven. And 
Breyer admits that it's, there's a certain ideology, but he says it's all a matter of jurisprudence, of jurisprudential vision that some of the justices who appear to be more conservative have. That that's because it's a bogus way to understand the United States Constitution. It's, it's, it's so predictable. Does anybody, did anybody seriously think that Amy Coney Barrett was going to all of a sudden become a pro-choice uh, a kind of Barry Lynn understanding of separation of church and state person? Of course not. She's done not a single thing that is surprising to anyone who bothered to read anything about her background, any of her old decisions when she was on the circuit court. And these, it, it is just to hear Breyer excuse the misconduct of the court and the stupid decisions that it makes um, in the same, using the same fundamental arguments that Clarence Thomas has used, that Samuel Alito has used, is just disgusting, frankly. It, it, it's as bad as him staying on the bench. He should leave the bench and he should acknowledge that this is a corrupted system. So all of the discussions that are being held here in Washington in the last 24 hours about what do we do about Steve Bannon? What do we do about the uh, House Committee on the January 6th? I mean, what, what do we, how do we do this? How do we, and you would listen. I, I'm not an expert on everything about criminal procedure, but some of this stuff is just stupid. For example, when they say, we should arrest Steve Bannon right away. There's no way to arrest Steve Bannon. There is this obscure idea that the, um, that the House has a kind of inherent ability to... Not to uh, before the... Uh, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's not. It, there's no easy way to do that. They're going to... Whatever they do, and if Merrick Garland, who's been a disappointment, I think, to every progressive serving as attorney general... If he, uh, if he starts this criminal contempt procedure, it, it will be challenged. Uh, it will be dragged out in courts. The courts having, I've already established, are totally corrupt. All these goofy systems and understandings, what is executive privilege? It doesn't cover Steve Bannon. He wasn't even in office working with the president. He has no right to claim it. And Trump doesn't have any rights to claim it on his behalf. Where's Merrick, look, where's Merrick I mean, Garland on this? Well, I mean, I, the assumption is that he will say, well, it's rarely used, but uh, criminal contempt, there is a statute. We're going to try to enforce it. It first goes to the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, of course, who will consult with Merrick Garland. And the statute actually says you have to take this to a grand jury. So they have to take it. But that's a long way from saying, and we have to take this as far as it can go, and we have to litigate this forever. It, because Merrick Garland, I don't think, has the stomach to do that. This is, it, it's rare, but I don't like the rosy picture that people paint of how easy it's going to be. We can finally get to the bottom of January 6th. We can finally figure out what role Steve Bannon really played. It really is the, the job of the Justice Department to, to tell us, especially since they were witnesses, yeah. right? Yeah. If, if, what we're learning is that Trump was calling over to the Justice Department, asking them to commit crimes. How hard is it for them to prosecute when they were witnesses to the crime being committed? Well, it's easy to start the prosecution, but remember, you have to do more than start it. You have to follow it up. You have to win it. Uh, one of the arguments, the other argument I was hearing this afternoon is, well, what about Susan McDougal? Remember, Susan and Jim McDougal were involved in the so-called Whitewater scandal in the Clinton years, and she was held in contempt, and, and she ended up going to jail. But the difference between she and Bannon is this. She had agreed uh, to provide this evidence, uh, to provide answers uh, as a way to, um, 
Yeah. Let me ask you before you go. Yeah. Let me just finish this one point. I want to ask you a question. Susan McDougall got immunity from prosecution, and therefore she had to testify. And she said, I'm not going to testify. And they said, you have to. And she said, send me to jail. Steve Bannon is never going to be in that position. He's never going to say, hey, give me immunity, and then I'll testify. He will fight that. If you're There's pardoned, no way to put him in jail. If you're pardoned, don't you then have to testify? You can't plead but, the fifth? No. No, it depends what you're pardoned for, but he was not, I don't think he was pardoned for every possible offense. Pardoned for the fake wall charity. The fake wall charity is the only thing he was pardoned for, as I recall. So no, he doesn't have any, he doesn't have any way to get out of this. You have to wrap it up. The professors and Marianne are up. Okay. Next. I have a, a proposal. Yeah. If hypothetically speaking, there was a lawyer who went public about having an affair with Kenneth Starr. You, you, you've heard that story, right? Yeah. And she wanted to be on the show. She's a lawyer who uh, has some stories to tell about Brett Kavanaugh and her illicit romance with Mike Pence supporter, Ken Starr. Would you help me interview her? Of course. I would be happy and to do that. What is the downside to bringing somebody like that on my show in terms of... Uh, somebody said to me, well, why are you being salacious? What, what is... What, am I exploiting her? Am I... Is it wrong to talk about... Ken Starr having an adulterous affair. He didn't, he didn't lie under oath about this adultery. So what are your well, thoughts on the morale? I mean, he, well, he, she asked you about being on the show. It's not well, like you've been well, stalking her. about her over the summer, and then she contacted me. Right. And, you know, there's a, yeah, I'd like to talk to her because she is saying that Ken Starr is trying to get Mike Pence elected. He does not believe in separation of church and state. That is her. That's, so, uh, but the hypocrisy, like, how does a, a Mike Pence supporter like uh, Ken Starr, would he say it's hypocrisy that he had an affair? I don't know what he would say. Well, he... he I believe he's already denied that he had one. Is that correct? I believe. Yeah. But he's not lying under oath. No, but he's lying. I mean, this is another thing. There's nothing magic about uh, going to a forum where you're supposed to tell the truth and where there are penalties if you don't tell the truth and going on television or writing an article and saying, I didn't do this. There's still hypocrisy. Po hypocrisy is not a crime but maybe even in the Church of Feldman, it's a sin to tell right. a lie. And so there's something morally reprehensible about lying about something like this. The fact that it has to do with an affair and might be seen by some as salacious, well, there's some salacious stuff that is um, deserving of a public reprimand and deserving to give an opportunity for someone who has been abused to come forth and to say, this happened to me, it's real, and I want to tell my side of the story. You would help me interview her. I would help you interview her. But then again, Reverend, you have been encouraging me to make phony phone calls to Once. prayer lines, to evangelical prayer lines. You have, you've wanted me to do that, haven't like you? That. Hmm? We did that once. Yeah. Perhaps you're confusing this with my uh, suggestion that no one should order my pillow stuff from Mike Wendell and then uh, send it back. Last question before you go. I was discussing with the Hershenfelds, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld, the Freudian psychoanalyst, has also studied the Talmud and the Torah. I was reading. Leviticus 1 and 2 over the weekend. When's the last time you read Leviticus 1 and 2? 
It was a long time ago, to be honest. Uh, it is one of the funniest things I've ever read in my life. Uh, and I recommend that you read it in plain English. And you, you, I, I, I want to keep discussing this. I want to give you and uh, my listeners a, a reading assignment. Uh, pick up like the message. Have you read the message? It's, it's the Bible written in plain English. Yeah, I've, I've seen it. It's amazing. It's just, it's the Bible written just as it is. And Leviticus, you realize that the, it's the offerings for your sins. And it's, it's the mafia. It's a, that, that religion is a protection racket for the high priests. It's, it's, uh, I slept with my mother's brother's uncle's sister. And they say, okay, it's in Leviticus. Then you bring a goat to us and uh, we'll absolve you of your sins. Bring us some goat. And uh, I'm in the mood for some, uh, who, who wants chicken? You want some chicken and we'll sacrifice it. They ate sure, the food. Sure. They were, th this whole yeah. idea of sacrificing a, a bull to God, it was to feed the the people who the, the the priests of the high temple it was a protection racket and and then it got you read leviticus and they say if you if if you have if you can't afford a goat bring us two pigeons three chickens and a duck if the duck is defective throw in some shekels for literally it's it's no the it's, mafia yeah, well, you know, that's why Jesus came along to fix that. Yes. That's why the same people that you're just describing are the people he threw out of the temple for exchanging money, possibly money they got from people who had sinned by uh, sleeping with a goat. Right. And then, and, uh, yeah. Then and then they wanted to add on to the Vatican. And they said, you know, we could, we can indulge this behavior if you would pay for this new wing we have. That's all right. Well, you're not going to do that in the Church of Feldman. Well, I'm going to prohibit you from doing any of these maybe really shaky spent, things. Reverend, maybe if you spent less time with your grandchildren and more time on my church, the Church of Feldman, I, uh, I just, I finally paid, I had an extension on my taxes, I had October 15th. Uh, so I keep thinking I wouldn't have to do this if right. Reverend Barry W. Lynn kept his promises. I'm looking at Professor Ann Lee and Professor Marianne Cummings and Professor Jonathan Bick. They could be high priests and priestesses Yes. living tax-free on my private jet <laughs> flying around the world on the church of feldman's dime tax-free tax-free but you yeah. would rather spend time with these grandkids yeah when i go up I, I may be up there next week and um i'm gonna see i i told you i would check whether they can read the new york times and i i similarly to not uh, talking to Lewis about you. I, um, I, uh, I'll see if they're reading it now. All right. Or we can bring, you know, Harvey JK. We, there are a lot of grandkids, people with kids. I've always wanted to do like a beauty pageant with grand. Yeah. And that's or... why I did explore that. And that's not going to be a starter. Really? No. We're, we, we pick the cutest child. on yeah, We're show. not doing that. And we, and we say to, to the other children, it you're, didn't, ugly. <laughs> you're, you're not as cute as this one. No? Yeah. Okay. No, we're not doing that. All right. But at Make, least I proposed it. I, I knew what she would say, but. Makes for said, better character. Yeah. Stronger. Okay. Thank you, Reverend. I'll see you next week. I wish it was your wife instead of you. Yeah, I know that. Okay. Stay out of trouble. Only good trouble. Okay.
Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. It's good to have you back. It's Thank time you. for the professors and Marianne. We're running on time today. We don't have Professor Adnan Hussein. We have Professor Ann Lee. We have Professor Marianne Cummings. We have Professor Jonathan Bick. And uh, I, I was going to apologize for keeping you waiting, but ever since Hannah started doing this, 10 minutes is so much better than the way it used to be. So I, uh, I'm not going to apologize. Well, I will. Uh, professor Ann Lee is a former associate professor at Norwich University and a former HBCU associate dean. She is an independent scholar in geospatial information science. Professor Jonathan Bick is a political scientist, and I wrote him a fan letter Friday night. Your, your lecture on the Twilight Zone took office hours to a, a new level. Professor Marianne Cummings is a physicist as well as Parks Commissioner for Aurora, Illinois. She is also, uh, she knocks on doors. She knocks on doors for Tina Turner. It is uh, hard to argue with Professor Marianne Cummings because she puts her feet where her mouth is. And I don't mean she's putting her foot in her mouth. I mean, she, sh you know, shoe leather. Hi, I'm Professor Marianne Cummings. Are you voting for Tina Turner? You know, it's easy for me to, but you I think that's Nina Turner. What did I say? <laughs> Nina Turner. Nina Turner. Her <laughs> mind is still in the uh, early 70s. Wait, it's a Tina, Tina Turner ran for Marsha Fudge's seat. Nina. Nina. Another hero. Nina. What? It's Nina Mike's Turner. Seat. Well, okay, you know what? And I also said it was October 13th today. Hmm. Sleep deprivation or senility? You decide. All right. I think it's sleep deprivation. Did I say, you know, I said Nina Turner. I heard Nina Turner. Well, the three of us heard uh, Tina. <laughs> but, but it's Ike's fault. It's what? It's Ike's fault. Yes. All right. Let's. Uh, boy, that's embarrassing. Uh, I'm getting some nasty letters about Dave Chappelle. <laughs> I went after Dave Chappelle, and. Uh, during one of the uh, music breaks, I opened up some emails, and it's pretty much what I thought it was going to be about uh, you're uh, a failed comedian, and he's not. So I agree with that. Uh, but I don't have blood on my hands. I think he does with the uh, jokes about transgender people. But let's ask Professor Jonathan Bick, what is on your mind tonight? Well, David, I, I read a uh, article in the New York Times from last week um, and got me a little bit disturbed. It was by uh, David Leonhard. And I like I sort him. Of, okay. Yeah, he, uh, sums up, he has like a, a broad sweeping, like he covers a subject from all angles. Yeah. It's like a newsletter type thing. Go ahead. Right. So that's what I was trying to figure out exactly where this stands. You know, is it a, a news article? Is it opinion? Is it somewhere in between? I, I don't know. How would you characterize it? I, I would say, and this is a, a problem with young people like you who can't differentiate between news and opinion. And then you say, well, the New York Times has a, a bias. It's a hybrid. He writes a hybrid of opinion, fact-based opinion. With He tries to give both sides of a story. And as he digs down deep, you kind of arrive at where he kind of lands. So it's slanted. It's like a left-to-center slant. But you do end up with 
hyperlinks, and it's informative. Well, in this particular article, let, let's see if you agree with where he landed on this. And I'm not, okay, I'll just put it out there and we'll see what, what the reaction is. So uh, basically his article is asking the question, why can't the Democrats raise taxes on the wealthy? I read that. You did, okay. Yeah, he was wrong. And he talked about how the wealthy pay most of the taxes and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, right? he didn't, didn't sound like a left to center guy in that article. No, go uh, ahead. Okay, so, um, you know, about 80% of Americans say uh, that wealthy people should pay more in taxes. And this is according to the Pew Research Center polling. Uh, I, I've seen many, many other polls as well that continually say this over time. And yet Democrats rarely do it. Um, or if they do, they only reverse a tiny amount of the tax cuts for the wealthy that the Republicans put through. Um, so now we have Democrats in the White House, in the Congress, barely controlling the Senate, but controlling it. Um, and, and they are hard, having the darndest time trying to raise taxes on the wealthy. Uh, you know, if, if Biden's tax plan passed, the top 0.1% would pay an effective tax rate of about 40%. So that means about 40% of their income would be paid in taxes. Uh, this is not to be confused with marginal tax rates, right? Um, what does a marginal tax rate mean? So the marginal tax rate is what you see in the IRS tax tables. And the way it works is... Uh, that as you make more money, because we do have a somewhat progressive income tax, I happen to think all taxes should be progressive, but nonetheless, our income tax is progressive. Uh, I'm sorry to do this, but yeah. you're really great at this, and we have so much financial illiteracy coming out of my mouth. What is the difference between a progressive tax and a, reg is it a regressive, regressive tax? Oh, you can have a regressive tax, you can have a flat tax, and you can have a progressive tax. So a regressive tax, uh, the more money you make, the smaller percentage of tax that you pay. Really an insane type of tax to have, right? A flat tax is that everybody pays the same percentage, no matter yeah. their income. Forbes wanted that, but it never happened. Right. And they want it because it benefits the wealthy. Right. Uh, you know, and a progressive tax is the more money you make, the greater percentage of your income that you pay as tax. And right. Americans overwhelmingly favor a progressive income tax. Yes. You know, uh, Republicans try to confuse things and say, oh, we want to simplify the tax code. Well, what they want to do is make it less progressive eliminate marginal income tax brackets uh, so that the very wealthy pay a much smaller share of their income. So a progressive tax, which we have, punishes people for earning more money. No, it doesn't punish them. So that's what that's that's, that's what they say. That's what they claim. Yeah. Right. That's that's we have to learn to use claim. that as a selling point. I, I really do. Oh, I, oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> we're punishing you for making more money. Yes. Because if you're making more money, you're doing something wrong. The same way we, we punish cigarettes, we put a tax on tobacco. Yes, we're, we're punishing you for making more money. If you're making a million dollars a year, you're committing a crime. I don't know that you're going to convince the majority of Americans on that position. Oh, I, I, but, I think, but I, I think if we had leadership that spelled it out and explained that nobody can make a million dollars without committing a crime, uh, 
yes, you, anybody who makes a million dollars a year is committing a crime. I agree with you that there should be a limit, not only on income, uh, but on wealth. So after a certain point, yeah, the really sad thing is, I've committed all those crimes, and I still can't make a million dollars. I know you've been trying very hard. <laughs> I try to sell my soul to the devil, and he told me what it's worth. <laughs> it's this is why I'm so jealous of Dave Chappelle. Go on. I'm sorry. All right. So, um, so, so, just back to to Biden's tax proposal uh, as he framed it in his Build Back Better Act. Um, the point one percent, not the one percent, but the point one percent would pay an effective tax rate of about 40%. And that includes income tax, estate tax, corporate tax, and capital gains, all of those different taxes. And you're still only getting up to an effective tax rate of 40%. You know, in the 1940s and 50s and 60s in this country, uh, we had a marginal tax rate for the income tax of over 90%, 90%, right? I think it should be back there for anyone making over about three and a half million dollars a year um, because that, that would be the adjusted amount uh, if we adjusted for inflation back to the 40s. So, um, and if Manchin's tax plan passed, at least as he presented it in one form, uh, the top 0.1% would pay an effective tax rate of about 35%. So you're talking about a 5% difference there. You know, neither of these tax plans are particularly very progressive, right? The, they're not uh, out of line with what's been going on in the last 40 years uh, in this country, which is resulted in massive inequality and uh, destabilizing our democracy. And, and I think part of that is, Professor John, that um, we have to distinguish between, as I think you might have just pointed out, wealth increase and in income. I mean, basically, well, a lot of what the very rich can do is define away any income. And yeah. I'll have a deferred payments on some capital gains or some, you know, uh, financial machinations and just shielding a lot of it offshore. And I think that, you know, the idea of a wealth tax, and I think Elizabeth Warren explained it very well. All of us pay a wealth tax who own a house. <laughs> you know, I'm paying thousands of dollars a year and I live in the ghetto. <laughs> I, mean, I live in the poor part of town. And, you know, that's just, that's every year. And if I don't pay it, I could lose my house. So somebody yeah. that has an enormous amount of wealth in other structures, be it physical or financial, uh, I think that paying a wealth tax, as well as increasing the, um, the inheritance tax, you start getting at this structural kind of thing where you really can't get at just by income tax alone. I mean, I just, I'm curious. So you, if you own a house, you have to pay taxes on the house. Those is, are property but, taxes. Property, yes. But is that deductible? Property tax. But isn't that deductible? Only to $10,000. So that was the change yeah. that the 2017 uh, Trump tax cut uh, uh, made. Salt or something? Is that, is that what salt is? Salt, yeah, salt is a uh, state and local tax. Okay. So, so that includes not only property taxes, but uh, if you pay a, uh, a, a local uh, income tax or you pay- yeah, state taxes, state and state local taxes. Tax. Yeah. You can deduct that from your federal taxes. Right. So right. what about your interest on your mortgage, if you have a mortgage? That's right. That's, that's, a, that that's rolled well. in there. Yeah. Is that part of salt? No. Yes. No, no, I think, yeah. If you have uh, interest on your mortgage, it's, it's called uh, real estate taxes. And you're, most of us, unless you live in cities, sometimes there's a small amount of money uh, tax you pay 
for living in a city, but most of us it's state taxes and uh, an interest and we can, you can deduct and, and, and uh, payments on your house. All right, so I mean, your taxes on your house. So, so, okay. so, well, so only the interest you pay on. Your your yeah. So, uh, one of you, <laughs> I was going to do yeah. a divorce joke. Uh, you have a mortgage. Mm -hmm. Part of your payment to your mortgage is interest on the loan. You can deduct the interest on the loan from the government. So, if you're paying ten thousand dollars a year in interest on the loan and you made a hundred dollars or a hundred thousand dollars you did then you made ninety thousand you deduct the ten thousand dollars on the interest is that correct that is correct that's a deduction yeah right so if you own property and you're renting the interest on the is that is the interest on the property in other words, you get to deduct the interest that you pay on the property, but the people you're renting to can't deduct their rent. Is that That's exactly right. That's why it's not fair, right? Why why shouldn't you be able to deduct a portion of your rent? Uh, you know, that that it, this is definitely a class uh, differential here. Right? I call it a guillotine moment. A guillotine moment. I mean, on the one hand, right, the SALT deduction does make sense because what you're doing is you're paying taxes uh, on money that you're using to pay taxes. So, um, but the problem is that it was unlimited, right? So, so the very wealthy could deduct uh, enormous amounts of uh, taxes from their income. If you did put a more reasonable cap on it, I think 10,000 is too low, um, because it's, it's preventing middle-class people from deducting anything. If, right. you know, if you raised it to like 50,000, um, and if, if you also created a deduction for rent, that would make sense. You know, I, I have an idea for this that we, 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 we should add, hear me out another hour to the show, hear, hear me out. Food, it should be the food, sex, and money hour <laughs> where we talk, we have, we bring on an expert because that's the three things that people never talk about is food, sex, and money. And it would be great to have, you know, Paul LeBeau, it's so hard to uh, uh, talk about food, sex, and money. So Frank Sinatra, by the way, ate ham and eggs off a prostitute's chest, according to Ki 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 uh, Kitty Kelly. Oh, yeah, she would know. Yeah. Were, he, were they... combined, he was able to combine food, sex, and money, Frank Sinatra. Were they green uh, eggs and ham, by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, Sinatra ate eggs, eggs and ham off a prostitute's chest, and... Uh, He's the only guy, the chairman of the board, had, had no problem talking about food, sex, and money. All right, so I'm sorry. I have had no sleep, and I thought it was October 13th instead of the October 14th. you got to get seven, eight hours sleep, David. Get some exercise. Not, not every day. And I, <laughs> it should be every day. It's this goddamn coffee. Well, yeah, you shouldn't drink coffee after 3 p.m., Ben. I know. Go ahead. So you were talking about uh, if, you, yeah. if you tell me not to drink coffee and get more sleep, it, or I feel like I'm going to have to send you alimony payments. It sounds like somebody <laughs> who uh, sounds like... Because I care, David. Yeah, okay, let me just cut you. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, um, so, so Leonhardt in the New York Times asks, uh, why are Democrats struggling to enact overwhelmingly popular tax increases? And he says the answer from some 
frustrated progressives, I guess he's talking to me maybe, is that centrist Democrats, Democrats like Manchin have been bought off by many wealthy uh, people in, in lob and their lobbyists. Um, but he says, uh, no, the real reason is that it's out of conviction that they're voting against these things. That right. they're, they just don't think it's smart to spend $350 billion a year over 10 years um, to provide for social infrastructure, such as taking care of our elderly, uh, making sure that families with children have enough money to, to feed them adequately and clothe them adequately um, and, and get them to the doctor. Um, so he says that um, he, he's quoting Matt uh, Iglesias, uh, and he says, cinema isn't blocking popular progressive ideas because she's getting corporate money. She's getting corporate money because she's blocking popular progressive ideas and businesses want their key ally to succeed and prosper. And that's why he writes for the New York Times and why I do not. Right. But Iglesias used to be over the, Amer where was he? Think Progress, Iglesias? Uh, oh, he, was that, let me see, uh, sub, well, now he's at Substack. Well, it sounds like it's... Everybody is. I guess so, yeah. Sub, sub, substandard stack. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But, but you know, this really reveals a very poor understanding, this is me talking now, a very poor understanding on the part of Leonhardt, Iglesias, and Cinema, and we'll throw in Manchin, as to what the job of a U.S. senator is supposed to be. It is not to represent the interest of a handful of corporate executives and wealthy shareholders. Right. It is the job of a senator to consider the will of the majority of their constituents and the well-being of the nation as a whole. And this, the second part is something that's usually overlooked because of the way our national legislature is constructed. That is, we don't have any legislatures that are elected at large or by the country. They're all from either congressional districts or individual states. And this, I think, is a problem because in the 21st century, you know, to, to look at something from the position of a congressional district and try to solve a problem like global warming is impossible. You know, the only person in our elected person in our government that uh, is accountable to the nation as a whole is the president. And even that is filtered through the Electoral College, which we've talked about before. Um, all right. So. Uh, Leonhardt's solution is that if Democrats want to enact larger tax increases on the rich and help pay for expansions of uh, pre-K, college, health care, paid leave, clean energy programs, uh, he says the path is straightforward. The party needs to win more elections than it did last year. Gee, how do you do that? Well, the problem with this solution is that the Democrats, even when they have the votes, they don't use their power to make these changes. So, for example, President Biden bowed to the power of the Senate parliamentarian rather than pass a $15 minimum wage increase. When, uh, when President Obama, Obama had 60 at a 60 vote margin in the Senate for many months, uh, well, I think it was eight months, and control of the House. Why didn't he eliminate the filibuster? This, you know, wh why is it that Biden has been so hesitant to get rid of the pro slavery, anti democratic Senate rule that allows a minority to consistently frustrate the will of the majority of the Senate? The filibuster, that is. Right. Why didn't Democrats eliminate the debt ceiling the first several times that Republicans held the country hostage? You know, David, if a guy hits me over the head with a baseball bat once, I start to seriously consider taking that baseball bat away from him, but not the Democrats. 
No, they want to keep handing the bat to the Republicans decade after decade to beat them over the head with it. And it's the American people who are getting bloodied. Right. Almost like they're right. playing well, on the same team. Wow. I, uh, I'm afraid you may be right. I'm afraid that they like the idea of you know, all these things in principle, but not in practice. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. It, it's getting harder and harder to come up with a, with a different narrative. You know, when you when you think about their history and, and the things they've been doing uh, and the in, inaction when they could have taken action. Right. What could they do with the the infrastructure the, the build back better again i can't imagine anything at this moment in the next three weeks anything that's more important than build back better i can't see any anything to talk about for the next three weeks other than build back better what is acceptable what what would you say is okay you know it's hard to pass these bills but this isn't bad Jesus Christ, I can remember, I'm ashamed to say this, defending Obamacare. I remember, he, you know, Obama made it look so hard that I was grateful for Obamacare. Uh, yeah. They make it look so hard, the Democrats, to get anything done that you're grateful for any morsel. So yeah. what, the, you know, our, the, our, the, our expectations have been worn down and it is an expectations game, as we know. So what what will you be grateful for? Uh, I'll just say quickly, and then I want to, you know, let's hear from Professor Lee and Professor Cummings on this. Uh, my preference would be to uh, reduce the number of years uh, of the Build Back Better plan to four or five, mm -hmm. uh, fully fund everything that's in it, and then you know, leave it up to the Democrats if they happen to be in power then or the Republicans who will try to cut away at those things. But it won't be easy because people will have significant benefits to them and changes to their lives right. that are meaningful. And to t try to take those away after five years will be very difficult. Obamacare, they did a good job of denuding Obamacare of the individual mandate and uh, Medicaid expansion. They did do a good, but they, it has survived. It, it, an argument could be made as bad as Obamacare is, it was a three-legged stool that was impossible. This is Paul Krugman saying it was impossible to destroy Obamacare, that the genius of Obamacare is, it was indestructible. Well, it was indestructible because, in part, they kept the insurance companies alive. Right. I mean, right. remember when all this was happening, we were in the midst of a, a financial meltdown and the insurance companies were not going to survive this. The health insurance companies were not going to survive this because when people were being massively laid off, uh, you know, what, what's the first to go? If you've got to pay rent, if you've got to buy food and then pay for your you know, and pay for insurance and you're young, you know, you've never been to the hospital before. What are you going to give up first? I mean, they knew, they knew this was coming. So this the whole Obamacare was just basically to give these guys 10 to 12 more years of life. Yep. And we're kind of at the end right. of this right now. Right. It's another That's bailout. It, it could have uh, changed that. That was the moment when insurance could have been restructured in the United right. States. And it agree. wasn't. Yeah, I, I agree with Jonathan, too, that we can front end the, the payment uh, period, uh, if front end the budget, and uh, it, it, it would force the Republicans to do even more horrible things if they happen to win. So uh, I, I think that's a good idea. Me too. And, and, I, and I agree that Bernie's, uh, when Bernie says, you know, this was a... <laughs> 3.5 was already a compromise. You know, this is that whole point. It's, it, it should be even more relative to the front end. Yeah. Inflation. We've talked about this. Uh, is there inflation? 
<laughs> there isn't in wages, that's for damn sure. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's a new viral article done by an economist at the St. Louis Fed that says it's all illusory, that inflation is, you know, it's just what you make it. it it's really, you can't build expectations off it. it it's just, and, and it's actually causing a little bit of a stir among, uh, you know, economists who really want to be invested in, in planning for inflation policy. Uh, and and it's you know it's a little radical in that sense, but he, he actually uses uh, decent data and stuff, so it's uh, it's worth reading. I don't know if you remember, I talked about this about four months ago, that it, inflation is how people feel. There's no way to measure inflation. There's really no accurate way to measure. Uh, the, the strength of the dollar, like exchange rates, and are how people feel at the time. And inflation is, if you, as we've said, if you wanted to claim inflation, you could point to medicine, education, and you could find 70s era double digit inflation if you were looking for it. So uh, this, this was a study that I had read four months ago. It didn't, nobody agreed with me when I brought it up. Is This is getting traction now. Yes, it is. It's uh, at least among economists only because, you know, it, it's like nailing spaghetti. It, 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 uh, the data is very complicated and you, you invest a lot of time in models that, are, you know, the, 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 the whole system is, it changes dynamically. And then when you look at the size of corruption, like, you know, Pandora Papers has sort of shown, that's a huge variable once you start moving, moving stuff around. And as I said last mm -hmm. week, I, I, I think Pandora Papers is, you know, the people who, are, who haven't been nailed by it are the ones who really are pushing this. This is that, uh, right. this is always <laughs> that, you know, it's yeah. not the- Go, the, go after those guys. It yeah, was absent. <laughs> no, nobody mentions Russian money in all of that. There's very little Russian money mentioned there. It's just and there's a whole bunch of things that are lacking in that particular now. Not, not that Great. you know, 14, you know, big companies that doing offshoring is, is not a, a significant no number. Americans. There are no Americans, uh, I believe, mentioned in this list. Yes, there's either. absolutely no American firms. Mm -hmm. so. Which suggests that the Pandora Papers are an advertisement for South Dakota and Delaware. If you put your money in South Dakota and Delaware, it's secret. Yep. It's... Hmm. Ooh, I just got like a, a chill, like, like it's hopeless. I hate <laughs> that. Well, well, that's well. not... If you put uh, if you uh, put all your hopes in politicians and and the current politics, uh, you know you're you're not going to be happy. But um, yeah, we haven't declared a general strike, but lots before, of people going on strike. Lots of people before. going. Indeed, there are. There's going to, but it's strike season too. This is a seasonal thing. Since we're coming to the end of the pandemic, I think there is this urgency to try, particularly yes. because because some public money co comes under a new fiscal year that that it's time to strike i mean this mm -hmm. is this is that moment and and it'll be kind of interesting to see you know the iotsi strike is just a tip of the iceberg because it'll have an effect on advertisers etc right but yep. there's the kellogg strike the yeah. auto union are thinking strike there's john deere strike i mean there's like you know some uh, some fairly iconic uh, American companies that are are now facing strikes, and you know I think I mean, a few years ago it was the teachers the, the and, and the public unions that were showing people how it was done. I think it was even in in West Virginia, not a progressive state, where the the teachers union the, the teachers went against their own union leadership, who negotiated some half-assed plan. State, and they just all went on strike. Yeah. And they got most of their demands. And it's like, you know, but it's a it's it's kind of something that people haven't been used to. 
for a while because union leadership has become much more like corporate management, not only, you know, uh, in their way of thinking, but just in, in their lifestyles, in the money they make, you know, so they identify, it's not just they uh, employ the thinking, they kind of identify more with the, you know, w w with management of these companies than the workers that they're supposed to be representing. Well, it, it is unfortunate, but we are in a, a burgeoning crisis period. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's gonna shake out a lot of different things. But I, as well, I said, uh, yeah. go ahead. No, but I, I think that one of the advantage of people can just get smart and uh, and form real solidarity is that there has been this, you know, just in time kind of uh, supply chain type, you know, type structuring of corporations. Now that is like on, on a global wide scale. And yeah, that that. Uh, that has done very well for very few people on uh, bottom line and, and their stockholders and the, and people who get paid dividends. But in terms of societal or national security, in terms of ultimately what is going to benefit the consumer, I mean, it's been, um, it's gonna come to a screeching crash because we've had to, 20 years ago, I was in, remember they had the Disney stores and they had the Warner Brothers stores. They were kind of like borders at, at Barnes and Noble, you know, they're, they're same kind of store, same kind of structure. Disney just creeps me out. Warner Brothers is cool. But the thing is, is that everything I was noticing over 20 years ago, everything there was made in China mm -hmm. or made in Vietnam or made in Macau. I mean, it was uh, my, my uh, friend ran, ran a kind of a specialty fairy garden store and he had a lot of nice crap in there. But it was also dis dismaying how much of it was just made offshore. Well, One American company, Crothers, you know, it was just, so you have all these global supply chains. Um, and I think if we're, it, 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 it seems like we're crushed under this wheel. However, it is like all empires or large edifices, there's a vulnerability. And the workers now are seizing that vulnerability right now takes a long time for the, I mean, as it, the writers at the New York Times and Newsweek and things like that to come up to, they're paid to come to the wrong conclusions about things because they're paid to protect the narrative of the, of, of the 1% or the 0.01%. So there's very, who's a real labor writer? I mean, I didn't really like him much, but you know, Ed Schultz at least talked about labor. He at least brought it up. Until they wanted to go union at MSN. Well, same with well, same with Jank Uger. I mean, you know, it's like these guys, they, um, you know, in their own personal business, you know, they do what's best for themselves. But, you know, at least he was talking about trade, uh, about, you know, uh, about trade agreements. He was bringing up, he, he was, I think he was fired ultimately because he was wanting to showcase uh, Bernie Sanders and the TPP, but um, from MSNBC. But we don't have that. I mean, Labor leaders used to be on like the Tonight Show. <laughs> I mean, used to you would get this in media. You would get labor concerns. Now people are watching. It's like bread and circuses, and people maybe uh, get the impression that their own concerns and you know, like existential threats, are meaningless because they don't see any of this reflected in the narratives that they read and in mainstream media or on the TV. There is there was a study done by Media Matters of the Sunday morning wow. shows. Zero labor leaders on the Sunday mm -hmm. shows. And <laughs> then I went to the AFL CIO website. And not that I'm against diversity, but if you go to the AFL CIO website, it's all about diversity and nothing about I, I you go to Mike Elk's payday report to find out where the strikes are. You would think the AFL-CIO could tell me where the strikes are. Not interesting. I'm all for diversity, but I'd like to think that the AFL-CIO, along with diversity, is also telling us that Starbucks, this is according to Mike Elk over at Payday Report, everybody should go to Payday Report, give Mike Elk money, John Deere, on strike, 10,000 John Deere workers on strike. Starbucks, if you're on Twitter, ask Starbucks why they shut down 
uh, two or three locations in Buffalo, New York. Well, it turns out they're unionizing in Buffalo, New York. So Starbucks said, oh, OK, well, we're remodeling. Oh. <laughs> so use your Twitter account at Starbucks and say, why won't you recognize the unions? Shame them. You know, it is pretty, it really is what separates the left from the Democrats. Right. You, you know, say, get people to say out loud whether or not you support unions. Ask politicians, I mean, the two questions, you know, if I ever had politicians on this show, you know, pe sitting Congress people, did the Taliban attack us on 9-11, yes or no? And do you support the PRO Act? Do you, you know, nail them on unions, you know? Uh, do you even know what card check is? Right. Not, the, but not what the price of milk is. What is, what is card, that's a great, that's why I don't have them on the show. Well, uh, let's go to Professor Lee and find out what you want to talk. There's a lot to, to talk about. There's, there's uh, plenty to talk about. Let me just uh, uh, say relative to your earlier conversation about Chappelle, once you start looking, because I decided, I'm getting you know, a, a, as you were doing it, I, I, I thought, well, there must be other reasons. And so what I did was, I, I, because I actually wrote something on this as well for Co Daily Coast, but What's interesting to me was that why was he bringing up TERFs, uh, uh, trans exclusionary radical feminists? Well, it turns out that this coming week, Chappelle's in England. So, and TERFs are BFD and gender critical. I just think it's all PR. This is this was like the un, unmentioned element in so in is this it? controversy. What is a TERF? But what explain it? Well, it's it's essentially buying into the same argument of of uh, you know without getting into a big lecture on it. It is a point of view from radical feminists that uh, you know it's biological determinism that uh, uh, only lady parts determine who are ladies. Um, and and in the British context, it is this. It has these sort of uh, microaggressions about. If you're you don't have a uterus or, you know, it's about menstrual, that menstrual blood is blood is privilege in that particular context. Now, that's in the British context. This is not in American discourse. And it's become a, a much more serious issue because it has class elements built into it as well. Class and race elements built in, in the British context. And it's easily and it's very reactionary in that particular context, but also because there's other issues as well without getting into a long thing about it. And, and of course, J.K. Rowling made it that that problematic at this course. And and I couldn't figure out why why Chappelle was talking about turfs anyway. But now now that we see that this controversy is so close to his British tour, I think it's about audiences. For, for shows in England, because he's got one coming up this coming weekend, I think, wow. in, in London. So, you know. Did you say any, did you see the special? Uh, no, I only, what I wrote on was just simply the one little argument. I was, I was more interested in the press coverage because they, right. they took and that one little I, sequence. I'm getting, because of my connection to the comedy community, I'm getting, I'm beginning to get, uh, emails and uh, <laughs> so what is his argument like why does like what who cares about the transgender community other than keeping them safe and happy what is the threat yeah. I, I genuinely don't understand it's, it's just punching down but as I said I think it it has this more insidious purpose as it's good PR to front uh, a several uh, a tour in England because that 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 audience will show up. And I guess he feels that there's an Afro pessimism 
where he feels that they get to claim victimhood when they're in the you know they they get to claim victimhood when they choose but I'm black all the time is that well, the argument well I I'd, I'd say that's one part of it but I I, I you know I uh, without re- rehearsing the the original argument I just think that um, that it 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 just needs to be constantly corrected you know and and uh, uh, I I think he thought well you know it, it's it's a marginal choice. And, and also that he did, you know, I, I do think that he exploited uh, that poor woman. Yeah. If you listen to the, listen, he's, uh, the, the, he's a great performer with a third rate comedy mind, you know, goes for the low hanging fruit. Uh, people don't like me saying that, but it's the truth. And, uh, He's great, but not that smart. And the stuff and his targets now are result in people committing suicide or getting beaten up. And it's a difficult truth for Netflix to confront. It's uh, anyway. I anyway, I, it, it, I it was the end of his it was the end of his contract the other other more interesting things were you know uh lauren bobert uh well tell uh, us trying to about the bow and bow, bows and arrows yeah so what happened in norway well apparently a dane who either lived in or uh traveled to norway decided to kill some old people essentially older people who were probably fairly easy targets um in a, in a single store in the eastern part of Norway. And, uh, you know, the event was over in 30 minutes. The police, you know, got the guy. Uh, the question is whether you frame it as terror and whether you frame it in the context of, of mass uh, killing events. And Lauren Bobert decided to say, well, you know, uh, guns, you know, uh, a good guy, the, the undercurrent of her argument is that a good guy with a gun could have probably stopped this. I, I don't think so, number one. Uh, and, and it wasn't about guns so much as it is just simply about violence. And, and also in her argumentation, she, and, and some other actually progressives have neglected to mention uh, Anders Brevik, who you know, it holds a damn record for killing people, uh, you know, if, if nowhere else but in Norway. <laughs> I mean, I, it's just an immense killing spree and, and does need to be mentioned every time, even the, these small events get mentioned. But anyway, everyone got, we're now off on this. Uh, Lauren Bobert is so dumb that, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of where we are now. Right. I noticed Professor Adnan Hussein is in the chat room. So I'm, I'm, have you noticed how much better the professors and Marianne is today? <laughs> oh, how cruel. <laughs> you know, been, I see Professor <laughs> Adnan Hussein. Uh, well, let, let's, uh, 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 let's talk about, well, so by, by the way, um, well, let's move on. The Mississippi Clean Coal Power Plant, beautiful clean, coal, beautiful clean coal. Yeah, seven point five billion dollars for a coal coal plant that they just imploded on uh, this last weekend. What do you mean? Uh, oh well, it, it's not. It wasn't going to make any money, and uh, you know because. Uh, there's an entire market condition that has shifted uh, on the issue of, uh, you know, coal, the so-called coal and its scrubbers. And so they had to, you know, they had to destroy it to shift over to natural gas. Uh, it, it, it was just a whole boondoggle anyway. Essentially, it went forward because, you know, Trump was pimping uh, clean coal. And uh, they, they had a thing on, on, I think, PBS or Frontline or something where the uh, a representative of Southern Energy was talking about how uh, America was the Saudi Arabia of coal, which makes no damn sense 
uh, it's like Saudi Arabia is the Saudi Arabia of sand. You know, it's just like so stupid. Uh, but anyway, it, it is a, it was originally supposed to be the shining example of clean coal, you know, with all those additional scrubbers, et cetera. But, the, right. you know, the, the, the jury's still out on carbon capture. I mean, I know carbon capture exists. It's just that somebody's got to make some decisions about how you do carbon capture, et cetera. And, and this requires regulation and planning and a bunch of other things that don't seem to exist, as well as, uh, of course, as uh, uh, Marianne has talked yeah, about like, questions of clean nuclear energy. Right. There's no economy of scale with carbon capture. They, they well, just it, it could be if, if they had the right technology. But right. but they're relying they're relying on a market condition in order to implement carbon capture. And they're looking for subsidies in order to do that. And, and it's all a subsidies game. The, the for example, uh, uh, public private partnerships are never equitable. They always they they're always they always wind up being public subsidies to private firms. This is this is the fallacy of, of certain things under neoliberal capitalist economies that there's always something else. This is similar to the, the what we we're talking before about taxes. Right, right. Yeah, uh, if you if you hear the words public private partnership, you know, hold on to your wallet because. I, I can't. Can you think of one that's actually worked out for the benefit of the public and the customers that it's supposed to serve? Well, uh, they've always worked out for the people they were designed to serve, <laughs> which is the owners and the politicians that they've uh, got captured. Um, you know, it's it's funny you should bring this up. Uh, uh, Trump wasn't the only one pimping clean coal. Our own, very own Dick Durbin of the state of Illinois, there are several power plants. One egregious one, coal power plant, is Prairie State Plant. Another one of these, you know, um, in, in principle, publicly held, but private, but, you know, all of the executives are just getting millions and millions of dollars for running a losing business, you know, that it's always under scrutiny by the you know by the environmental protection agency mm -hmm. and our the, the recent bill we just passed will close these things most of them in 2035 and then all of them by 2045 the year 2045 it reminds me of a 60s song you know we're not going to be alive or some of us are and it's not going to be pretty um so yeah, it's, it's very hard to, it, you know, I, I was just, that just come to my mind. I mean, these enormous utilities, and I put the nuclear utilities in there also. It should be run publicly, you know, but why, why these guys get to profit off of these? Because, you know, nuclear power plants, you're never going to want them run privately. You know, you always want them run under the scrutiny of, of regulators, you know, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Department of Energy now is, is gotten into this. But uh, it's just a way of just funneling massive amount of cash to individuals. And it's just like, it's, we've let this go on, I guess, thinking that, um, you know, somebody's going to do something about this. And, uh, you know, when you're not citizens and we all think that it was going on, uh, that everything was happening on autopilot, which some of us are guilty of when Obama was elected, we thought, well, maybe the system does. No, we really have to uh, get down to the hard work of activism. Uh, there was just one thing I I'd noticed today and uh, Xavier Becerra, who is um, the uh, health secretary, Biden's health secretary, he, he, Turns out when he was, um, I think he was from California, wasn't he either the AG or he was involved in state government there. And he was calling for years for um, that, the, uh, that, that the Secretary of the Health and Human Cir uh, Services, both under Obama and, and Trump, could use their real power to con drug, cold, control drug pricing. In fact, uh, there is law, I was just reading about it today, uh, there's a law passed in 1980, it was called the Bay Dole Act. We know who those guys were. And it gives federal agencies the power to license uh, patented products if federal funds were used in their development, which is true of all drugs to first order. There is not a single major drug that didn't have massive amounts of public investment in the heavy lifting of R&D, 
you know, so mm -hmm. you can take action and you can take them over when action is necessary, like we have a medical crisis and it's a pandemic. And, uh, you know, since he's gotten into, since he's been appointed, he has done nothing to push that. And this is just goes what we were saying earlier. The Democrats have all the power in the world to do an enormous range of things. Biden himself through executive orders could be doing things. He said he was gonna do something, but with, with public with drilling on public land, but you know, I think he's, he's restored a few, a few national monuments that, uh, that, that Trump had cut back protection on. Well, he could have done it through day one, but I think what they want to do is that there's a few things that they can do. I'm guessing that there's no oil in Escalante National Monument or any of these places. There's a few things that they can do and make and make and make a public event out of it. In the meantime, last time I checked, over 2,500 new permits for drilling on public land when he made a very public statement, statement that he was going to end this. So... You know, I, I think we are, I think a lot of people who still identify as partisan Democrats are operating in a big, a, a bit of a fog and it's a fog of denial. I mean, these people are blatantly just showing who they are a lot by what they're not doing as much as what they are doing. And, you know, there may be good people stuck like in a tar pit in this system, but the reality is both parties are there to service the same donors. You've got a good cops. That's why I'm not, I, I, you know, they, they kind of, I get slapped down when I make this, to me, face it, slappingly obvious observation that I'm a nihilist or I'm an accelerationist. I said, no, why can't we simply acknowledge that both parties are in the same, are beholden to the same people. They have different roles. There's a good cop, bad cop sort of thing. So, you know, you're, you're eternally grateful after you've been beat up by the bad cop when the good cop comes in with, you know, some coffee and a donut or something and talks nice to you. That's, I mean, we were abused that way. And, you know, the, the Republicans come in, they do horrible crap, but I mean, when you really look at it, it's not much more horrible than what's been going on all along. The Democrats come in and they seem to be there to prevent any natural swing back to anything close to sanity. Right. And, you know, it's what well, it's a ratchet effect. You get this, you get some performative stuff, you get, you know, like a little like like releasing some pressure at a safety valve, you know, to to take care of some of the worst, most egregious aspects of the system like Obamacare did just that. But it was it's not meant ultimately to to do us good, it's meant to protect the interests that have been there for decades and decades. And I don't know what takes that out, but I think it's not going to be as much politics because I mean, the people who could have made a difference are very, very reluctant to use their power. I don't know if they were, if they were always that way or if they were just the people who are activists are just not inclined to just exercise raw power, but they're not doing it. Whatever the reason they're not doing, it. they're not doing what they can be doing. They are simply not. So it's going to be getting, it's going to be strikes, but it's most like, but it's more like, let's get into the culture that we don't accept, you know, what the status quo is either locally or federally. And, you know, strikes are is one people, easy way to do it. Are people really, because the media is always looking for a new we have to wrap it up but yeah. people are all the the news media is always looking for a story professor marianne we talked about you and i talked about this on previous shows about people quitting their jobs and this wishful thinking that you and i had that wouldn't it be great if americans just said take this job and shove it is do you when you now we're reading these headlines four million people have quit their jobs is it really happening? Do you get a sense for the strikes? The strikes are well, one. I don't know what it if it's if it's a a determine is that people are sitting down and actually determining this or it's a reactionary. I su I suspect a lot of what's happened is just reactionary re reaction to COVID. I mean, there are restaurants open around here, but you know the right the business still isn't back. Uh, not only do, can they not hire the employees, the business just isn't there like it used to be. We're still in the middle of a pandemic. 
I mean, Illinois and Michigan, the COVID cases are going up, you know, not down. And, you know, it's, so it's, I think that after, I, who was it, the Reverend Barry Lynn's wife, I remember when she was on, wasn't she on, a, a, it was an office hours one night. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And when she said that, that, yeah, people are thinking this is going to be over in a few months. No, yeah. this is going to just radically change. The, but, you know, like people continue to go on. There's a, there's a lot of you know, pleasant denial, like, wow, if you can just sit out at your favorite bar outside and have a martini, then things feel back to normal, you know, right. but right. they're not. And, uh, you know, uh, we do have the Internet, though. People yeah. can, people don't, aren't as isolated as they could have possibly been, like if this were happening 40 years ago. So, you know, that's uh, one thing we, and we don't have to hope. I mean, people are just doing it. They are questioning. There's just a young radicals who are not, who are done with identity politics, who are black, who understand that, you know, if you don't embed this with, um, with class, you are going to have a divided country. Uh, I just wanted to say that the people that got assassinated, uh, the leaders that got assassinated, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, were people who had just that philosophy. Uh, I want to show a film, one of these You're office hours, that, that was the only that. film, the, yeah, the only film blacklisted. There was one movie that was blacklisted during the McCarthy, and it was called Salt Era. It was called Salt of the Earth. Right. And we showed it at uh, Progressives of Kane County. Uh, fundraiser and people were amazed at this movie. I mean, it's, it was made in the 1950s, very modern feel. They were dealing with all these issues. It was a real. It was based on a real miner strike in New Mexico. The racial issues were more the Mexicans and the Anglo's, but it was the same issues. And there was the issues of men and women. And there was it was just a, you know, you would think, wow, you know, they had the grapes of rats. There were all there were kind of films that dealt with racial issues. There were films that dealt, dealt with strikes, but this one dealt with all of these issues at once and how you could get real solidarity. And yeah. that was deemed way more dangerous than the Grapes of Wrath. screening of it, uh, but we have to wrap it up. Okay. Uh, office hours, 8 p.m. Friday night. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the screenings that are going on. I, I love like watching you know, a half hour documentary or a clip and then discussing it. And uh, I hope we do more of that at office hours. I, I, I love listening or watching it and not holding it, you know, having to do anything other than participate. Uh, by the way, I, let me just torture somebody in the chat room. 60 Minutes had a great story this week about Deep Springs. It's a it's a college. Uh, has anybody heard of this? Deep Springs? Anybody see it on 60 Minutes? Really interesting place uh, that uh, I know nothing about. It's, it's an interesting college that, uh, you know, you live off the land and uh, hmm, if only somebody could talk about it. Uh, <laughs> But I guess some other time. Deep Springs College. It's uh, didn't the uh, professor Adnan Hussein go there? I think he was. I think he was the mascot for their football team. Oh, <laughs> I, I was Al confused. Alpha. He would dress up as Al Falfa and and cheer. <laughs> but you know we don't have him. So lousy football team. As I just thank you. <laughs> Just wanted to thank you, Professor Marianne Cummings. Thank you, Professor Jonathan Bick. Thank you, Professor Ann Lee. I hope we can do this next week. It is uh, time now. I hope he's here. I saw him briefly. We're running 10 minutes behind. Is Professor Harvey J. K. K. There's Alan Minsky. And please join us, Professor. Sorry to keep everybody waiting. The show is running on time despite what you think, Professor Harvey J.K., author of Take Hold of Our History. I've just learned to lie. You know, I, I'm going to become a Republican and just say this show <laughs> is not 15 minutes late. I just, I don't know what you're talking about. 
just going to deny it. It would be a sign of weakness, and my audience wouldn't respect me if I apologized uh, for the timetable. 10.15, sorry. Uh, Professor Harvey J.K. is the author of FDR on, De FDR on Democracy. Alan Minsky is executive director of Progressive Democrats of America. You are eating. Mm -hmm. Professor Harvey J.K. Oh. is eating. We were just talking about restaurants not being able to find employees. Restaurants are notorious for a business model that relies on undocumented yeah. Americans. Uh, they're notorious on not paying livable wages and hoping you get a tip. I was walking around Manhattan two days ago. It's a ghost town. It, the, the restaurants are closed. It's empty. When we look back at our economy that we've we had for the past 40 years, is it my imagination? But. Did, did restaurants flourish? Were there more restaurants, more restaurant chains, more fast food restaurants opening in the past 40 years? Is that true? Yeah, the, there was a period about five point about five years ago where the whatever governmental um, agency filed the report that Americans were now eating more meals out than they were cooking for themselves. Right. They finally so, passed that threshold in the teens some, at some point. So is it a bad thing? I know. I Listen, I, Professor K, I, am, I went after Dave Chappelle today for the, oh, we just lost Alan Minsky. I'm going to, so as long as I'm pissing people off. I just don't want to eat in front of people. So I'm going to turn my video off when I take a bite. Okay, eat, so eat, anyway. eat, 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 my son, eat. <laughs> You're a growing boy. As long as I'm pissing people off, Professor Harvey J.K., who has food flown in from New York. And Maine. And Maine. The past 40 years with the foodies and the food network, these are shitty jobs. We, we, yeah. we should be manufacturing things other than obesity. If we lose the restaurant sector, and I know people are going to get really pissed off who work in the restaurant sector. I'm not saying close all the restaurants, but this obsession with food and everything's a restaurant instead of a, man, a place that manufactures something. I mean, all right, the Cheesecake Factory, at least they're doing something. They're, it's a factory. Aren't but, they closing too in in a lot of places? A lot of these chains are closing a lot of their stores. Right, and they qualified for a, a PPP protection. Literally, the, because they were taking cheesecake and turning it into slices, they they literally got a deduction and a payment. They called themselves a manufacturing plant because people were cutting cheesecake into slices. Anyway, your thoughts. If we were to lose... The the if if these restaurants don't come back and are replaced by something better, isn't aren't we building back better? <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting because I was hearing you say that you walked around the city and places were just closed. Um, I'm going to be in the city in a couple of weeks, and I, I hope that's not completely the case. Okay, although I, I don't go to a, you know, let's have lunch. Go for uh, a walk. We should at least get a coffee along the way. Um, I'll yeah. be staying in Manhattan, as a matter of fact, oh, good, too. Good. downtown, Lower East Side. But this um, obsession with food, it's well, got to. I, you know, it's, I, I live in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where, um, and, and my life has always been a matter of going to the same place each week. So, a lot of restaurants come and, and restaurants go. And it's I haven't really been in a restaurant in Green Bay in the last year and a half, maybe more than twice. And that's the sitting outside. OK, and that didn't involve a hell of a lot of fancy eating. It just like flatbread kind of stuff, I guess. Mm -hmm. But 
I, I think uh, I think restaurant life is and cafe life and all that is, is fabulous. And I think it's fantastic. And I can tell you that back in the 18th century, it was absolutely essential for the sake of the not just so-called bourgeois life. People underestimate the degree to which that was true, at least for artisan men who would gather in coffee shops and taverns and, and ideas spread that way and radical ideas spread that way. Now, I, I, I think Marianne's right. I mean, we do, we do live in a, in a world in which the internet does provide for a kind of sociability that just did not exist in the past. It's, that's clear. But it's also the case, I, I think it would be a terrible loss if eating places weren't you know, readily available to pe for people to gather. But if the only thing in Manhattan are places, there are no bookstores, there are no record stores, it's just restaurants, and then, and then of course, because there's so many restaurants, clothing stores, because you can't fit into your clothes anymore. So um, let me write that one down, and yeah. <laughs> that's not bad, but uh, so yeah. in the neighbor, but it's true that you, you, you eat, my clothes don't fit, so I'm going into the Banana Republic. That's all there is in Manhattan, food and clothing. Well, that's what a big city like New York, which has capitalists living well. But that wasn't, work. when I was growing up. Oh yeah, no, look, I mean, I remember New York City. Yeah, absolutely. I remember where, boy, it sounds terrible. I really am old now. Um, you know, it was the case I could go to, I, when I would go home to New York, even as an adult, and I knew that there were about a half a dozen places in New York that I had to hit different kinds of bookstores, okay? Whether it was down in the village, on 8th Street, the old Valence bookshop, uh, uptown, there was red letter books, as I recall. Um, Barnes & Noble used to have two sides of the street on Lower Fifth Avenue. One was the newer books. The other side was like two to three floors of publishers, closeout, and secondhand books. And I'd spend my Sunday mornings there. I'd, I'd go in from my parents' home into the city. Double day with the spiral staircase on Fifth Avenue. Yep. And... Uh, what did you just say? Scribner's. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Scribner's, right. Which I think now is a cause became it's a, a become yes. a Sephora, you know, some kind of women's yeah, it's Sephora. It's yeah. a Sephora. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean it is it's sad, really. It, it's sad in this in the sense that the diversity of areas is so reduced. Yeah, you're right about that. Look, I mean, to the same look, the chains, you go down to lower broader, go down to Soho, which of course didn't. When, we, when you and I were kids was not even a commercial area. It was just warehouses and, and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, it, for a while, it became an area of sort of fashion and innovation. And then all of a sudden, bro Lower Broadway became one shopping mall. It was all the chain stores moved in. So, you know, I mean, urban life's not, in many ways, urban life's not what it, what it once was. And I can tell you, small town life is nothing like it once was. It's sad to drive through it. Um, that's a consequence of monopoly capital and the concentration of, of wealth. And, and by the way, it's also what leads folks out in these Midwestern, more agrarian rural areas, not even agrarian, but rural areas at the least, to view big cities as you know, not really offering that much other than for young people, because there's at least something to do and the jobs are there. But the restaurants, that, it's interesting because, you know, I fortunately, fortunately, I'm not, I don't have fancy taste, so it's, it's okay. You, when people say, but you, you mail, I get your food shipped in. Well, we're ordering lobster rolls from Maine and bagels and, you know, fish from, from the city and Spanish food from another part of the country. And to do that is less than going out to a restaurant. Really? Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. Who Absolutely. What? Who delivers it? It comes by way of, let's say, one is FedEx. Yes, yeah, usually FedEx. Put a towel over his right arm and call you Monsieur. Well, so, you know, it's weird. Uh, the, the lobster rolls from Maine, for those of you who are interested. How can that be fresh? How can that be good? That, what? They, how can it, that be good? It's flash frozen. No, it's, how is, can it be good? It's phenomenal. I, I, I never ate lobster rolls in the Midwest until recently. Now, you know, is it, is it good to have Alan's Alan is, is working against, you know, air traffic. 
I couldn't eat the stuff if I didn't have the stuff shipped in by air. Right. And have you ever read Leviticus? Have I read Leviticus? Not in a long time. Is that a novel or that we're talking the Bible? The Bible. What, what, what God says about flash frozen lobster. Ah, yeah, right. right. I, what, who are you rebelling? With all, not to be disrespectful. <laughs> well, I also, we also wanted the Spanish ham. Look, I mean, I, I'm not an Orthodox Jew, so. Well, you're going to burn in hell. Not to, not to, not to be argumentative, but you're hey, not. Why are you using Christian Christian references to 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 threaten me? I don't, I don't believe. Tell me where in the Bible Jews believe there in there hell. There actually is. Uh, th th that's a misnomer. The Jews don't believe in hell. Really. They, they, uh, Satan is a fallen angel, and there there are references to uh, another place. Okay. Not, not a lot. Rabbi, thank you, Rabbi. Not a lot. There's not a lot of focus on hell. Uh -huh. uh, if you're Jewish, you don't have to. You know there's a hell. <laughs> you don't need to be warned. <laughs> that there's a hell you know you're living in a hell and my daughter was living south of 14th street she said anything north of 14th street she felt was hell right and that's a generational change right i mean yeah. traumatic alan minsky as you know i have on a i want to talk about glasgow with you in, in a second and henry huckamacki has what an is glasgow what's the big Scotland? it's in oh, glasgow yeah. I mispronounce words. I have a problem. Uh, Otherwise, out here, it sounds like a glass cow. A glass cow. Yeah. They <laughs> should not pass. All right. So I was going to make a Stones joke, but it's so Alan Minsky, as you know, I've known you've known me for a long time. And like mm -hmm. Albert Einstein, I am looking for the grand unifying theory to explain mm -hmm. the universe. And I was with a friend. We were taking a ride home up Madison Avenue. I believe, no, not Madison Avenue, it was Lexington. Anyway, it was up uh, Lexington. I was looking at all the stores, and I, my grand unifying theory is the entire city of New York is one big money laundering operation that every single store on Fifth Avenue cannot possibly pay the rent. Yeah, it doesn't. They don't. They're laundering money for oligarchs, or they are a, a fashion brand that's paying for the exposure of being on Fifth Avenue or Lexington, but they're losing money, that nobody buys anything from the Ralph Lauren store on 72nd and 5th. Nobody buys anything. They lose money. That, that, that Lego store in uh, on uh, in Rockefeller Plaza does good business. I bet you they can't. If that if you sat with the accountants, oh, yeah, they would be brutal. They don't make any money. Literally, they're not hiding it. We it, it we we pour it. In. There would be a lot of Lego they'd be selling. <laughs> they, they would they they report. There's no discount on the Lego there. You know. They it's report cheaper over Amazon. The launder money for drug dealers and oligarchs danish but, is, is lego lego is danish what com country is it's italian italian might be danish who knows sounds but, about yeah, right it's, 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 it's all those danish drug dealers and uh oligarchs right lego is how you say leg in spanish right <laughs> let me oh nice <laughs> so but seriously I'm being absolutely serious. I tell you what, mm -hmm. if we could drop all this PC stuff of our age, we'd have a good time, you know? We would have yeah, a good time. Yeah. What were you saying about Chappelle again? Okay. Yeah. Uh, New York City and uh, the, the Grand Unifying Theory. Uh, as, as a dollar in New York. There is nobody who makes an honest dollar. That's my Grand Unifying Theory. This is one big shell game. It's, a, it, it's, it's for parking filthy money and hiding it. Why are you picking on New York? What what does L.A. have that New York? I see, because I'm I see what's in front of me, and there's no way the bodega across the street from me. I, I walk around. Go, there's no way. I seven like they charge seventeen dollars for maple syrup. 
I'm not making this up from Montreal. The, I've been watching. They have the same bottle of $17 maple syrup on the shelf that was there when I moved here five years ago. Nobody's buying okay. this shit. Um, well, you know what the problem is, is that it's not unlike, you know, the Canadians pay less for their drugs and we pay more for our maple syrup. That's right. <laughs> Remember Bernie took those diabetics up to Canada to buy maple right. syrup for their diabetes? Yeah, right. Yeah, we were thinking about how to leverage Richie Neal in Western Massachusetts. And we thought about, of course, the big um, the big uh, maple syrup cartel. Yes or no, Alan Minsky. America. Um, just a money laundering operation. Every job you have, the work you do, you don't, the, you show up for work to do something that has no relation to the business model for which you work. Well, I, think the question, I think what's question, I think what's question, what the good question is, is what, what about the places that do do a vibrant uh exchange of money so we're talking about the corner grocers with the fruit not uh, in new the, york well they were there when i was there last i haven't been there since i don't the think pandemic. they make money i don't think they right, make right. Money. okay you're, you're saying they don't you're also saying that the what used to be at least diners they all had greek motifs on their paper coffee mugs and um it did seem that they served a lot of souvlaki so there seemed to be and i think they, i think that those all those greek those seemingly mom and pop Greek diners in Manhattan are owned by a hedge fund and they're, and they're just branding it as a, a mom and pop, but they're all owned by a, uh, a hedge fund that there's well, actually in an, act, in an act of continual cruelty to radio hosts around the world, the guardian keeps naming their, uh, you know, their research into, um, the offshoring of money uh, into South Dakota or North Dakota and, and North. I think it's which which places is that's Delaware and in South Dakota, South and Dakota, yeah, Idaho, maybe I can't remember, but somewhere up Idaho, there, too. Delaware, of course. And um, the they keep calling them pa the Panama Papers and the Pandora Papers. So you're going to have to come up with something, David, with again the alliteration Spotify of double P's, mm -hmm. Spotify papers. <laughs> but but I think I think. Um, no, I mean that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, and the ghost of the of the of some mafia character will come and visit the office hours one day, um, and uh, yeah, leave somebody in a, in, a, in a puddle of blood. I mean, I don't know. You're, you're suggesting. I, I don't know. I don't know. But it's worth it's worth looking into, uh, probably because nobody has. I don't know. Isn't Hollywood also money laundering? My God, yes. Right. I mean, all these well, Vegas is Vegas is huge money laundering. There's a Hollywood is right next to Mexico. Conveniently, it was set up to escape Edison, the patent office. That, that's the truth. Hollywood yeah. was set up to avoid. So the federales couldn't shut down the, the movie producers who, in, who didn't want to pay Edison. Uh, a patent, but it was also there to to uh, take drug money from Latin America. Of course, it's a uh, Leonardo DiCaprio had to return a, a, a million dollar painting for Wolf of, that he got for Wolf of Wall Street because it turns out Wolf of Wall Street was a money laundering operation. <laughs> I love it. That makes sense. That makes sense. And I figure. I figure the British Premiership is, is definitely a money laundering operation. The British Soccer League, which now is owned by a whole slew of oligarchs and then a few massively wealthy Americans. And David Cameron launders money, and and uh, Tony Blair launders money. Right. We saw that Hollywood accounting is hysterical. It, 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 they don't make. Oh, no, that makes sense. Certain productions would definitely be. They'd be. Yeah, tailor-made for money laundering operations. This So what limited exposure I've had to the upper echelons of Hollywood finance, there have been jobs where I went to work and it was a money laundering operation and nobody knew it. The guy in charge, you know, the showrunner, yeah. was 
convinced this thing, this pilot was going to be. And it was just a money laundering operation. We just, it was like Wibiscuit in uh, The Sopranos, Push Wibiscuit. You, you're showing up to work and everybody, hey, how you doing? And it's just, they spend just enough money to make it look like maybe this show could be sold. And they're laundering money. And then we have the audacity to prosecute people who are bribing deans and coaches to get their kids into college. College is a money laundering operation. <laughs> it is. All the building that go. Why do you think they build at all these colleges? Yeah, I can see that for sure. Definitely, definitely. By the way, did, has yes, Feldman that would University, make sense. That would, yeah. uh, have you been building any this year at Feldman University? We, we tell the IRS that we've been building. That's what Lego's for. Yeah, we we, we report <laughs> building expenses, but uh, the whole thing with colleges and, and you what and hospitals are money laundering operations. Sandy Weil with mm -hmm. Weil Cornell, Weil Cornell here in New York City. This hospital that I live near does they don't stop building. Anyway. You're right, David. Uh, Lego's Danish. I didn't say. I anything. said Dan. I said Danish. Ah, the red Thank and white cap should have given it away. All right. Let, let's talk about live in Wisconsin, which is practically Denmark. Wisconsin's a money laundering. <laughs> <laughs> the cow. It's the cows. They're just munching yes. away. Yes, I can cows. see that. Yes. By the way. I, at least I know the Green Bay Packers are not a mon money laundering operation. You own the Green Bay Packers, correct? I'm one of the owners, you bet. John, John and Yoko were investing heavily in cows before he was killed. So that's, that's clearly right. a money laundering operation. Right. And she, anyway, uh, let's ask Alan Minsky about glass cow, not the ones that that's cow, right. Invested and let's let's talk about the big climate summit. Henry Huckamacki has an interview for Monday show about this, and then mm -hmm. we'll talk to Professor Harvey J K. And you're uh, not going to ask me about, about well, the climate summit. I hope I don't know shit about climate. I, summit. I, I yeah, I mean, well, you're a climate summit denier, right? You don't really think there is going to be a climate e summit. Exactly, they're all just there to drink the beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's the story? By With the way, you yeah, know, our, our, our senior strategic advisor, as he's called on climate, uh, former uh, Sanders uh, climate uh, uh, person for his 2016 campaign, uh, was a executive vice president in the Cheesecake Factory, did well <laughs> enough that he could retire. They, so this all this PDA all ties is a money together. laundering operation. Yeah, we are. We're he's definitely that. that. That's and, a job. Um, but that he was I, I, I said, we'll pay his. No, it's not a joke. We'll, we'll pay his uh, his fare to to the Glasgow conference, and he's like, eh, there's nothing gonna happen there. So he didn't take it. What do you mean? I mean, you know, it's not, he's not gonna have access to the rooms where, first of all, they're not gonna do anything meaningful. The last time they right. didn't do anything meaningful, what, it was a non-binding uh, commitment to reach goals, which guess what? They're not reaching. <laughs> well, somebody from the Cheesecake Factory knows how to make something binding. Cheesecake. Yeah, I don't think he was in, involved in that generation of Cheesecake Factory money laundering around the slices. What is this? So you, we talked on Tuesday. Yeah. You're all excited about this big summit. I'm excited about the big summit as a place to why? call why? out, the, why? Call why? out why? the hollowness of the policies that the United why? States of America pursues. What is, what is it? The conference? Yeah, Henry's excited <laughs> about it. You're excited about it. Well, I'm excited about it primarily. I'm excited about it primarily because it, it provides an opportunity for us to look seriously at U.S. Uh, climate policy and uh, in, and uh, continuing subsidizing of fossil fuels in the United States of America. And, you know, this goes a little bit to what um, Marianne was talking about, which, you know, in a fundamental way, of course, I'm not in accord with. However, okay, one party is basically involved in some kind of facade of climate denialism, right? Though one expects that the investor core of the Republican Party will scramble over to whatever kind of energy sector develops to try to make money off That's it, right? Right. right. And, um, and the Democrats are what? Um, so 90% of the people vote as if the climate emergency is real, but enough of them don't vote that way. So that in California and in the whole country, 
You continue with fossil fuel production. I mean, Gavin Newsom says, you know, we're going to no longer, are there going to be any more fracking wells, um, you know, after 2024? What the fuck is that? Is, the cli- is there a climate emergency or is there not a climate emergency? Is methane contributing to it or it is not? Is it not? You know, so basically you're saying, okay, it's 30 year investment. So this is going to be going on for 30 years. That's what the people who are making the investment understand. So that's what, that's what I'm trying to do is just leverage this moment as an opportunity. Look, climate apparently gets shit ratings on, on media. Yeah, and I don't, yeah. think, I don't think it's fair to, to target the audience of the, of the Feldman uh, show as the guilty party here, but the general public um, apparently turns off when climate comes on as a subject. You know, it doesn't have Trump's latest absurdity as part of it. It doesn't have a you know, way to- have, have to make it sexy. Yeah, nothing yeah. bristling about AOC or anything in it or whatever. Mother and nature, mother nature needs to wear, you know. Yeah, you got it. Clothes. So we got to take the opportunity of the COP twenty six conference to take advantage of it and have a message. Um, I am cob. I'm trying to follow up on what we spoke about the other day, uh, and I really appreciated the conversation. That was great, David. And I will be following up, but it's going to now take an outreach to a couple people to get their blessing to proceed in the way that I plan to in the next few days. And, um, you know, try to get people who will agree to appear on higher profile media outlets to give the message that isn't going to be the same message as Biden and Kerry. It's going to be that the United States in the Democratic Party is not adequately adhering to what the science demands at this moment in history. And we got to take advantage of this conference to try to, you know, knock this sense into the American public, the voting public, Democratic Party base. And here's the stupidity of it is. You know what they're doing in 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 Saudi Arabia, in in uh, and um, UAE and Morocco. They they know that the game is going to be up on fossil fuel production that has been the source of phenomenal wealth. Well, they have a lot of wealth, and what are they investing it in? They're investing it in in the creation of renewable energy systems. A new what? In, in some renewable energy systems, right? And they're ahead of us on it. Just like in high-speed rail, where there's zero miles of operating high-speed rail, a cell is a joke, okay? Um, whereas, you know, everybody knows that the China built an entire national system after 2008 of high-speed rail across the whole, and it, it's even, I think it's basically profitable. I, I bought uh, uh, an electric bone saw that was made in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're great, yeah. And here's the crazy thing, of course, all the new all the new um, research breakthroughs are taking place uh, at universities in the United States and the United States consumer market will be as early a consumer market will exist for the implementation of renewable energy systems, but they won't be done here. They won't be developed here. You won't have massive wind from it. Did Biden go big with wind today. Yeah, he might have. Wind is, wind is one thing, but yeah. Isn't that isn't that huge? Yeah, but we should we should just we should we should really drive it. And we're not. We're not doing anything along the lines of what we need to. And one of the reasons is because we're continuing to fund our fossil fuel industry. What are the protests going to be like? Is this going to be like the WTO? No, I don't think so. Well, probably largely because of COVID. No, it's a real it's a real lefty city, you know. As a, you know, could, it could produce something like Seattle did in 99 and stupidly placed that kind of WTO meeting in Seattle. Um, but uh, who knows? We shall find that out. OK. Professor- of course, of course, if they tried to interview any of the protesters, they wouldn't. They'd have to have subtitles for the <laughs> for the Glaswegian accent. Yes. <laughs> Professor. Great, great red city, though. Really lefty yeah. city. Professor Harvey J.K., let's talk about what I consider the most important issue for the next two weeks, three weeks, Build Back Better. You know, I, the, what, the, uh, the climate summit is next month, correct? Uh, yeah, it starts top of the month, yeah. Right. Uh, Biden is meeting with the Pope this week. Is he going to be at the summit or is that just John Kerry? I'm not sure with Biden. I think he'll be there at one point. The Pope, Nancy Pelosi is meeting the Pope. Chuck Schumer, I don't think he's he's not Catholic, <laughs> right? He went to the same high school as Bernie Sanders. Schumer's not a Catholic, I take it. Right. So he's not going to go meet the Pope. Uh, 
Wait, yeah, did Biden go to go to like a boys' school, a Catholic boys' school kind of thing? I think so. He, maybe he maybe it's gonna to... maybe it's gonna put in for uh, a payoff to not not name names of in the priesthood. But Biden was the starting quarterback in high school. Was he? I think so. Mm-hmm. So, Professor Harvey J.K., are you? seeing anything that makes you optimistic about the most important piece of legislation since what? Medicare? Since the only thing that has made me, the word optimism doesn't apply. The only thing that's made me hopeful to see something is when I hear about the fact that they can take a 10-year plan and turn it into a five-year plan. Because then, then I'm reminded of Stalin's Russia, and it's got to be a success then. <laughs> his, his, his plans, didn't like if, if his plans were fulfilled within four years instead of five, he would get upset. It was, right? Those five-year plans were supposed to... He would kill people if the plans well, came. Well, I think in. about the only one of their five-year plans that worked was what they did to the Ukrainians during the uh, famine. Right. Right. Well, it depends on the definition of works. I mean, they 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 industrialized very rapidly. Yeah. And you have to, to acknowledge that, I think. Right. So, no, are you... really seriously, I mean, I've you know, I've heard talk. Alan and I happen to have had a conversation today where I was utterly empty of any hope and he gave me hope because he's fighting the good fight and i have confidence that he <laughs> will prevail. Right. god am i going to disappoint you here <laughs> I mean, no, seriously I, I mean the only the only op- i say that i don't like the word optimism because the only time i've heard uh, seeing a sign of hope is this sort of sense that they're going to come out with this five-year plan that they're going to just slice it into five years and get it through and then once you start a government program, it's didn't Ronald Reagan say the only proof that oh. there's you want immortality, become a government program or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, especially if if look, if they just go in and start picking out things to throw out to reduce the amount, then forget it. It's a, yeah, things will happen, but it will it will not be good for the Democrats if that's what they do, because it means that it just won't have the impact. They've got to make an impact. Look, thinking specifically politically, just only politically, yeah. they have got to make an impact that make people aware of the fact that government can do well and empower people. That's all. Yeah, not only that, simply put, they're fucked if, they, if the progressives come out of it unhappy. We're the most motivated base of the party and um, and, you know, what Marianne was saying uh, last hour, it's not like it doesn't resonate with a lot of progressive Democrats. And uh, if they're P- if progressives are left feeling like, you know, and Bernie that, you know, Bernie looks pathetic, that he's been betrayed and he's still trying to sell us on it. That's not going to produce a lot of turnout in 2022. So, How incredible uh, is it? Because I, I read I think it's Warner, Senator Warner from Virginia. Mm-hmm saying, well, let's, Nancy Pelosi, vote on the infrastructure bill. Let's prove that we can govern, that we can get something done. And how incredible is it that that infrastructure bill, bipartisan, is being held up? I mean, that's a, has that happened before with with the progressive wing saying, but it's happened, but in modern, you know, recently. Where the progressives are going, no, we're going to kill your bill unless you give us this. I've has that happened in my lifetime? No, that, that was the strongest show of force by progressives inside yeah. the U.S. Congress in a long time. And once you taste blood, you get an appetite for it, don't you, Professor K? Does isn't yeah? That- yeah, look, I, I heard Ro Khanna and others talk about their willingness to compromise a couple of months and even just weeks ago. Okay. But I think, in fact, that I think the longer this goes on, the less likely they are to compromise. And I th- and so, because before each one of them had their own particular issue that they might well have given away a little bit here or there, or were willing to see some other issue 
you know, be pushed to the side. But I, I think right now that they're, they're holding, they're holding firm. I mean, honestly, I don't know how they're going to get around all this, the Democrats, because I had this conversation with Alan off and on during the last few weeks. Manchin, you know, I think he'll budge sooner than cinema. I don't because I don't think anyone has her figured out unless you guys do. She's apparently in France right now, by the way. Cinema? Getting, yeah, getting money. She's getting money in France? Yeah, claiming from expatriates. Yep. She's the money launderer. Yeah. <laughs> For Le Pen. Well, Elaine Olin, who used to do this show all the time until she listened to it and realized what she was. <laughs> He's a great yeah. Oh, Helen. Um, Elaine Olin. Elaine, yes, right. I was wondering where she, she's been. I saw a column of hers recently, but you're right. She's she's writing for the Washington Post. Anyway, uh, I'm going to reach out to her uh, five more times and try to get her on. She said, I think she quoted Orwell or Lenin, who said, one of them said, things happen very slowly until they start happening very quickly. Right? Yeah. That's I don't it. know who said that. Right. Yeah. But it's, it's true that things happen slowly or, or something, brain isn't working today. But we're, is it possible that we're seeing something in the Democratic Party that's happening very slowly? <laughs> and then, boom, it's going to happen like the, the entire, like the way the Soviet Union fell. It started very slowly, and then the whole thing came crumbling down. Is it conceivable? You're executive director of the Progressive Democrats of America. Yeah, I, I, look, I don't think so. I mean, I'm not sure what you're riffing off of. I mean, the collapse of the United States. No, 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 no. no. The, collapse, the collapse of Steny Hoyer, Clyburn, Pelosi, and the progressives taking over the Democratic Party. Look, I think one of the problems is that, and this is where I'd love to talk to Marianne more because I think she, she makes some very strong points. This is the way I look at it. And I, I don't, I, we don't have a lot of time left in the interview, but okay, this and Harvey may, I don't think I've ever laid this out for Harvey. I said it on a Jacobin radio show last can, week. We have time. Here, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's only 9.50. It's not only 9.52 here. Yeah, well, um, um, okay. If you looked right now at, the progressive policy positions, and you looked at the Trumpians, and then what was the bipartisan consensus on domestic policy until Bernie and Trump arrived? Now, you can argue that Trump really doesn't break with it. It's more on the level of, um, I don't know what to make of Trumpian policy, a little bit of a break on trade matters, but other than that, almost no break on the core issues. But if you actually help, because he does appeal to a base on these emotional white supremacist issues, right? You have these now three competing ideologies as opposed to the appearance of two. Well, the Trumpians and the Bernie people would have a lot of support. The middle would have almost no support. If you laid out now what the Romney wing of the Republican Party to the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party stands for and represents, here's the catch. And Adnan, I know you're, uh, oh, Andy Brown says I'm evading questions. God bless you, Andy Brown. I love you. Um, and um, here's something for you, Andy. Try to chew on this for a while, okay? Is who owns the means of production? All of the ownership of the means of production. I mean, some of it's on the far right. Almost none of it's on the Bernie left, a little bit. But almost all of it is in the neoliberal center, okay? That's what cinema was banking on. She was going to become the new champion of the neoliberal center, somehow in Arizona, maybe the sort of socially progressive wing of it. And it probably is a good bet. If you look at where ownership and control and power is in American society, it's not with the Sanders left and it's not really on the Trumpian right. It's in the neoliberal center. Uh, but it's a big, um, uh, you know, it, it's there. They don't have a popular ideology. So they'll try to probably sort of try to finesse their way into the, uh, the, the right wing of the Bernie left, so to speak. And they'll try to um, sort of mitigate the, the Trumpian right. There, of course, I actually think they probably have more sympathy ultimately with the Trumpian right. You know, they really don't want to see democracy and the rabble have power. Yeah. You know, so that's that's where real danger lies in terms of the republic. But it doesn't mean we don't push forward from the left. I think we got to really push forward from the left. Professor Kay. Yeah, you... that, that, that makes clear sense. Look, in 
in 2015, there was there was polling done. And it's funny, this one poll should have been the poll that guided the media, but they ignored it other than to respond to it in fear. And that was when Americans were asked, what 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 did they want? What what, what did they need? The response, and this was in the poll, essentially, they wanted radical change. That was a generic term as it was used, radical change. The two candidates actually were Bernie and Trump, representing that kind of ambition, aspiration, and hope. Um, the Democrats effectively contained that radical impulse. Okay, they, they, it had already been, if you like, manipulated the Democratic Party in such a way that Clinton was, you know, she was the heir apparent. In the Republican side, the mistake they made is they had too many people running. Right. right. You remember, there was like a clown car up on the stage. Mm -hmm. So Trump, they couldn't block Trump because once they got once he was on stage, he, he just stole the show. Right. Right. Now, if there were backroom deals that could be made in 2015, but we're in the age of the primary, then Trump would never have made it through. OK. And so, OK. So, in fact, the neoliberal center held for the Democratic Party. It didn't hold in the case of the, of the Republican Party, except that in the end it did prevail because Trump just basically became everything he had pointed his finger at, which probably was predictable. OK, and he really didn't have any policies. He said he was going to he was going to address infrastructure. That didn't happen other than the effort to build a wall between the United States and Mexico. Right. <laughs> he was pointing fingers at bankers and everybody else. And what did they do within? I was it within one year. They passed the trillion dollar giveaway to mm -hmm. bankers and other, you know, capitalist rich. I mean, so it was kind of perverse. The weirdest part is, is that he somehow continues to prevail. Uh, that's the thing that it, that's well, that, has to, that, that, that has to do with the fact that the Republicans were always playing with fire with uh, look, you can see now in the rear view mirror, especially when it comes to domestic policy, that there was very little difference. People are going to maybe even in this crowd, they'll hate me saying it between Bush and Obama, George W. and Obama. And um, and um, so uh, mean, domestic policy, Obamacare, yeah. I think maybe that was a giveaway to the health insurance. Yeah. Yeah. So so um, um, I mean, you can just see it in the transition with the financial crash of the way it was handled between Geithner and, and Paulson. Right. Yeah, it was total continuity. And um, so um, um, the. Uh, Trumpians, though, so there's this devil's bargain. The Republicans are always playing, you know, gun rights, abortion, evangelical Christian stuff. I mean, look, at no one believes George H.W. Bush gave a shit about Jesus Christ or evangelical Christianity, the first Bush. Yeah. Somehow his son then. So his son is this guy who sort of is able to carry along the Reagan base of evangelicals. Reagan was a facade when it came to that stuff as well. Oh, yeah, and, for sure. Yeah. And and. um uh, you know, and he might just have been confused and addled enough son of George H.W. Bush to really believe that crap. And um, so he um, he carries that along. It's a devil's bargain. And eventually they're looking out there and they they see they keep winning court seats and they don't do anything on abortion. And they also see the middle of the country where Republicans are holding power completely in decline. And they get you get to Trump, you know, but the thing about Trump versus Bernie, that doesn't threaten capital. Right. Right. Interesting. And, and, and not only that, but, but to get this is a little bit, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit distracted by something for which I truly apologize, David. But is the, the, the thing about the, the thing about the ownership is that of baseball, the, no comment. The, the, it's a brilliant fucking game. It was zero, zero through five. And now it's one, nothing for the Brooklyn Dodgers over the New York Giants. So um, the um, uh, oh, wait, now I'm interested. Uh, now I'm um, By the way, I, I, I kept calling it October 13th and it's October 14th. So you just. <laughs> and I was right, by the way, I was wrong again. I'm at a font of misinformation. So maybe actually we all own the means of production. OK, so um, uh, the uh, no, Joe Biden was not a quarterback. He was a star halfback at Archmere Catholic School in 
in Delaware. I think the family moved to Delaware by that point. So anyway, um, the, if, you own, if you don't own the means of production in a capitalist society, in a society where the state having you know, direct, um, basically competitive operations against business has not really been in place since practically Roosevelt, right? Um, how do you proceed as a left in that case when you're up against all of capital? And that's right. the, that really is the core challenge of, of the Sanders progressive movement. And um, you'll see how it plays out. But even as Professor Kay pointed out when we first talked about the infrastructure bill, the government isn't doing the hiring in Build Back Better. Not build, but not in the not in the first half. They would be on the Civilian Conservation Corps, and How then much? there's it's very small. I agree, but at least it's established. At least they're established. But, but we're right? in order for us to have a threat to the people who own the means of production. As you just pointed out, the government has to hire people. You know, you build out the post office. You build, the, all these infrastructure bills, as Professor Harvey J.K. pointed out when we first started talking about infrastructure, goes to contractors who are hired. These are not, it, it, it's, it's the government subsidizing private enterprise once again. So. The government has to start hiring more people. More people have to be working for the government in order to to keep capitalism. Uh, I, capitalism. Well, the, government, the governmental sector in the United States is very significant. It's, it's, it's large. I mean, you take public schools, the post office, you take public universities. These are technically, you know, people who are employed by the state. And then... Um, um, and then you have uh, the army and the military, of course, which is huge, and the police and the prison guards and the fire people and all this. It's not an insignificant segment. What, what, what means that the percentage of government expenditure rises up to the level of social democratic countries is, of course, the military that, that, that makes that gap. Which and so, takes, yeah. Takes. Here, 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 just as a sidebar to what David's saying, yeah. we all know about military contracting, and we know. Yeah. What a ripoff. I mean, besides the money going in anyhow, how much of it is basically just ripped off by defense contract? We just know it. So my biggest fear in this arrangement now would be that, indeed, the, the big in, the big engineering and, and um, industrial firms are that they, they must be. I mean, they're going to be the ones who get the contracts. Right. Right. Well, but the, the, the thing, the strategy, the Sanders strategy now is to sort of reinvigorate social democracy. And if you want to take it further to socialism, you know, you look at the Jacobin people who are the people who argue over at that magazine site or on their podcast, the argument is to support the advances of social democracy, support unionism, and then to build off of that platform towards socialism in the United States, which would go well beyond anything we've seen in the United States. Yeah. Well, oh, by the way, and that's, a, that, that's exactly the position I, I hold. My, right. my concern right now is yeah. that 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 Bernie has become the voice of the of these of these endeavors. OK, but I but I just have yet to see the degree to which these endeavors will lead to the kind of social democracy that either Bernie or I or my Jacobin friends are in, are envisioning, because, look. The beginning of Social Security was under Bismarck in Germany, okay? Didn't make it right. social democratic. Right. Okay. Yeah. I go back to my argument, no labor, no democracy. Well, that's part of the invigoration, reinvigoration of a social democratic contract and it breaks yeah. the neoliberalism. One of right. the tenets, central tenets of neoliberalism is the weakening of labor. Yeah, I know, right, absolutely, right. How, how do we make it so the right the Ayn Randians cannot state axiomatically that government doesn't create jobs. This is something you watch Sean Hannity and it's just received wisdom from heaven above. The government doesn't create jobs. Well, prove them wrong. Create actual jobs in the government. Create government jobs, more government, jo real jobs, not the army, not the police. Not not uh, 
prison well, guard. Here's what, here's what I think, and because Alan's not, right, not about, the right, Alan's right about public yeah. employment is huge. The question is to create public employment in such a way that one, it brings it brings folks together who are currently divided. I've said this over and over again. And the other thing is, is that the public employment literally be seen as transforming the landscape and people's lives for the better. Because what we have right now is a lot of public employment, which is basically maintenance. It's maintenance. We don't see the transformation, which is why, by the way, the, the infrastructure bill, the 1.5 or whatever amount that is, that is fundamental. Don't for a moment discount that. It may well be misguided regarding the climate and everything else, but that kind of, of, of activity, infrastructure building, that is, that is imperative if you want to prove that, that, that public initiatives are what we need. I, I mean that. How much of the New Deal, Professor Kay, when, when they were building like the TVA, the Tennessee Valley. Yeah. Was, was that, that started under Roosevelt or Hoover? Oh God, Roosevelt. <laughs> Absolutely. Because I know Hoover Dam was yeah, that, started under Hoover, yeah, but got finished yeah. under. Right. So um, were these built by government employees or yes. by private contractors? No, these were, the, my, the TVA was public employment. As, oh, as my uh, recollection, one, I can one. tell you this: the, the one, the one major agency that was contract was the PWA, the Public Works Administration, and they did huge projects through, by contracting. But it took. The, but by the way, because of the que they did not want to ever be accused of corruption. Harold Ickes was the. Uh, was the Secretary of the Interior and the head of the PWA. It took two years to get the PWA going. And, it and by the way, it was an incredibly clean and honest agency. I mean, incredibly clean. I mean, keep in mind, these are all done with contracts. And um, if, if, I mean, how long will it take to get, this is a question I'm throwing to, to Alan, it's not a rhetorical question. How long will it take to get things going now that we've spent almost, well, three quarters of a year trying to figure out if we can even do anything, how What's much, already? how fast can they what do it? Ready, as they said, when the um, stimulus. Yeah, uh, well, you know, shovel ready was WP, well, WPA, which wasn't even created until 1935. The best, at the outset, they created something called the, um, the FVRA, the um, Federal Emergency Relief act an agency. And then they did the CWA, the Civil Works Administration. And by the way, that put people to work almost immediately right. on doing some really essential and basic kinds of construction work. But for something much bigger, the really big endeavors, you've got to have plans. You can't just put people to work. Right. Okay. You need architectural engineers. You, I mean, you have to environmental, you know, uh, practices clearance. It's going to take that. See what, that's what I mean, Alan, by this. This is yeah. just taking so long. Yeah, well, it, this isn't taking that long, but it's taking too long. And it's, uh, um, I mean, it would have been nice if it was done last month. Um, it would have been nice if it was done six months ago. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Once upon a time, we had talked to the hundred, first hundred days. The, the Civilian well, the, the, the Climate relief, the relief Act, The two components of the Relief Act were very helpful and they were good that you included, included in that was the 250 or $300 per child. And that was very good. Oh, um, absolutely. Uh, undeniably. It's running out soon, by the way. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, 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 it's set to be re, re, re up for a few years in the, in the reconciliation bill. Yeah. How do you, we, we should get, get, get that through. Yeah. How do we, this will be my last question. Mm -hmm. How do you run against corporate America? We have corporatists controlling the democratic party, but in terms of messaging, does it still, <laughs> there we go. I have I was tweeting this for years. I said, Democrats, you want to win? Start putting your finger in the air and point and then use it to point out who the enemy is. Point up the finger. Yeah. yeah. 
Is that a winning message? Whenever you yes. hear. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That oh. That's partly how Trump won. Go on. He, he won in Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin because he was giving the finger to the corporate neoliberal, the corporations and the neoliberals. Now, in the end, as I said, <laughs> it was a different story when he became president. But, yeah, he appealed. Absolutely. And the very same folks who voted for Trump might well, if they had the opportunity, have voted for Bernie. I've lived in the upper Midwest a long time and I know it's a fact. Yeah, I mean, yes, I agree that some of there, yes, that has to be given, the finger has to be flipped off at certain people. At the very same time, the Democratic Party, in contrast to what Trump can do, I, by the way, I think very good, um, I am going to not be able to cite this well, Doug Henwood wrote a very good article in a Jacobin hard copy edition two magazines ago yeah, about yeah. who are the Republican financial base. And he talks about basically the country club culture in all the different metropolitan areas across the country, from Boise, Idaho, to Cincinnati, to St. Louis, Kansas City. And apparently this was built off of work of somebody who did also publish in the Atlantic. So it's probably liberal sociology. Um, But, you know, it, it does make a good point. I think that those guys always were okay with Trump. They knew that Trump wouldn't challenge them. So Trump's big finger in the air wasn't a threat to them. Bernie's big finger in the air would be a big threat to them. And he wasn't campaigning with that threat. I think he was campaigning with big finger to the people who are not paying taxes and refuse to pay taxes, big finger to the corporations that don't pay taxes. But the vision is of a prosperous middle class society that is inclusive, uh, the multiracial working class, lifting it up, a positive message. Um, And the, the fuck you is only to those forces that refuse what is basically incremental taxation, incremental regulation at this point. And that's the social democratic message. But I do think that he was wary of putting the big middle finger up to the whole system because he'd get crushed and they would take him seriously. That was my take on his strategy. And I think that's a pretty good strategy. Right. And so Bernie couldn't run with his finger towards corporate America because he didn't have, through no fault of his own, a, an infrastructure politically to back him up in the Democratic Party. He was an interloper. So with yeah. AOC, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, uh, Jamal Bowman, Richie Torres, uh, uh, Cory Bush, um, and uh, Pramila Jayapal and Katie Porter. And possi- and Mark Pocan seems. I've heard bad things about Mark Pocan. Yeah, I, did, if you saw my face, I sort of, you know. Right, right. I throw in Jamie Rask and Jim McGovern. There are a few other people and a few older fellow travelers who can come along from the, from the base of the Democratic Party who were gonna, are going to be able to lean a little bit more left. But you're talking about 30 Democrats, and the first people you listed are in very poor uh, yeah. urban core districts. Right. Massive. Uh, it, uh, sometimes the the they're packed in because of gerrymandering in the states and so on, and it, it has to expand out to other districts to threaten capital. Right. Right. There's is Maxine Waters still? Yeah, she she could. I mean, I know that a lot of people will will think it's inappropriate to include her in that group, but yeah, I think so. So is an infrastructure. I mean, she's such an old she's such an old hand that, you know, you just living inside that system for so long. Banking, House Banking Committee, I believe. Or House Finance. Right. So is an infrastructure getting into place so that God willing, the next Bernie comes along. He can really or she can go at it and get some backup. He was really. Professor K, wasn't he just by himself in 2020? 16. 2020, in the, in, in the primaries, there was nobody, they were gonna do to him what Tip O'Neill and, and 
uh, Teddy Kennedy did did to Carter, and rightfully so. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, Alan might disagree with me on this, but yeah, and you saw it right on the stage when Warren tried to knife him in the back rhetorically. That, yeah. That's be, be, if you couldn't. I don't if, disagree with that. If if Elizabeth Warren was not going to ally with Bernie Sanders in public, that shows you how alone Bernie was. Yeah. 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 And uh, and um, but he was winning and they had to pull the bullshit they pulled out for South Carolina. Yeah. He got closer to winning this time than he did the first time, even though he did. He, he did better the first time, but he came closer to winning the second. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Right. Well, he wasn't running against as many people in 2016. Right. Right. Would. If we were holding the election now and not last year, has the left scared the Clyburns, the Obama? Well, we saw it with Nina Turner. No. Yeah. Well, mm. yeah, you know, what was this pact that was created in the last few weeks? Did you take note of that? Which this one? Centrist Democratic Political Action Committee. There, so they can literally go to go to work on countering any kind of left primarying of their sure. I, that, it hit the, i think it was new york Times. it just came up and then it didn't get a lot of attention I, like what it was like a godheimer type yeah but i think climber like Clyburn may well have you know given his endorsement to this whole thing i i just it came by and left and, and i didn't see any kind of further discussion so i i don't know we're saying a tectonic shift in the Democratic Party. Alan, Clyburn is 80, so. Pelosi is 80, Steny Hoyer is 80. Uh, well, here, they've already got Jeffries lined up to be the next speaker in their minds, right? Yeah, and he's a, he's a lapdog to Wall Street. I yeah. didn't say that publicly. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think I think the problem is... is um, Camilla, the, is, she, is she? How? how, how she, she's good. She's really good. Jeffries is a world of difference from Pramila Jayapal. He's bad. She's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing is, um, uh, okay, the young people in America right now, if you had 45 and under voting, Bernie would win in a huge landslide. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, but but the question is that generation grows older is can the left and the progressive left deliver on the prosperous middle class society that they want to see in America? And that's tricky because the left doesn't control the means of production or have much right. capital. They, we have to use persuasion and and then slowly, you know, not slowly, hopefully rather rapidly, actually. And this can be done pretty quickly with good social policy, start to put more wealth into the hands of the general population away from just the elites and then have that upcoming generation um, understand that they're operating within a much stricter tax and progressive tax structure with tighter regulations, uh, pro-labor, strong unions. That's the world they're going to operate, and that's what's going to be built off of it. And then, then if you want to go beyond that without having any kind of revolution, you have uh, within the policy, the left party also facilitates, uh, you know, um, uh, structures that can allow for the development of socialism within that context. Professor K. Oh, go. You were going to say something, Professor. Yeah, because uh, I, I was thinking about, I was thinking about, just how much, how much does it take to make a billionaire happen? Yeah. And I, you know, because when you think about it, like, what was Mansion fighting over, like, you know, twenty five versus twenty eight percent? Some. I mean, there were these percentage numbers that they were throwing around for a while about taxing to pay for this or that. And I was thinking, you know, give me a. And, and it was going to be on a certain, you know, uh, level of income. And I think just how much does it take to make those people happy? In which case, you know, it was good that Bernie put the word billionaire into the into political play. And well, right now, don't forget, that, Harvey, there's a race not just to go to the moon. Right. But, you know, to just have the really colonized space for the mega wealthy. Yeah. And the race to be the first trillionaire. How exciting is that? We can all root for our favorite billionaires, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> why so i was cocktail party talk who do you want to be the first trillionaire <laughs> uh Elon, bill you know bezos yeah um, right yeah. so i was going to ask a question about demagoguery and yeah. i'm thinking of january 6th the ellipse 
and all the fiery rhetoric that we heard on January 6th coming from Mo Brooks, Rudy Giuliani, and Donald Trump. What if you had a rally outside the Capitol that didn't call for violence towards anybody, but we had demagogues screaming about the, the billionaires and we have to take their money we legally have to you know what would happen your old friend john stewart would hold a counter rally to say calm down calm yeah. down yeah yeah there we go yeah. we know what i'm referring to if you know oh yeah that was well, hell. it was you know people you know there's an interview with john stewart in uh, the new yorker that is just word salad and david remnick is just salivating over John yeah. Stewart, who doesn't have an original thought, he just spits back things he saw Bill Moyers or Michael Moore say, and he, you know, it's performative. And when you actually read what John Stewart uh, says, you see why he fought the Writers Guild. He resents writers because they have skills he sorely lacks. Right. Yeah. He relies on performative hogwash punctuated by the F word. He goes on Stephen Colbert and just screams the F word with abandon because he needs writers. And yes, he completely missed the boat. Thank you for mentioning that. Glenn Beck held a rally. John Stewart holds a rally telling people, be nice, civility. That's it, Call yep. For civility. And then the next year we had Occupy the next year it was uh, he completely missed occupy because he's not he right. doesn't want civility the people who want civility want you to shut up and not unionize that's so right complete and utter fraud john stewart so if there were a demagogue who uh who stood and screamed at the wealthy and said, I'm not calling for a revolution. I'm calling for a redistribution of wealth that is identical but antithetical to what has been going on for the past 50 years. It's going to go from the top down instead of the bottom up. We're just going to rewrite the tax codes and take their money. And you get. Well, that Bernie, Bernie came close. Bernie but came he came very close to that class warfare. He he was not willing to wage. Yeah, he he didn't take. The, he wanted to tax the billionaires in favor of public initiatives. But what about total demonization of these people? The same way they demonize the Haitians, the you know the richest one percent. They demonize black yeah. people. Haitians, are, why can't we find somebody on our side that demonize, truly demonizes demons? I got to tell you, David, I said this last week. I think every show now is going to roll around to the same point. I'm talking about it, man. Guillotine lapels. You need some guillotine lapels. <laughs> and you know what? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about violence. It just, I'm just raw hate. Violent tax code. A violent. Tax. Well, I'm all for a violent tax code. Yeah, that I like. Where you know you get people revved up about bills, you know, instead of an insurrection, you know, instead of screaming, I mean, "This is trial by combat," we are the pen. We are going to this pen is going to steal all the money from Jeff Bezos. I'm going to sign legislation that will take his ill-gotten gains. That's demagoguery. Yeah. But if you look here, here's I, I, I'm, I'm not. This is not. In, I'm thinking around what you're saying. OK, Roosevelt. I mean, so you it. brought up Occupy Black Lives Matter. The point is be, because there, uh, there's it's all, you know, the turnout at Occupy was significant. The turnout in Black Lives Matter was extraordinary. OK, but and I don't mean to, you know, write it off, but. I don't think it came to much. Occupy. I know Occupy didn't come to much. 
And I think, uh, uh, and I think, I mean, yeah, yeah. Gay, culturally it did. Culturally it did. Right. But, but you, it, if it's not turned into legislation, it ultimately becomes something for television talk shows alone. Right. right. Okay. Is and it, for, yeah. for TV movies. Sorry, Alan, what were we going to say? Well, first of all, this guy Webb is just pitching a masterpiece for the Giants. Um, but anyway, um, the. I wish, um, I wish I could watch baseball. It's but, a, but um, you know, um, you're talking about uh, Occupy and Guy Hayes in the chat talked about, you know, the classic idea of, okay, yes, Minsky saying this thing about they own the means of production. Well, we own the means of labor. I think that was Hayes, it might have been some, or Joe H. I'm not sure who it was. Anyway, somebody made that point. And yes, of course. And Harvey makes that point, and I agree with it every week. The old strategy of you know bringing our labor power to bear is 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 unrivaled. You know, we can shut this shit down. Okay. And one of the problems with that right now is we probably have to stockpile a good amount of food because the supply chains would break very rapidly. Yeah. One yeah, of us grow right. our own food. Right. <laughs> but you know, nothing, nothing is it a but, winning message politically? Because Alan Minsky, your executive director of the Progressive Democrats, Harvey J.K., Professor K. has written extensively about FDR. Was FDR a demagogue? Not in the Huey Long tradition, but was he a demagogue? Isn't a certain amount of demagoguery valuable? I mean, I think, I don't know. I mean, Harvey, of course, knows this better than I do. I mean, the only, the only point of potential accusation of demagoguery I get around FDR is is the, you know, going past the second term and how that played out. But, you know, that was under the crisis of the global, the global crisis. The economic royalists hate me and no, I love No, no, no. But the thing is, he's, he's using, but he's also using the instruments of his time to fight for the things he wants. Yeah, right, and then there's right. the stacking of the Supreme Court. That, that's the other point where he gets accused of that. But other than that, I think he's, I think this is one of the points Harvey makes so well. And in contrast to Biden, you got to use your instruments at your disposal to win the argument that you're making for the public policy that you think the society needs and that you've been elected to achieve. And the Democratic Party doesn't do that and doesn't do that because, it, you know, it is everything that, while I don't quite endorse the strategy Marianne is, in, is, is outlining in the hour before, the uh, clear contradictions within the Democratic Party and the sort of bullshit populist poses they take sometimes when clearly, you know, Robert Rubin says to Bill Clinton after he wins the 92 election, Hey, none of that holds. That's not the world that we live in now. Finance capital runs the name. And he's like, oh, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry, uh, that was for that was for Professor K and I went on a big to, so your floor, Harvey. You had, no, no, I, 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 he had his, I mean, FDR, look, FDR had one really big advantage. The corporate bosses of the day, I mean the, the billionaire counterparts of the 30s came after him publicly. They declared war on Roosevelt. And that was that was a, on their part, a huge mistake. OK, and the, and they and they, they were stupid. They, they Well, they were rich. They could be stupid if they wanted to be. But look, in 34, the Democrats romped in the midterm elections Which because happened. And that and that's what the, that's what and the, my whole point over and over again is you have got you have got to trust your fellow citizens. You've got to initiate programs that not only feed people, okay, as in the American Rescue Plan, but begin to empower people, which is why I think I said last week or recently, it, it's a fantasy to have imagined it, but the PRO Act should have been the first thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, you know, you raise a, a, a question how can a billionaire want more money? And, yeah, yeah. and there is right and there is wrong. I think of kindergarten. What do you teach in kindergarten? Would you ever say to a group of kindergartners that Jeff Bezos is, a, is who you should aspire to be because he has a billion dollars, but that's not enough for him so he's hoarding all the toys and he's going to be a trillionaire while other people on the backs of his employees it's basic kindergarten stuff 
In kindergarten, Jeff Bezos is the devil, is the devil. It's, it's just basic. And I don't understand why we can't galvanize the American people using the basic building blocks of this country. Unions are good. If you fought, if you fight the unions, you are bad. You're John Stewart, bad guy. You're against <laughs> unions, you're bad. Well, it's complicated. It's only complicated because as Upton Sinclair said, your salary depends upon it being complicated. But you go back to kindergarten, mother effer, you fight a union, you're a bad person. It's black and white. If a billion dollars isn't enough for you, you're bad. You are not worthy of respect. You don't dignify somebody who says we have to cut food stamps. Wrong, bad, evil. Why can't the Democrats simple? Well, because you have Nancy Pelosi, who's worth $200 million and is going off and meeting with the Pope. And this might be the only Pope who's going to say, why the hell do you have $200 million, bitch? That's, well, that's <laughs> well, my that would day. be great. <laughs> hell, but. We could get that on tape. Even if it's in Italian, it doesn't matter. Pell can get away. And by the way, what, you know, Professor Ann Lee was talking about Dave Chappelle. You know, the other component about this controversy is class. He is a multimillionaire who makes fun of poor white people. And that there's something delightful about that. But he's not on the side of the poor. He supported Andrew Yang who is not, Dave Chappelle is not an ally of the 99%. Yeah, he was, so, he was, in, he was in Iowa campaigning for Yang. So if you go after- He was the yin and the yang, huh? He's the yin and the yang. If you're going after transgender people, it belies a hatred for the entire 99%. He, he's just telling you that he doesn't, that he wants to make the the transgender people uncomfortable. You know, he took the Chappelle show off Netflix and said he didn't get paid properly and demanded that uh, he won't do a special. He held the Chappelle show hostage to Netflix unless he got reimbursed properly. Uh, I didn't hear anything about the other people who were a part of the Chappelle show. He got his tribute. I'm just curious, maybe he did it quietly, but he doesn't do things quietly. The transgender person who committed suicide because of him, not because of Twitter, if you watch the special, he publicly declares that he set up a trust fund for the transgender comedian's child. You know, that, you know you're supposed to do that kind of stuff privately, unless you're building a defense case unless you unless you know that you're responsible for that woman committing suicide Dave you watch the special he knows subconsciously that it wasn't the Twitter mob that caused that woman the transgender person to commit suicide the only was, two comedians I pay attention to Chappelle you, you and Fugel sang otherwise I don't care yeah <laughs> Chappelle's, Chappelle's important. No, nah, I, I when I hear his name, I, I I I don't want to know. What I worry about primarily about this right now is I think this is also an effort to to and it's being used very well by the right wing to to bury the left, to characterize the left as shutting down free speech, which is utter bullshit. You know, we're not shutting down any free speech. Yeah. We have the power to shut down free speech. If we had the power, we wouldn't shut down any free speech. Nobody's saying, you see, Chappelle's brittle. Nobody's saying, some people are saying he should be pulled from Netflix. I'm not saying that, but people, you know, there's free speech. People have every right to say, get, it's free speech. He said he used free speech to enable people to beat up on transgender people. There's no reason we can't use free speech to criticize them into oblivion. 
that's the sure. beauty yeah. of free speech. Uh, yeah, but again, the uh, yeah, I'm not arguing anything about that. I'm just saying I think the right wing is using this to so try to and, and right too, too much of the too much of the left is taking the bait. I, I say the right wing and the left wing. You think we're vicious on the cancel culture? Wait till you watch us wage class warfare. We'll show you what. <laughs> we'll show you. Yeah. This is where we have to go. We, we sharpened our knives with the cancel culture. Now let's use our viciousness. They, they, they think we're vicious. Let's show them how we rewrite the tax code. Ah, I love that. There we go. Warfare. Yeah. I like the pen over the guillotine too, but only when you argue for the pen over the guillotine, specifically those terms. I, I'm saying we need to be vicious towards people who who trivialize the plight of transgender people who are the most vulnerable in our community. Let's be vicious. Let's be as vicious as Dave Chappelle is, but let's also be vicious fighting class warfare and call it class warfare. Let's call it what it is. Because as Professor Harvey J.K. says, they've been waging class, right? They've been waging class warfare on us. But when we do it, we're vicious. Um, okay. End of seven one one. This is pretty much a baseball classic. By the way, John Stewart, that's how you uh, string together sentences in an <laughs> way without saying fuck. Yeah. yeah. You can yeah. you can actually put together sentences, John Stewart, that are angry and making a point without saying fuck perhaps you should think about hiring comedy writers and paying them uh union wages anyway uh if you if you see k on the feldman show <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm getting it i'm getting you are you are you are go walk the streets of new york find an open restaurant Thank you. Or okay, Th everybody, please buy. Take hold of our history right now. Go buy. Take hold of our history. Thank you. And thank you, Alan Minsky, Executive Director of Progressive Democrats of America. Uh, hey, follow us on Twitter. We're we're actually joining in some pretty heavy hardcore Twitter uh, Twitter uh, um, uh, solidarity with a whole bunch of great groups right now. So follow us on Twitter. Great. Follow PD and what America. is your Twitter handle? At PD America. PD America. At, and at, Henry, Henry Huckamacki has a big interview about Glasgow that we're going to run Monday. And we let's you were going to bring me some guests to talk about Glasgow. Is that correct? I will. I will try to do that. I will definitely try to do that. And um, um, Glasgow and the whole general issue around fossil fuel subsidies. I'd love to get somebody as lively as Cobb. And I don't think anybody I quite have in our orbit is his live one guy, but um, Randall Cobb from the Green Bay Packers. You want? No, no. David David enjoys talking with another David David Cobb from the oh. Green Party. I brought on uh, to the show one of the weeks you were off, and you know he's a he's a broad broad thinker. Of course, I disagree with him about the Green Party. We don't. Oh, I was going to make a bad joke. Let's wrap it up. Okay. Uh, Take care. Okay. It's See you honor. next week, guys. And Take honor. Care. It is an honor. By the way, I, Professor K would give me an A on, in the blue book. I don't think they fill out blue books. But did you notice how I kind of just spat back everything you said? Isn't that? Yeah, that makes no, no. Seriously speaking, you're you're soon to transcend me. I think. No, no, no. I, I was. But did you know that's that's what a good student does? You, you get an A by right. just repeating what the professor has taught you. Yeah, it's called an A for ass kissing. That's what they call it. Yeah. <laughs> Top of the eight, guys. Thank you. And and right. thank you, Soon. Professor. Seriously, yeah. thank you. And thank you, Alan, too. Thank you so much. Well, that's our show. Keep uh, your cards and letters to yourself, because I've been getting some, uh, you know, uh, I go after Bill Maher. I get angry letters. I don't know why anybody cares about Bill Maher. I go after Dave Chappelle. I understand why people are a little more protective of uh, Dave Chappelle, but uh, I stand by everything I, I said.
uh, to go after, to, to, to waste any of your time to mock the, uh, the people who are among the most vulnerable. Uh, you got kids? Is that what you teach your kids? You're a parent? And, the, you know, I, I, believe me, I think punching down is the funniest thing in the world. And I do it on this show sometimes. Uh, but I feel bad about it. And I certainly don't double down or triple down on it. You know, it's something ain't right. Uh, when the, the putative goat, greatest of all time comic, uh, so, you know, just not right. Ain't right to do that. Ain't right. It's wrong. It's really wrong. And uh, so much of what I see, uh, the Trump rallies, Jim Jordan, Gates, you know, you see this, you know, I was watching uh, Chappelle and I, like, I understand Chappelle because wrong is funny. That I get. So, you know, he's just, but he, he's crossed the line with the transgender people. When did we lose sight of right and wrong? These are no brainers. And the people with no brains are winning. That's our show. I want to thank all our guests. John Ross, follow him on Twitter at Fun With Friction. Uh, we, let's build our Twitter. I have a meager following on Twitter. So follow everybody. Follow Professor Harvey JK at Harvey JK on Twitter. Uh, PDA America, all our guests, follow them on Twitter. Twitter is uh, interesting. It's a good source of inf quick headlines. Uh, and uh, we're posting little two minute clips of the show on Twitter. We have a YouTube channel, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give us a like and a good review on YouTube, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Spotify, on Pandora, Google Play, wherever you're listening or watching this show. Uh, please hit the like button and give us a good review uh, and share this show with, uh, we're, I'm outnumbered. So, uh, and I, I'm getting my ass kicked tonight. So if you can share this show with your, uh, with people who you, we, this is a bizarre show. How long is it? it was six hours and 42 minutes. I'm out of my mind. I haven't had any sleep. This show is not for everybody. And, uh, so if you know people who, uh, would enjoy it, please, uh, please share it with them. Uh, we're outnumbered. We really are. So I need your help. Uh, so uh, anyway, thank you to the great Johnny Ross. Thank you to Ethan Hershenfeld. Go watch his special on YouTube, Thug Thug Jew. Nobody funnier than Ethan. And of course, his dad, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld, Freudian psycho analyst and then Emil Guillermo follow him on Twitter watch his show he does a streaming show Emil Amuck and then the great Barry W Lynn the Reverend Barry W Lynn go to Barry W Lynn dot com I'm not sure about that but follow him on Twitter at Barry W Lynn and then of course Professor Mary Ann Cummings Razor Girl I believe on Twitter Professor Ann Lee, Professor Jonathan Bick, Professor Harvey J.K., and Alan Minsky. I think I named everybody. I forgot Mark Breslin last time. Office hours, 8 p.m., Friday night. Every Friday night starts at 8 p.m. I am there for the first hour to take 
your questions, if you want to talk to me, if you want to tell me something, I'm available. And then we have other teachers, musicians, comics, people who show up for office hours who want to teach. They teach. It's, uh, it's like a Chautauqua. And uh, it's just getting better and better. I cannot recommend it enough. Believe me, I, I'm a very small part of this. Uh, office hours is amazing. You will meet some of the greatest people in the world, and then me, which, uh, but you will meet, and it goes till about two in the morning. It's on Zoom. You can lurk, you can turn your video off, your audio off, and just watch it and not participate. You can turn your audio off, your video off, and just play in the chat room, or you can talk and you'll meet uh, the best people. I promise you, you will meet friends for life, not virtual friends. We've been doing this for, I don't know, a year and a half and it's become real. You know, Chappelle says Twitter isn't real and partly right. And I used to say Zoom, these Zoom meetings aren't real. It's becoming real. People are meeting each other and, you know, uh, doing things together. So if you're in the mood to meet better people and form lasting relationships and do things together, make music, form organizations, do podcasts, come to office hours. It's incredible the number of projects that I don't even know about. And I don't even want to know about them. <laughs> I got my own problems. Uh, as long as you're on the left and you're a decent human being, come to office hours and, and meet people and do projects and tell us about it or don't tell us about it. That's office hours. Go to my website to get uh, the link and you're, you're right. And if you'd like to attend a live taping of this show, we tape on Mondays and Thursdays. Go to my website. And while you're over there, please sign up for my newsletter. That's the show. Remember to stay strong and protect the weak. Protect the weak, Dave Chappelle. Stay strong and protect the brittle. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics a comedy too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show To get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way The David Feldman Show So get your ears on right Buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say